All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day three of Internet 2.0 conference. Last day, I hope you all are excited and have made the most of the three, well, last two days and today here at the conference. So far, we covered everything from big data to cybersecurity. It's time to take the discussion a notch higher. Now, we are going to talk about, no, our next fireside chat is going to be, um, you know, is going to give us insights into how organizations can maximize productivity and keep their employees safe without burdening them with unnecessary security measures. And to tell us more and to talk to us more about that are our subject experts. Can I please call on stage Hing Yan Lee, EVP of Cloud Security Alliance, and Shivani Sharma, founder of Cleep. Can we please have a round of applause for them? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I understand it's day three, and we have heard so many people discussing about uh, security, IoT, big data, AI, uh, metaverse, Web3. And uh, even I was enlightened by everybody's talk, like how well they have advanced in their sectors and what new things they are bringing up. But yet, we are still uh, living in a place where cyber criminals never rest. They're always evolving. They're always keeping up their game a little higher in order to maybe planning their next attack and how well they do it, we sometimes are not even aware of it. So I say like if cyber criminals never rest and neither should your cybersecurity. Uh, I want to build up a scenario over here, like a couple of months back, we all know we, uh, AIMS, All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. It's an epitome of hospitals, very big organization, and they were hit by a ransomware attack, compromising their servers in hand. And uh, the situation of uh, this institution is like, you know, there's a security guard, standing there, taking everything for granted, okay, it works, and suddenly the ransomware hits. And now everybody from top to bottom is going towards that shift left approach of integrating security into their infrastructure and securing their well-known assets, securing their services, and they just want to have security into each and every sphere of their segments. But now when we see they have successfully recovered servers, and, but that is the scenario. And now when you see they are brainstorming, their top level management will be brainstorming on ideas how and what well security postures they can integrate, what policies, procedures, frameworks they can have in line with their uh, um, institution. Uh, whether they want to go ahead, do a certification, or they want to do a continuous monitoring, or they want to set up a testing team. 
Now they are all hands down doing all these services. So with this, I would like to introduce myself. I am Shivani Sharma, founder of Cleep Technologies, which is a cybersecurity startup. Uh, we expertise in uh, security as a service, implementation, audits, and compliance. If any one of you interested in knowing what more we do, you can scan the QR code, or maybe we can connect uh, after my session as well. So do you really know like at what rate the ransomware related data leaks have happened last year? Anyone, any, any idea how much percent of ransomware attacks have happened? It's 82%. So ransomware is something which is evolving continuously and it has certain uh, weak points, certain, uh, it always targets the weak spot of a company's infrastructure. And 82% of people have been hit by a ransomware attacks. And sometimes we are not even sure that, you know, we have been attacked. Some companies are not even aware that their data has been leaked. And when we go to them and say, nah, we are secure. But how do you know how well your secure security is? How you uh, evaluate your company's security posture against the leading attacks or the cyber criminals on the, on the loose? How, how do you safeguard that information? When 82% of ransomware attacks are happening, right now, or maybe in this room, maybe our data is leaked on dark web, we might not even be aware. So this is what the current position and posture of our security is right now. Uh, everyone know what is Logrhythm? It is a leading seam solution. And according to their study, they say, like 91% of, they admit that their company security strategy and practices must align with the customer security policy standards. Because that is how it is. If you are a company who wants to uh, build a solution for another company, and uh, if you are implementing an MFA solution, or if you are implementing an OAuth or a single sign-on, and if the other company is not uh, uh, aware or if they do not have that solution, so you have to build it for them. You have to align your services with theirs so that you fit into their radar and you fit in into the security posture what the other company is into. 57% admit that they lose deals when they do not align with the other vendors or other company's security practices. Because if you're a vendor who is trying to uh, do a partnership, if you are trying to establish uh, a relationship with the company, they will have vendor registrations, they will ask you whether you are certified or not, they will ask you to fill your operational residency, they will ask you to fill out their uh, business continuity. So you should be aligned with their security policies and procedures so that you are into the business, you do, do not lose the deal. So that is how it is going to be, because security is being now ingrained. It is not to be bottled up. It should be ingrained from, from the start. And that culture, we have to build. And how the culture of security builds is like from top to bottom, and not the other way around. When the stakeholders, when the company's uh, uh, higher management is including, is including security in the culture, that's when the employees also feel the same, and they, they feel like that is important. 77% of executive participants believe like their employee turnover is a risk to their security. When an employee is onboarded, companies put in a lot of effort on their engagement, on their security training. And you know, when employees have aspirations, they move out and that training goes for a toss, and you have to reinvent the whole wheel, and then you have to train them all over again. And that is how the security is being compromised, because you have to put in that effort again and again and again. So that's a roadblock over there. Now we all know cyber attacks are here to stay. So what are we doing currently? 
are we responding well? Are we aware of what kind of new and innovative uh, you know, cyber crimes are getting in the head of cyber criminals who are going to attack us? We are not, we are not aware. Uh, so I will also take you through a story where we all know Uber got attacked. And uh, it was just a mere social engineering attack by an 18-year-old boy who was like, you know, with social engineering, he got the credentials and, you know, he was into the slack. And that's how the Uber got attacked. Now I say it is here to stay. Cyber attacks are not going anywhere. Cyber criminals will be, you know, sitting in, in somewhere trying to make sure where and when they can get into their application or maybe uh, hack another human uh, in whatever possible way they can. And, you know, what measures, what security measures we are taking right now? Do you believe that companies are take, doing enough for their security postures? Are they putting in enough effort to make sure that they safeguard their most valuable asset of their company. And I believe for a company, a most valuable asset is their employees because they are the first line of defense. And that's what you should protect. Once your employee workforce is sound, they know the security in and out. I believe that is the most robust framework because even now we feel that human is the weakest link in this chain of security. So first, we need to train our workforce. So cyber attacks are here to stay, but what defenses mechanism we are having, that is what matters. And have businesses responded positively to this? Because whenever we see companies come in and say, I really do not have budget for security. Maybe next year we'll include certain kind of amount in the security uh, activities that we want to do. So, so they always keep the security at the background. They do not want to include. But whenever you are developing a product or you know, even you are establishing your startup or you are building a solution, security has to be ingrained in each and every life cycle of your software development or any solution that you are going to provide. So that is how it should be. Plus, training of your workforce. Uh, have that employee engagement with you, maybe call in a guest lecture or maybe invest in some security training uh, 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 vendor that can help your employees understand how vulnerable they can be. And, you know, cyber criminals are always in search of that one disgruntled employee whom they will send that well-crafted email and he's bound to click on that. And there is no stopping to it. There is no. I remember an incident which happened recently uh, where a 74-year-old guy was, you know, uh, uh, crafted for losing around 1.22 lakh rupees, in Indian rupees. That's the attack that happened. So it was like Netflix sent him an email that his, was, that his subscription was uh, overdue. And it was very well crafted, like just as Netflix sent that email to him and the QR code was sent. And when the man scanned it, immediately the money was gone. Just imagine how important it is to safeguard our family members as well. Because they are sometimes not even aware like these kind of things exist. So we need to bolster our cyber defenses. We need to protect our organizations, we need to protect our family members as well. But, you know, uh, whenever we think about it, we are already too late for it. Like if I take the example of uh, uh, Ames Hospital, they realized ransomware attack happened, they were asked for around 200 crores in Bitcoin, and now just see the situation of Ames right now, they have best in class solutions, they have everything in place, and they're all set. But why do we have to wait? Why we are always doing uh, it a step later? Why not a step behind? But I say it's never too late. Even if you realize that it is now that I should be focusing on it, it is the time. So CLEEP recommends 
that you build a cybersecurity culture, train your workforce, train every employee and build that culture from top to bottom and not other way around. We do it. You can connect me after the call. We should eliminate misconfiguration, miscommunication, and this can only happen when you have continuous testing in your infrastructure, be it be your web, mobile, network, SOC, SIEM solution implementation, or data leak prevention. You should implement such kind of solutions which eliminate your misconfigurations. You have to adopt zero trust. Trust no one. This is the best solution that can be implemented in the current scenario. We can do it for you. You have to protect your critical workloads. Protecting your critical workloads may come in terms of adopting any security standard, any security uh, like NIST recommends or OWASP recommends or ISO standard that you need to implement. Protect your critical infrastructure. Protect your critical workload so that when you are hit, you already have certain backup for it that you can recover. And I would always say that be ready for any kind of attack that any time can happen because every second counts. Even if you think like you do not have security adequately, it's time to think about it. And thank you. I would also request Dr. Lee uh, to share his uh, side of comments as well on this. Good morning. Okay, today I'm going to cover a few points. These are the main points. And I want to emphasize the point that uh, data breaches, threats would affect enterprises large and small. And they, they often, in our research, arises from issues that we know are within our control, only if we were to implement them. And our research also show that these responsible areas can be understood from our analysis of some data breaches cases, which I'm going to cover at least one case. And these are, in, in that sense, preventable if you implement uh, uh, security map controls and put, make them implemented. So for those who are not familiar with Cloud Security Alliance, let me do a few quick words. We are a global non-profit organization. We have two purposes in life. The first is to promote the adoption of best practices in providing security assurances in the use of cloud. The, area, the second area of focus will be to educate users in the use of cloud to secure other forms of computing. Other forms of computing will include AI, blockchain, IoT, and uh, other uh, other means of, because increasingly, a lot of computing will be done on the cloud, and therefore, we need to understand how to use cloud to secure those type of computing. It, to this end, we provide training courses, and we also provide certi certification by means of partnership. So we are non-profit, we provide these services through partners. So today, we are moving from the era of COVID lockdown to one which is freer, we no longer have to wear face masks in this auditorium, and we increasingly do not use uh, hand sanitizer or wash our hands as frequently as before, nor do, neither do we have to maintain safe distancing. These are what we call health hygiene factors. In cybersecurity, we have a similar type of hygiene factors, which we are aware of. For example, if you are aware of 2017 and 2018 for the clock, these are uh, controls and measures that you should be implementing. If you, your major cloud users need to use that, those controls prescribed to secure your application. So for my presentation, I will cover what I'm familiar with 
what kind of CSA provides in terms of the control matrix. So this CCM is a, the cloud control matrix. CSA came about about 10 years ago together with industry. Unlike ISO, we update this very regularly because our stakeholders require us to keep in touch with uh, practice. So who are our stakeholders? Our stakeholders are cloud service providers, cloud users, as well as uh, cloud, uh, solutions providers. So our members would include AWS, Microsoft, Google, and the like, and also big, big users like uh, the banks who are using cloud. So these are the two stakeholders which provide the input impetus for us to constantly update the control matrix. The control matrix is continually updated and has input from the industry. So let, me, so let me say something about version three. Version three is a version that we did the analysis against. Version three has 16 control domains, which are essential categories of uh, controls which needs to be looked into. And in total, there were 133 controls that you need to be mindful of if you're using the cloud. And as any framework, we need to ensure that it's up to date and evolve with technology and time. So today we are at version four. Version four now has 17 control domains, which wants to run more. And in terms of domain, they are, the particular domain, there are now nearly 200. You have to be aware of. So it's not like it's not a matter of choice. A lot of people ask me questions: Do we have? To, can I must, must I do all of them? The answer is yes. All they are applicable. So like the COVID hygiene factors, if you're missing one of them, you're actually increasing the risk of getting COVID. But the point is, keeping all these secret controls doesn't mean that you never, it doesn't guarantee you'll never uh, get a breach. It, but it essentially means you reduce, you reduce the risk, the probability of getting hacked or getting uh, penetrated, just as, just as the COVID hygiene health factors do the same thing. So, a question, quick question for you. These are some of the companies we have worked with and we look at. So, what do they have in common? They are brand names, all of you should know about them. So, these are companies which have suffered data breaches and threats in cloud security in the past, past year. And we have analyzed them in a report which is available freely from our website. You are free to download it. But for today's presentation, I will only focus on the first one. That is probably well known and maybe it's worth explaining how we analyze this the first case. So in this case, Capital One, a major financial institution and a poster boy for cloud computing, suffered a data breach. And it lost 100, 100 million records uh, of its customers and credit cards application. So the technical details is uh, the, the culprit was a former AWS engineer, but who happened to have know some vulnerabilities in AWS. And he used many uses this vulnerability in the firewall to gain a credential to access the overprivileged S3 buckets. As a result, you could get all the data. And so what, what it means is, in, a, in terms of technical details, uh, the data breach means that the buckets have real access for him to get all these records. And this data pertains to 14 years' worth of customer data and credit card application. And it gives rise to, a, I'm sure it raises a red flag in your mind, what security control has been violated. And the data are usually the usual personal identifying information, name, address, and the date of birth, as well as credit card information. The person's SSN, this is the US based, as well as it's linked to the East Bank account and things like that. So these are very major loss of data for this particular case. So the business impact is the bank had to pay penalties to a government agency called the Office of Currency Control, and also have to also face penalties arising from violation of regulatory, uh, lack of regulatory compliance. And at the time of the study, it's unclear whether it violated any GDPR uh, cases because some of the data could be pertain to EU citizens. So what happened in terms of job loss, the CISO had to leave, he was reassigned and then after left and left. And then a dozen of cybersecurity agents, uh, professionals also had to leave the bank as a result of this data breach. So we analyze this with respect to the cloud control matrix, but that probably they are a bit too small for you. Maybe I should just highlight a few. So the result is a misconfiguration of the firewall, and that, that is a, 
a matrix, you should show that the point in stock control matrix is you should have a baseline configuration for which you should frequently compare your, your current versus your baseline. And the other issue is to un un ensure there's no excessive rights to the data. So you need to be able to control it prop carefully. So some of these controls can be used to detect. So in this case, um, the use of log to manage and to understand suspicious activities on the system is will be useful for this case. And also a very good incident response process in place will allow the bank to quickly respond to a data breach when uncovered and therefore able to work with the agencies, uh, the authorities to um, do the necessary things. So this is a very quick slide to summarize the results of the analysis of the nine case studies. It essentially shows where, which category they fall into. Most of these cases that we happen to select and which we're willing to share information, it's not that we, it's not a case selection, but we had to persuade the banks to, to share this information. In fact, a lot of, although I mentioned that we, data breach affects small and big companies, they used to, small companies usually don't want to share, there's nothing to share because they probably, commit bigger sins than all these big these companies who can't even manage to implement some of these uh, security controls we talk about. So it falls into categories which are listed in our study as uh, misconfiguration. So most of them had misconfiguration as a major issue. That was the, f the number one top threats uh, two years ago, as well as managing of identity, as well as account hijacking, uh, due to, uh, causing all these loss. So it shows where, which cases have this as a feature. And this E1, E2, E3 are, are what is listed here. So it relates to this, what we identify as top threats in the past years. And this is a report that you can now download. This is about two years old. We're coming out of a new report this year, which should be coming out um, uh, pretty soon, uh, 2023. We should uh, study further new cases of data breach, which pertains to uh, the use of cloud. This is another analysis of how, for each of the case studies we had, how it pertains to the clock control that, that have been involved in. So if they have implemented certain clock controls, they, those clock controls can enable the bank or the user to detect, control, or pre prevent a data breach. So each, the number in each of the entry shows the number of controls involved. So for a capital one, you can see that total 16 security controls involved in the three categories of to be able to help to detect, prevent, and, and correct it. And as you see along the way, there are different cases where different controls are implemented, which means that for a big cloud users like uh, Bank Capital One, it, it has areas of which it should be improved. So for you would imagine a big company should be able to implement all of them, but sometimes you fail in one of them. So these are my parting talk. <clears throat> so hygiene factors for COVID-19 are applicable, but that the same analogy applies to us in cybersecurity. We have to apply those ap applicable to us in cybersecurity, and in my case, cloud security. So we apply those which are applicable to the industry. For example, some of the control mat matrix we have pertain to mobile security, but none of the cases we start we study in the nine cases study pertain to mobile security. So those controls are not applicable. So as a good advice, the users, you always have to be right. That means you have to make sure all the controls that must be implemented. You have been essentially told that you should be implementing these cases, but if you choose to not or overlook one or skip one, you are actually providing a gap for the hacker or the bad guys to come in. So the bad guys essentially have to exploit that one single control that you have not been looking at. And then with that, they can hit the jackpot that is access to your crown jewel. <clears throat> so the question is, <clears throat> do you have to be alert all the time? The answer is yes and no. But you, we do know that the bad guys attack over long weekends and during holiday time. So year end like this is a time where they attack because your security professionals go on leave, they are fewer professionals around the company and they were attacked during those times. Because they know that fewer resources mean people, fewer people monitoring it. And therefore, if you feel monitoring it, therefore, 
fewer people will be responding to it. So <clears throat> that's my parting point, thoughts to you. Thank you very much. I think now um, both Shivani and myself are happy to fill any questions that you might have for our presentation or any thoughts you have for the topic. Hi, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and a great insight on the data breach and it's one of the major, major concern for each and every organization uh, who are online. Um, my question is like, it's most of the things were focused on the cloud-based uh, data storage and organization. What about the on-premises they are hosting and what are the you know, terms will be applicable to the on-premises? Uh, Uh, so if I understand your question correctly, you're asking like what security posture you should implement on the data which is hosted on-prem? Yeah. Right. So uh, it becomes all the way more important when your data is hosted inside your perimeter, I think. Uh, this in, in terms gives a little advantage as well because sometimes people do want to host their, imp their data in-house because they do not fear that their data is traveling the outside the borders of their geographical borders, like here in the Middle East. They have that uh, uh, like uh, policy that their data should always be hosted in. So we can have uh, solutions such as uh, containerization, where you know you can every department can have separate containerization of their data. That is the you know a lot of uh, companies do that for now. And I think that can be one way in which the data can be safeguarded. Plus, uh, access control, where only the authorized personnel have uh, access to the uh, uh, prized possession, that is the data. <clears throat> Plus, having uh, disaster recovery and backup solutions implemented in case of any kind of uh, mis- uh, you know, it's a breach. Yeah. Yeah. Happens. So, see, my question was like, especially for because uh, if you see the new age technology, majority of the companies they are focused on the artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence, the most important thing is the data, that may not be required for the public or end user, but they require it for you know training their models, and which is becomes like you know more crucial as well at that moment. So, my question was on that point of view because most of the company they are in the space of artificial intelligence, they always have on prem so uh, for you know uh, data science and all that uh, they are training the model and then finally you know uh, solution when they deliver it and then it goes basically uh, on like you know only the outcome that goes on to the you know public domain or to their customers b2b whatever else there so definitely identity management and you know uh, data redundancy they are the you know the common thing but i was just thinking like if there's any additional specific insight that you might be you know able to highlight but anyways, I mean, that was a uh, good input. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, you spoke about the Capital One um, Bank, S3 bucket uh, attack, right? Um, and the impact the bank has to go through uh, because of the attack. Um, as a customer, when they used Amazon services, what was the impact on Amazon? What is the kind of responsibility Amazon has took, particularly for this breach, and uh, what kind of measures uh, and uh, the accountability they have to pick up for that? Okay, so in this case, the CSV involved will be Amazon, right? So we know that one of the possible cause would be the um, vulnerability arising from one of the feature that Amazon has in the, um, the web application firewall, which pertains to the server side request uh, forgery. That particular feature has been since been patched by Amazon. But then, but then you understand, that has happened to be a case of a former engineer who happened to know this vulnerability and never reported it. So he exploited it after he left Amazon. So indeed, it is a, an alarm bell for a lot of us in the cloud computing world in the sense 
Capital One is a poster boy for cloud computing. They invested a lot in their cloud implementation and in security. And um, so a bridge like that actually um, caused, uh, uh, caused people to have shaken faith in the cloud service providers. Because for a long time, since we started 10 years ago, cloud service providers have increased their security posture and their implementation very well. So, so much so that in our studies of top threats in cloud security, the, the nuances is the gaps have moved from the CSPs to the users now. The users, because they have not been able to keep up with the new advances or new features that the CSP come about. So that's why Shivani's point about training professionals and users to be more aware of cybersecurity issues are very important. So, so if I understand uh, the financial impact that Amazon had to go through was only the business loss, which is not quantified. I think the party responsible is the bank itself, not Amazon, because the bank, but the Amazon as a CSP is providing a tool. How you use a tool, especially in this case, a misconfiguration, while the patch may be an issue, but the the uh, the, the burden is on the bank because they have overlooked some of the. Uh, controls which you have not implemented properly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? No? Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shivani. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, next up, we have a keynote session, and the topic is going to be Buy Now, Pay Later, the Future of Financing. Can I please call upon stage Mr. Sanjay Thaskar, the founder and CEO of Assimilate Technologies Private Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, just bear with us for two minutes. We're just sorting some technical issues. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I am Sanjay Taskar, uh, founder and CEO of Assimilate Technologies. And Assimilate Technologies is a technology consulting and solution provider company. We help uh, startups and mid-scale company to build their product uh, using our technologies. 
So we uh, mainly deal with the web app, mobile app development, and custom software developments. So today I'm going to uh, present a concept called as a BNPL, buy now, pay later, the future of uh, financing, or future of credit, we can say that. So how many people you are aware about BNPL, or have you heard about BNPL? One? Have you used BNPL? Any? Okay, so can somebody tell me what is the difference between credit card and BNPL? So most of you might have a credit card, I think, over here. So when you get the credit card, that's my question. If you have a good civil score, then only you'll get the credit card. Otherwise, your credit card application will be denied. So over here, uh, we have a, a new concept launch in the market, which is called as a BNPL, buy now, pay later. Okay, so uh, so for this, I'll just tell you what is, so uh, the, <coughs> so over here, BNPL is a, a term of financing the other consumers, like a financing that allows consumer to make a purchase and pay them, pay for them at the future debt. Okay, so it's a kind of credit card only, but it is a cardless payment, we can say. You don't require a hard card with you. You can do it through a soft payment based on your civil score. But here, civil is not mandatory. Uh, like uh, in a credit card, you should have a good civil score. Based on that, you will get some approved, pre-approved amount and you can purchase on that particular amount only. But uh, BNPL is the another platform where you will get a uh, option to without checking your civil and without uh, knowing your civil, you can have a certain amount as a pre-approved amount for you and you can use that. Okay, so that's the BNPL. And <coughs> BNPL is uh, like a BNPL uh, emerging as the preferred payment option while shopping. And nowadays, mainly BNPL is available with the e-commerce platform. Like uh, most of the time you might have shop on Amazon, you might have shop on Flipkart or other online platform, you uh, see there, uh, like along with your other payment option, there will be option like a pay letter. Okay, and that pay letter option helps you uh, to pay the payment without uh, like uh, using your credit card or without carrying your uh, physical credit card or maybe using your net banking or others. So that help you to uh, pay the payment. So the total, con like uh, the, the, the total contribution for, uh, for the e-commerce transaction value uh, by 2026 will be increased by 14%. Okay, and nine out of 10 users are more likely to pick store that offers it. So how it is useful, like uh, the, the young generation or the mid, mid generation are preferring for the BNPL. And they are preferring a such a store where they are uh, having a offers or they are having a payment option as a BNPL. And then seven out of 10 user use it when shopping online to purchase it. So that's the overall thing. And if we go with the number wise, you can see here, the market penetration, like a 71% of the electronic products are used, uh, like uh, people are buying through BNPL. Okay, then 67% of people are buying through, uh, buying for the fashion and style accessories. Uh, then 57% people are uh, going for the everyday shopping items uh, using a uh, BNPL. So nowadays, so nowadays people are not uh, nowadays people are not preferring to use a credit card and uh, uh, other uh, payment options they are directly going for the bnpl and you can see the drastic growth over here and the bnpl is a set so by 2026 is a like a 40 million around 40 million market size so it has a huge uh, thing to integrate uh, with the application with the application so we'll go for next slide so how BNPL works? So over here, you can see in a first slide, the consumer, in a first slide, the consumer makes an online purchase or buy at in store. So consumer go at an online store or he make a purchase. Then in a second step, consumer select a BNPL as a payment option. Like whenever we are going up for the payment screen, there is option available. Like do you want to pay through UPI? Do you want to pay through net banking, credit card, or you have option of pay later? So consumer mostly select the pay letter. Then the customer signs up or sign, sign, sign in the BNPL service provider. So nowadays in the market there are a uh, uh, few BNPL service providers available or in uh, India we call them as NBFC. 
so they are providing a finance over here and then instant kyc and credit as risk assessment done by the bnp provider they do the based on usc bill or maybe uh, based on a country wise the identity number they identify the uh, your score or civil and then they do the uh, pro provide the payments then bnpl uh, credit approved then uh, <coughs> then next step uh, we have a seven like consumer complete the purchase and the customer pay directly to the bnpl later in the installment so the cycle over here is like i am a consumer uh, i can uh, buy the product from a shop or i can buy the product from uh, online i select the payment option as a pay later I need to do a eKYC through the lender who is lending me money. Once my KYC is done, I'll get the approved amount. I'll pay that amount to the uh, uh, provider. That may be an online store or that may be a physical store. I can pay the payment. Payment will be directly credited to the vendor and product. I can take it, take a product immediately over here. So uh, the here the benefit is that it's a completely cardless transaction. No need to carry your physical credit card. And the benefit of BNPL over here, the lenders are providing a credit-free or interest-free period starting from 15 days to 90 days. Some of them are giving it up to 24 months as well. So it's based on country, based on the region, it's getting varied. Okay. So due to this concept, the penetration of market uh, for uh, buying now pay later concept has increased drastically. And we can see the figure, we saw the figures in a last slide. Then next, uh, so we can see over here the BNPL share, uh, like a BNPL uh, share among e-commerce payment method. So we have uh, some statistic over here and how it is helping e-commerce payment or how it is growing the business of e-commerce uh, with the help of BNPL. Okay, so you can see an, in, a, in India, uh, we got a 3% increase in a business through BNPL. Uh, in a US, 4%, in a UK, uh, we can say 6%, New Zealand, 10%. 11% in Australia, Germany has a 20%, then 25% in a Sweden. So over here, the awareness of BNPL is very less in a market. And if we could increase the awareness of BNPL, we could give a solution to our, uh, uh, as a technical technology partner, we could give a solution to our customers who are integrating a payment services for receiving a payment and other activities. So we could give this option and we can increase their revenue. So I'll show you one use case, uh, which we have uh, two use cases, which we have implemented with BNPL in a few days, uh, in a few times, in some times. Okay. Then I'll go. So here the BNPL awareness and knowledge. So how people uh, get know about the BNPL and the age category wise, we can understand over here. So uh, we can see here respondent indicating their source of knowledge and BNPL service in a percentage. So if I consider the age group of 18 to 24, almost 68% people are aware, like becoming aware about the BNPL through social media. Okay, then 48% through digital store. Like these people are storing, visiting uh, like a e-commerce website and at the time of payment, they are seeing that option over there. So that educating them to uh, what is BNPL and how to use that BNPL. Then uh, like 41% uh, uh, BNPL service provider advertisement. So uh, like nowadays BNPL provider also started uh, doing some advertisement and they can uh, uh, make aware about the uh, such a things to the people. And then 39% like uh, friends and family. We recommend our friends like uh, why you are paying your hard cash or why you are uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, paying from your investment. Just use the BNPL and later on once you get the salary credited or you get your fund refund from someone, you can pay it later on without paying any interest or with any penalties. So uh, such a way uh, people are uh, uh, like uh, getting aware about the BNPL. So uh, this is for 18 to 24 uh, years category. Then 25 to 44 category, we have a different figures and 45 to uh, like a 54 category, we have a different figures over here. And usage of BNPL, if we see over here, like uh, online for e-commerce website, it's almost 75%. So which is increase the business for the uh, e-commerce platform. And in store, we can say here, like a 25%, it has increased the business of the people. Because BNPL is the like a most favorite platform in a young generation and mid, uh, mid young generation, mid young generation. And that helps people to buy the product at uh, whenever they required. 
so it's kind of uh, we can say credit card only but uh, uh, like a cardless credit card okay then credit preference over here so 45 percent of the respondent indicated their preference of purchasing from bnpl if they have a credit card i have a credit card but still i am not interested to use the credit card i can pay through bnpl the advantage over here we we'll are going to discuss in a detail in the next slide what why we are preferring for the bnpl then uh, around two third of the respondent 75 percent have used bnpl service through e-commerce website so as we discussed 75 percent people are going for the uh, bnpl through website only or e-commerce websites only so there are a lot of industries available others where we can bring the bnpl and we can uh, incorporate so if we see the uh, like a uh, age group wise the preference of the bnpl usage we can see here a uh, bnpl and credit so like a uh, 18 to uh, 24 uh, years of people uh, or generation are using a 30 percent as a bnpl and 32 percent as a credit card so we can see a minor difference or in a few days it will be opposite so it will go bnpl will go up and uh, the uh, credit card history will uh, be uh, less and in a few days i can it should not be surprised like a credit card will be uh, completely uh, banned or completely disqualified so we people stop using a credit card as well because bnpl is becoming a, a feature of the finance or credit and <clears throat> so we can see the uh, figures over here for like a mid uh, mid generation like a 25 to 44 years it's always like a three percent difference and for 50 to 60 years people it has just a uh, like a uh, um, yeah there is a little gap because they are not aware and they are not ready to accept a new things so we need to increase the awareness in uh, in the age group of 45 to 30 years then major value proposition for bnpl so the advantage of bnpl is that low or no interest rate like we know that if we are not paying a credit card bill on time how much percent we need to pay or how much percent charges they are applying almost 36 percent to 48 percent right along with late fee and others but here uh, we are getting a, a like a flexible payment options and with the help of that it max 24 percent you will get the final charges so if we see the penalty charges and interest uh, on uh, if we compare these two you will see the huge difference over here and that's why people are preferring for uh, bnpl then flexible flexibility and convenience no need to carry your uh, physical cards if you have a mobile you can immediately do the payment through a mobile and we know that we never forget to carry mobile so that's the beauty of bnpl another and no eligibility of credit cards so if you have sorry non eligibility of credit cards if you are not if you are not eligible for credit card still you can use a bnpl because all the lenders are providing some default credit limit for everyone like i am a person i don't have a credit card but if i try to get the uh, some uh, if i try to log into a lender every lender has set some minimum value and you can start using that minimum value and once you start using that minimum value and if you pay on a time it start building your credit credit, credit ability and once you get the credit ability your score uh, based on your score that amount will automatically get changed and you will get the increase amount increase amount based on your payment options or based on your credit history so over here we can see the advantage of the like as a customer instant credit i don't need to wait for the approval like a long approval or i don't need to submit any physical document to get the credit i just need to put my pan card number or maybe uh, uh, some identity number based on that uh, they can approve the my uh, loan and i can get the amount and second benefits cheap credit rate that's the benefit second as a merchant i can get the increase order volume like uh, i have uh, some money like assume that i have a uh, five thousand rupees uh, and i want to buy uh, something which is uh, going for the amount of eight thousand how i can do that so i am a shortage of three thousand so as a merchant if i have a bnpl platform like my that product will be sold so i can give the option like a, a pay with the pay letter services and you will you can get the benefit so whatever amount i have i can pay that in a cash a remaining i can do the pay later and i can sell out that particular product okay then higher conversion rate so those people are not buying the things they started buying the things due to this bnpl because they are getting a freedom over here then lender better reach and higher profitability 
So these are the advantage of the BNPL. Then most preferred segment. So nowadays, as we discuss, the e-commerce or electronic products are the most preferred segment for buying uh, through BNPL, uh, which is almost 75%, sorry, 71%. Then now people are moving towards the fashion, which is 67% uh, fashion and style product and 57% are preferring for everyday basic shopping. But apart from this, there are uh, other market scope available or we can say untapped market. So like a uh, furniture is another thing. Uh, we need a furniture in our house. So we cannot buy all the furniture in one go. Right, so there we can use a BNPL, then like uh, electronic goods and home appliances, clothing, footwear, sport and fitness equipment, travel and accommodation. Nowadays, there is a concept TNPL, travel now, pay later. Like, uh, 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 I forgot that band name, uh, like two to three big brands started using this, travel now, pay later. So using a pay later service, they are bringing same concept. Uh, you can just uh, pay to pay later service. You can go travel and once you are back from travel, you can start paying either in a EMI or either you can pay in a one go. So that is a TNPL. Then media and entertainment, health and beauty. So we also, we ourselves develop one product related to healthcare, which is called as a care now, pay later. I'll show you that in some time. Then food and drinks also, we have a one use case. We develop it like a dine now, pay later. And we integrated this BNPL concept over there, and which has increased the revenue for our customer by 30%. So that's the beauty of BNPL. Then, uh, like uh, uh, as a revenue forecasting in by 2030, as I said, the targeted market will be at around 40 billion USD. It's a huge. Okay, and it will be the, have a care of 26% from today to next six, uh, eight years. So 26% is a huge uh, increment. And all these estimation we done based on uh, 2021 and the historical data of 20, uh, 2017 to 2020. Then, uh, here, how we can help. Okay, so we have extensive experience in integrating a BNPL platform uh, in optimizing the business and aspiring entrant in a market. So we help uh, companies uh, to integrate the BNPL platform and also uh, make aware them how it will increase the profitability for them. Okay, so here we have uh, two types of player. One is like an inc incubament uh, a BNPL player uh, where we review the client existing strategy and operation with existing BNPL space to determine key capability gaps and pain points and challenges. Then option evaluation. So we evaluate the option for the person, which BNPL option could be good and why. So we are helping over there and then uh, we help them in a growth strategy as well. Then we have a next like aspiring BNPL uh, players. So we find the opportunity evaluation. So we do the opportunity evaluation. So we evaluate the target market based on a client shortlisting, shortlist to understand local or regional demand or dynamics. Uh, determining the product wallet opportunity in the BNPL space. Then competitive analysis. So we do identify local as well as uh, regular uh, competitor and market uh, leaders to uh, benchmark the market. Uh, then <coughs> benchmark the market propositioning or a proposition and determine industry best practices. And last is entry strategy. So prioritize uh, market and determine uh, suitable industry po pro uh, positioning along with detailed recommendation on serving offering and operation models. So we help over here uh, with this activity to our uh, uh, like a partners. So this is a use case which we develop for one of our customer in India. Uh, the app name is Vayu, uh, W-A-I-U, okay? And uh, we developed this and in this we integrated the BNPL as a BNPL, Dine Now, Pay Later. So this app was launched by Sunil Chetty. Uh, he is a brand ambassador for this app in uh, India. And uh, in uh, three months, uh, like uh, we got more than uh, like uh, uh, 1.5 lakh users on this app. And uh, we are uh, on a daily basis, we are generating attraction more than like uh, around uh, 1.5 to 2 lakhs on daily basis. And out of that, uh, we see around like a 20 to 30% of the transaction are happening through BNPL. 
So we see a BNPL as a future platform or future credit for the uh, operation uh, in the uh, industry. Then this is the dashboard of the customer, like a, and this is another platform we have developed. So till the now we saw that BNPL are used for the uh, activity which can be avoided, like uh, going on a travel which can be avoided. That kind of a luxurious activity only BNPL nowadays our people are using. But we thought as a, uh, can we bring a BNPL in a healthcare? Because most of the time we are struggling with the finance to make a cure for ourselves, our family member. Right, so this is our own product uh, we, uh, we are building, uh, it's in a beta testing, so which is called as a Cherry Pay. And with the help of this, we are making a, a BNPL open for all the doctors, pharmacists and pathological path, path, path labs. Where you can book the appointment of a doctor, you can go, you can get the treatment and pay to, through BNPL. And later on you can pay either from, uh, 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 later on you can pay from your salary or you, you can convert that into a, a EMIs. So up to you, how you want to pay. So we are developing this product and it's in beta testing. So by next month we are launching this product in India. So uh, which could help uh, help uh, needy people to get the finance and get the uh, treatment on time. Because most uh, we observed that most of the time people are avoiding or uh, doing a, uh, like a treatment on time due to finance issues. Right. But if we provide a finance and if they are like a, a simple example I'll give you. If I have a teeth pain, a teeth pain or if I have a, a something uh, like a headache issue. Uh, so if I, if like an example of surgery, some surgery, which is not mandatory to do now, but if we do it now, it will be happen in a less cost. But people are uh, like uh, keep avoiding such a thing due to, <coughs> due to lack of uh, money. They don't have uh, enough money to do that kind of surgery. And they say like once I get the money, I'll come and I'll do that treatment. And at a certain period of time, after a certain period of time, what happens? That small injury or that small uh, like a pain becomes a huge pain and you need to spend a lot, lots of money uh, bearing those things. So instead of that, if you use our platform, Care Now Pay Letter, you will get an instance finance for your uh, uh, healthcare expenses and you can pay it. And we are covering all the uh, like a specialty of doctors in this. It can be dermatology, gynecology, any any specialty can use this app. And then another thing we observe uh, in a, mostly in India, like we have a insurance, health insurance, but we observe over there, like not 100% insurance get claimed. Even though all insurance companies are saying we are 100% cover, 100% cashless, once you get the bill, that time they say like a room rent cannot go beyond this capping, then like uh, this nurse charges is not applicable in policies. This thing happens and we need to bear at least 20 to 25 percent as a copay. Right, this is the common scenario and everyone is facing, I hope. So in that time, instead of asking the money for your friends, family or someone, we can pay through a BNPL and in with after that certain period of time, we can have it, uh, we can pay through our uh, earnings, whatever we are getting. And if you are not capable to pay that on time, we just convert that in a AMI and pay it later on, based on your convenience. So that's the beauty of BNPL. So we saw these two use cases we developed closely. So we are uh, like uh, we are understanding the value of BNPL. Okay. So this is about our assimilate. <coughs> so thank you. Any question? Uh, thank you for presentation. My name is Bahrus. I'm from Azerbaijan. Um, it's, uh, thank you for interesting topic. And this is the first time I'm hearing about the BNPL. Uh, of course, I have a few questions I want to ask you. Uh, first of all, about the BNPL provider. Uh, the, um, how BNPL provider manage their financial risk? Because the um, insurance company uh, is not really this kind of systems and uh, if even uh, the banks uh, sign a lot of documents and government is regulate this process and even you will not pay uh, with, uh, to your credit card, uh, they can arrest you also. But uh, still there are a lot of the problematic credit uh, with the banks and how BNPL provider um, insure their sales. Sure. So uh, like a BNPL is called as an unsecured loan. 
it's come in the category of unsecured. So they initially they will not start with the big amount. They will start with the some small amount only. And Even if small, uh, for example, uh, 100 USD per user. Mm -hmm. If you have the 1,000 user, it's a 1 million. And it's very risky business for the providers and the investor who will uh, put their money to, the, to these uh, providers. So here, uh, the responsibility of a lender over here to... Lender. I, we are talking about the lenders. Sorry? Yeah, we are, uh, yo, please go ahead. I will... Yeah, so I'm saying over here, the BNPL is a platform uh, we are integrating in a product, okay? So as a product owner, you are not responsible for that. A product owner, what do you mean, merchant or? Yeah, no, no as a merchant or? We are talking about the provider and a man who is putting his money to this uh, provider. Mm -hmm. We are talking about only uh, about himself. Yeah, so let me understand this scenario. Like uh, one person buy the uh, product f through a BNPL. Okay. Right, and he is unable to pay the payment on yeah. time. Right, so who will be responsible for that, correct? Who is responsible? Yeah, of course, the, uh, but the, yeah, even if the banks cannot find the people who is not uh, willing to pay for that, how uh, this provider uh, will find this person and to get their money from them? Uh, so over here, like, uh, uh, they need to provide their uh, identity over there. Like, okay. uh, in uh, India, we have a PAN card. So based on a PAN card only, uh, they are allowing us any finance. Like if I go for the home, home loan, firstly I need to submit my PAN card. And based on PAN card, they can check my civil score, am I eligible, they will see my credit history and everything. So same thing is applicable for BNPL as well. But in a BNPL, they start with the minimal amount first initially, and they start building your rapport with them based on a credit payment history, uh, how you do. Exactly, in our country, in Azerbaijan, they have, they are more than billion USD every year, problematic credit, which uh, you know, people buy it through the credit card, mm -hmm. but they are not willing to pay like, back. They said, I don't have the money for that. So in that case, do they make whatever a default, you want. In that case, they make a defaulter for them, right? Uh, yeah, but a very risky problem. And second one, why banks not resist uh, this kind of the business? Or maybe uh, they, why banks doesn't change their strategy because the, if the BNPL market share is increased, as you said before, uh, banks should think about it and they can do this, uh, uh, the, the same service to the customer. Uh, nowadays, uh, bank is not upfront giving this uh, thing. They are giving through uh, some NBFCs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and the benefit over here, like uh, uh, the dependency of collecting a loan and uh, like a uh, recovery of the loan will be with the NBFC. So that's why a bank is not upfront giving. But nowadays, uh, in India, uh, like uh, three banks started giving uh, uh, like a uh, BNPL. Like ICIC Bank is one of them. Kotak Mahindra Bank is another one. Mm -hmm. So they are started giving a uh, uh, in, uh, like a uh, BNPL facilities directly to the customer. And in a few days, BNPL will become a major platform for the loans and others. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, hi again, we spoke before. Yes. Uh, I believe uh, this is a counterintuitive but profitable model, and that's why it's expanding, right? Yes. And uh, banks are following because they are seeing the risk and return. And they try small, they try it, and it works for them. But you're developing the platform, and uh, you're trying to expand to new regions, uh, working with new banks, let's say. Different countries have different regulations. What are the highest challenges you face when you want to get into a new region and, and let's say pitch your platform? And, and, and how do you address it? Like how do you uh, give them the confidence that, hey, try it, it could work? Or, or, or uh, how you, let's say, establish the right communication with those banks or those uh, new regions to work on that model and give you a chance to try your platform there, regardless of if it is healthcare or anything, it's the model that we are talking about. Yeah, so currently like uh, in India, uh, we started uh, with this BNPL platform and the initial channel, uh, like a major challenge we faced for here, awareness issue. People are not aware about the BNPL. Like uh, those people are doing uh, uh, online shopping, 
out of them like if i assume the 100 people out of that like a 10 or 20 percent only people are aware about the bnpl and they are taking a benefit of it so first thing we need to make a awareness about uh, awareness we need to increase the awareness and we need to generate the interest uh, for the people if why bnpl and how it will be beneficial for them so if we could do that way then we can easily trap the market like a, uh, we have a concept care now pay later so if we see this concept if we go on a google we'll see hardly two to three organization who are providing such a kind of services we have uh, some big uh, companies they are giving a loans for the healthcare uh, cure as well but in that case it's not an instant you need to uh, uh, fill the application form you need to submit the necessary documents they will give the approval and letter on you need to pay so that's the biggest challenge over there so nowadays bnpl is uh, in a unsecured uh, loan format and it can be easily given to the person and uh, people are also aware about that once they uh, like uh, uh, disturb their credit history they will not be eligible for any loan in the future so that fear is in a people mind so they are paying on time and they are earning a better credit and they are doing the things. I hope I answered your question. Um, great session. Uh, interesting product because uh, this is picking a lot of pace in my country as well. Uh, a lot of startups doing this. So, but I want to understand um, from a customer onboarding standpoint, specifically KYC, um, are you guys doing any soft check, hard check? Uh, if you're doing a soft check, is there like an API provided by the Indian government to sort of go through the credit history of the customer? Yes, so yeah. at the time of payment, uh, whenever you are selecting any lender, assume that in a BNPL platform, I have a seven lender. So out of that, if I select the ICIC bank as a lender for my payment, uh, so uh, once you select that lender, it will redirect to the ICIC payment gateway. Over there, first thing it will ask for the PAN card or maybe your unique identity uh, number. And based on that unique identity number, instantly it will do your it will do your credit history check. And based on that, it will uh, show the amount, how much amount you are eligible for that time. So the, it's directly given to a uh, lender provider only. So no need to do any uh, extra work for that. Got it. In case of uh, care now, pay later, and TNPL, I think uh, amount is quite high, right? Specific, like for instance, from a from a BNPL standpoint, like in you know in Pakistan, it's mostly people getting stuff from e-commerce website where the average basket size is not too much. So what I want to understand is when it comes to travel now, pay later, or KNPL for that matter, um, this could be like a lot of money, right? Yes. So, so for instance, if someone wants to go for TNPL and CNPL for the first time mm -hmm. coming on your platform, is that possible or someone has to build that credit history to get enough uh, lending amount? Uh, just want to understand your strategy. So here, that. Uh, yeah. like here we have a, a work around, uh, two work arounds. One, uh, if you have a good credit history, you will get instantly uh, the required amount. That is one thing. But nowadays, there are a lot of uh, like a CNPL, uh, like a lot of BNPL providers are available, or lenders available over there. So at a time, I can take a loan or I can take a money from multiple lenders. Like assume that I have a seven lender, I need of one lakh rupees. What I can do, uh, ICS Bank by default giving me a 30,000, I'll take that 30,000. Then Kotak Mandra giving me 50,000, 15,000, I can take the 15,000. And if I accumulate all the lenders' money, I can generate that much money. And there is no restriction, there is no barrier. You cannot take from multiple lender at a time. So that is the beauty of BNPL. Yeah. Morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, follow up on uh, the first question we had from uh, Bahrut, right? Um, he was asking, uh, where does the money come from, more or less? Uh, and I know for a fact that uh, BNPL uh, providers or lenders, as you choose to put them, consolidate those debts and then, uh, debts and then securitize them into something like uh, CDOs or, or, uh, or securities. However, the catch is you have a cap for people who will default. If uh, the percentage of people who have defaulted 
go above this cap, then eventually the, your entire security value will go down, maybe go down to zero and you go back bankrupt. Yes. Um, and in, during the genesis of credit cards, uh, when, when Emory card was issued in the 1950s, they ended up losing $7 million, which was a ginormous amount of money at the time, and they, uh, and they, they disappeared of the market. So here is my question. Uh, if you're providing BNPL for people to buy consumer or luxury products uh, at a small sum of money, like our friend from Pakistan was saying, then it's fine. However, if you start providing something like medical care, and you just now said that you can consolidate the money from various BNPL providers, then at the end of the day, the percentage of people who will default will increase and the interest rates for BNPL does not cover that. Do you think that this balloon will burst anytime soon? Thank you. Uh, it depends on situation. It's not a, like a hundred percent we can say. So uh, like a, if the people are uh, paying on time uh, with the right uh, approach, then they will get the benefit out of it. So everything has a pros and cons. If we do it in uh, like a destructive mind way, it is always hampering the ecosystem and at the end it will be uh, like a, a making you a defaulters over there in case if you are not paying on time. My, I am talking about people who will default. What's, what uh, did you do? You said you do the market studies. Uh, do you have any number in mind in the percentage of people who will default? Uh, or are most likely to default when you provide medical care through BNPL? Sorry, I rephrased the question. Sorry, not aware about that. Thank I'll you. do that. Thank you. Yeah. We'll connect after this uh, meeting uh, and we'll discuss on that topic. Yes, thank you. Any other question? Very valid points by you, actually. Uh, I think um, in this case, specifically for platforms like these, uh, you should consider using AI for credit risk assessment. Uh, that's something very hot, and specifically in the financial services industry. Like I personally worked on problems where, because if you have enough data, that is basically the challenge here. Yes, correct. But then you could also use companies like Synaptic or Zest Finance we're actually experts at these, and that's why I brought that soft check or hard check uh, question, because I think there's a lot of play of AI because he's right, that, and that's why I was saying that TNPL and care now, pay later, that's a, big, like, that's a lot of amount, right? Yes. And there's a lot of risk. So, you know, just predicting who might be defaulting uh, could actually help you preempt, you know, the losses. So, and that's where I want to ask you that question that have you considered uh, using these methods to build a good customer portfolio and reduce defaults? Uh, actually, uh, these uh, things will be taken care by the lender as of now. Uh, we are not in that, uh, like, a, uh, so here the, uh, we are just integrating the platform as of now. So we are not worried about, like, a, we are just an intermediate or a platform. Like a customer will pay the amount to uh, the uh, vendor, vendor will receive amount, the job is done. So now, who will recover that amount? So to recover that amount, the uh, lenders will be there and he will, uh, like a, uh, he will be uh, following up with the customer and getting the recovery done as of now. But definitely, uh, we'll uh, take uh, your suggestion and we'll try to uh, integrate that in our solution. Thank you. Uh, hey, um, so just wanted to clarify the points which the friends have brought up. Um, if my understanding is correct, um, the B BNPL and credit card, we should not see it in a different way. Correct. It's both, both one or the other same, right? Uh, in case of credit card, uh, the lender is the bank. In case of uh, the BNPL also, it's not the merchant. Uh, who it's is, a bank only. It's, a, it's again a bank. Again, when they give you money, um, as a limit. Again, the same kind of credit history check is happening, same kind of um, KYC is being happening, 
The only difference between credit card and the BNPL IC is it's just uh, happening through an app rather than a physical physical name. card. So uh, the risks what what you have spoken, I mean uh, the friends before spoken, are same in case of credit card or in case of BN BNPL. It's no difference. It's just a digitization of yes digitization credit. of process right. That's yes digitization of process. And the benefit over here that like a uh, uh, interest rate another. So yeah, credit interest card has rate a higher interest rate and the BNPL has a lower interest. Yeah, rate. Inter interest rate. I I wouldn't call it as a benefit because just to start with uh, uh, to to have the customer acquisition they are doing it at red, uh, lower interest rates. But yes. once once the customer acquisition happens, probably they also might uh, rise up to the interest rates, right? Yes. Uh, but but I would I would look at it as uh, the digitization of credit process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mahadev. I am from the same company, uh, Assembly Technologies. Uh, I just uh, I want to answer your questions uh, question, uh, which is uh, right. You ask uh, uh, the consumers um, can be the eighty percent defaulters, right? Yeah, maybe, can be, yeah, it can be, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, we are only uh, providing platform to all uh, uh, customers or maybe the peoples, okay? Uh, and uh, whatever they are going to take a loan or they are taking benefits of, uh, from the BNPL, uh, that is not our responsibility. While taking any uh, credit uh, from the lenders or NBFCs, uh, that is taken by uh, the lenders only. They are checking, they are taking documents and uh, uh, they are not blindly give you any amount. They are uh, validating your proofs, identity proofs. So based on that, they are approving any uh, credit or amount. Yeah, yeah, we are just a platform. Yeah, that's it, I hope. Uh, Right. So my question should have been addressed to a, to a uh, lender. <coughs> However, since you are the, in the market and you've done some market research, I was uh, I thought you had some insights on uh, on the, 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 those defaulting uh, percentages. Yeah, we asked same questions for the NDFCs or the lenders. Uh, so they said like they are taken care by these things. So you don't worry about these things. So based on that, like. They are becoming partner to us. So the whole healthcare uh, care now pay later model was thought of by the lenders. Uh, so they did the market research, not not your platform. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, uh, but. Uh, then I addressed the question. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Thank gentlemen. Will I have to interrupt you guys? Our time's up, but we know I can see a lot of people have questions, and you'd like to take the discussion forward. Sanjay, they'll be grabbing you during uh, lunch time, if sure, it's sure. okay, or our mingling time afterwards, after the sessions are over for the day. So do grab him, and you can take this discussion further later. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be available over here. You guys meet me anytime. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sanjay. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our recognition session now. We are going to highlight the contributions of people who in both little and large ways are driving a positive change. Now to do the honors, can I please call upon stage Dr. Abdel Omar, CEO of Virgil Hospital. Good morning. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, starting now, our first award of the day goes to Hing Yan Lee. Congratulations.
right, our next award goes to Irfan Shakil. Congratulations, Irfan. Times before, I would I would not like to take a lot of time. Uh, so thank you for having me today, and thank you for Internet 2.0 and their crew for organizing this marvelous uh, event. And probably since uh, you know, uh, since two days we have been talking about too much about Web 3.0. So probably next year we'll be having Internet 3.0 conference. <laughs> anyway, all right. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Our next award goes to Norhan Shendi. Thank you for the honor and uh, thank you for being, having the opportunity to be among these amazing leaders. Um, I just want to tell you a short story that uh, I've been a software tester for four years and then I took a leap of faith and uh, I changed my career to be a project manager and now here I am. So I just want to give a quick thank you to my husband here who has been uh, supporting me from day one, and to my managers and my company who trusted me with this journey. Uh, just um, from my experience, if you want to change where you are, just uh, do it. It's the, still the present, not the future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next award goes to Vamsi Krishna Komanduru. Do we have Vamsi um, here? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I feel uh, honored and uh, grateful to receive this outstanding leadership award. Uh, thanks to Internet 2.0 for giving this award and uh, an amazing conference here, meeting a lot of technology leaders. And uh, I'd like to thank my parents. Um, uh, it's because of their upbringing I could become a good leader. And thanks to my wife, who is watching me live there. And uh, she's always been a great motivation for me. And thanks to my team back in India, who always supported me and did technological wonders. Uh, and, and they are the cause of my success as well. Uh, my name is Vamsi Krishna. I represent Infinite Uptime, India Private Limited. Um, this is a company based out of in India, and uh, uh, we, uh, as a company, help uh, our customers in manufacturing and process industries in their uh, Industry 4.0 and digitization journey, 
uh, we we do the predictive analysis and make their plants operate more efficient way and uh, please reach out to me I, I would be happy to connect with you all and congratulations to all the uh, fellow award winners thank you All right, our next award goes to Jeremy Michaud. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here, honestly. Uh, didn't expect that when I started this company five years ago. So uh, the, uh, being an entrepreneur is not always easy, but uh, this is definitely one of highlight of uh, my career. And I want to thank my, my family, my team, and my friends to have been supportive all along the way. Thank you very much. And our next award goes to Ali Moses. First of all, thank you to the Internet 2.0 team. Uh, Anubhav, Kashif, you guys have been great. Um, great conference. Um, and thanks to Allah and then my family, uh, my brother, my mother, and my wife. Uh, she's always been very supportive. Um, and my team back in Pakistan. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Ali Mojes. I run a data science, big data analytics, and AI services company. Um, we have clients spread across US, Europe, Australia, and Pakistan. Um, in short, we help companies uh, with prescriptive, descriptive, and predictive analytics. So if you want to understand the why, how, and when of your business through data, you can always reach out. Um, and honestly, it has been a great experience, uh, you know, connecting with some great people. Um, it's the first time here in Dubai. And honestly, I love the city, great city, great vibe, and a great conference. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, our next award goes to Mohammed Kawas. Congratulations. Okay, um, good morning everyone. Thanks for this uh, conference and for hosting it. Thanks for my team. Of course, it's always uh, the team behind uh, any leader or any success. Uh, I'm Hamad. I'm representing Quality AI. Uh, we are an AI technology company. Our primary focus on uh, safety driving. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet all uh, of the guys that I had the opportunity to meet. And uh, I hope to meet the other in uh, uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next award goes to G DGC UA Limited. Anyone from DGC? Yes. Lovely. Congratulations.
thank you so much on behalf of DGC. And we had a great year, uh, very successful. We are a cybersecurity company from Germany. And we established our company this year in UAE as well. And we're looking forward to a very successful next year. And thanks so much for the award. Take care. Thank you. Congratulations. Lovely. And our next award goes to Dino Huber. Dino's here? Dino's not here. All right. The next award goes to Behruz Ibrahim. Lovely. Congratulations. Actually, I don't know what to say, but thanks for everybody to be here, and thanks, Scott, uh, for allowing me to be here with you, with the technology leaders, and thanks uh, for the Internet 2.0 uh, for this kind of conference. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. All right, we've got Julian here who will be accepting the award on behalf of Dino Huber. Our next award goes to Rena Jane. Lovely, congratulations, Rena. Good morning, everyone. I'm truly honored to be receiving the Visionaries Award in Technology. It's not an everyday scenario where there's a room full of thought leaders in technology, and I would like to thank Internet 2.0, the organizers, for getting this together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next award goes to Anjum Shahzad. I am holding this award on behalf of my client, 
Anjun, who is founder of Wayworld Technology and Blocks Bytes, both award-winning companies. By the way, uh, yesterday he got an award from President of Pakistan. So I am proud to hold this award on behalf of him. And I am Edward Musinski, representing MX New Hub in the Ministry of Economy of Dubai. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next award goes to Vatan Vendel. Congratulations. Good morning everyone, honored, happy and humble to be here. This award is for my family sitting there. Thank you, they have been my constant driving force. Uh, my name is Vatan, I represent Shura Technologies Dubai. We are into IoT space, uh, we are doing video based telematics solution. So happy to connect if somebody wants to understand that field. Thank you ma'am. Our next award goes to Subramania Joyce. Thank you, Internet 2.0, for this award. Uh, it's been a great event, and I think thanks for the wonderful organization. Uh, Audigraph, as we call it, is, a, I would say, the first and only DLT which made sort of blockchain obsolete. More out of the performances that we've been able to deliver overcome the limitations of uh, blockchain and scalability and throughput. And now I, I guess we are going on, onward to the next journey which is to integrate with open data and open banking some of the issues our friends were discussing a few minutes ago. Thank you. Our next award goes to the Business Aries Business Solutions Private Limited. Anyone here from Aries Business Solutions? So uh, thank you for having us. Uh, so we are a 11 years old firm now. Uh, we are present in UAE. We are present in US, uh, India, and Mexico. Um, what Aries does is a lot of things. And I think uh, uh, some, we heard some of the gentlemen around AI. So I'm a PhD in applied AI. Uh, I do a lot of things into IoT space as well. Uh, happy to connect with anybody and whosoever would want to collaborate with Aries. And uh, so I represent in the CTO capacity. And uh, yeah, it's an amazing room full of amazing thoughts and amazing uh, vibes. And happy to connect at any time with any of you who would like to uh, understand more on collaboration opportunities around banking, finance, security, 
anything under the sun, you can Google us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Our next award goes to Noriko Maihara. Noriko is not here, it seems like. That's okay, we're gonna move on. And the next award goes to Muhammad Abu Jaffal. Moving on, Yara Miles is here to receive the award. No issues. All right, I'd, I'd like to call upon stage Behruz Ibrahim once again. We had a slight mix up in the back team. I'm sorry, please come and receive your award. Apologies. Congratulations to all the honorees for their tremendous uh, contribution to the industry and thank you Dr. Abdel for doing the honors. Thank you. Dr. Abdel Omar, CEO of Virgil Hospital, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Moving our focus actually to blockchains now. So how is blockchain doing right now? Well, our next topic is current state of blockchain opportunities and challenges and to come on stage and discuss the issue our panelists include Mayur Poder, whole time director and chief business officer from 3.0 verse limited Jay Vishwakarma CTO of product development at Aries business solutions and Julian Sawyer business architect for blockchain at DGC a round of applause for our gentlemen on stage today Are you going to pick up the mic if you like? Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess it's uh, us two um, conducting the panel uh, discussion today. So we're talking about uh, blockchain opportunities and challenges. Just maybe a quick background uh, to me. Uh, I'm a business architect uh, for blockchain at the company DGC. Uh, we do uh, cyber security and this year, or let's say we, we focus this year on uh, blockchain security and compliance. So we are official partners of uh, the Venom blockchain, which is the first ADGM licensed blockchain in Abu Dhabi. And we um, kind of conduct a cybersecurity um, integration. Uh, we uh, provide um, KYT. So that's a big topic at the moment. It's called uh, Know Your Transaction. It's to be compliant with the regulators to kind of um, hinder any illicit activities on your blockchain. And that's um, currently where I'm working in. And it's a very interesting field. And uh, yeah. yeah, maybe you can Thanks, give Julian. a quick intro. Yeah. So, so as you could see that this was supposed to be a very different conversation, but uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we don't have our third person. Uh, so uh, just a bit about myself and uh, uh, just to continue on Julian's thoughts. Uh, so I'm Jay, I'm part of Aries, and we do more of enterprise applications on blockchain, uh, which could include your contracts, uh, we just completed our uh, carbon footprint uh, product on blockchain. Uh, so the whole idea about blockchain for me is more around enterprise adoption uh, and more around how you see value of a trust over a certain uh, monetary or a financial value of it. 
Uh, so that's my focus area per se around how blockchain's adoption uh, is going to help in enterprises. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if how Julianne wants to do this, uh, but uh, we would love to have questions and then kind of connect the dots with you, or we could just talk about our predictions or forecasts around yeah. blockchain. So, so we open the forum. If if anybody has any questions to start with. It could be technical, it could be business, anything around blockchain and its uh, applicability. Maybe until you guys, oh yeah, please, go ahead. Hi, so uh, I have a doubt, like, uh, how is blockchain adoption done in enterprises? Okay, so, uh, so Julian, do you want to take that? Uh, okay, okay. So, okay. So, uh, in terms of blockchain adoption in enterprises, I could talk about some of the things that we have done at Aries. Uh, so, we just did uh, a contract 360. Uh, we are calling it in house. Of course, it could have a different branding and other things outside. Uh, but it's all about a bit with NLP and blockchain both, uh, where we are trying to build uh, or we are trying to get to the customers with the entire end suit of product where you could do your contracts management, you could do the management of uh, any sort of, uh, I would say, legal transaction over blockchain, and that's what uh, blockchain is known for, for its trust and immutability per se. And uh, the whole idea uh, of having a contract management with an NLP uh, component to it, where I could understand the events that are embedded in your contracts. So if there is a contract on an ex party, via a party, a certain date and event, how could I extract that information, get the signatures and the traceability mapped to a certain time in frequency of a particular, uh, I would say, event occurrence, and then have all of this being managed on a blockchain. So that's one of the use cases of enterprise applications that we see, uh, and of course, uh, one of the hottest topics that we hear today is climate and uh, carbon footprint or how you manage your carbon footprint. Uh, so carbon trading, uh, so I have a couple of patents in this area. Uh, so one of the patents that we did implement is around carbon footprint calculation and management at a company level and at an individual level. So both B2B and B2C is something we have just done. Uh, we have branded it as carbon IQ, uh, but yeah, it could have any other name for any other client, right? So that's, that's, these are the two uh, very glaring uh, solutioning on a blockchain as an enterprise adoption. And I move it to uh, Julian now if he has any thoughts. Uh, yeah, so um, before I was at DGC, I worked for uh, a state bank in Germany. And one of the enterprise use cases uh, we did there was asset back commercial papers uh, via the blockchain because um, they needed like a trustless system between those companies. It wasn't a public blockchain, it was enterprise, uh, it was on the quarter blockchain. But um, what the bank needed was like a trustless environment where all those involved parties can kind of transact their asset back commercial papers and the bank would only facilitate as maybe a notary on, on that point, on, on their behalf. And uh, that was actually a very big uh, and good use case. Um, what we see as well is like kind of uh, financial services um, on the blockchain. Uh, that's a, a big kind of where we're talking about opportunities and challenges. A big opportunity I see is, for example, um, in the bond business. So uh, investing in bonds has a minimum kind of investment, usually higher than the average salary. Um, I know a company in India, for example, we're trying to facilitate this. The investment in bonds in India is around 10,000 to 20,000 rupees. And uh, that's mostly too high for the younger population. So what they want to do is they want to tokenize it and fractionalize these bonds and make the investment as low as 100 rupees per investment. So um, as well, um, low incomes could facilitate and use this kind of use case. And uh, when we're talking about challenges, the biggest challenge I see, of course, is regulations. Uh, we see that with FTX, for example, we need better regulations, we need better compliance tools in place and we see as well UAE is um, kind of catching up. They have uh, new regulations where they say, okay, we require these tools, otherwise um, this company can't pursue further on what they're doing. Of course, there are different levels of financial institutes and depending on what kind of level you have, you need these uh, compliance tools in place. Um, but I think that's the biggest challenge at the moment is to kind of facilitate 
this very fast evolving technology and combining that with um, the regulations which sometimes need time to catch up. Um, yeah, absolutely, Julian. And I think one of the areas of compliance itself can be a blockchain use case, right? So uh, like for example, in government of India, uh, there are paperwork for, let's say, so we, I don't know how many of you are aware of Indian ecosystem, uh, but we do have uh, uh, certain places where for daily labors, uh, we have these monetary uh, help that the government provides. Uh, so for those documentations and to be able to send money as well, now blockchain is part of the government systems, right? So even for compliance related topics, I think blockchain is an amazing solution to have. Uh, but then again, uh, having said that, like Julian said, right? So your, your compliance framework and the government governance frameworks have to be so solid that you do not misuse uh, blockchain like FTX and others did. And I think with FTX, uh, it was not just compliance, it was also overconfidence on the platform itself. Nobody went to audit where the funds were being used. Nobody really cared where the funds were parked and for what purposes were they used, right? So I think uh, these are some of the oversight areas. So while the technology is great, uh, the misuse of anything is bad, right? So I think, I think this is where it is headed. Uh, over and above, I think, uh, in general, uh, blockchain as a solution or as a technology is amazing. Of course, we have also evolved over time just on the green side of uh, blockchain. Earlier, it was very costly. I don't know how many of you are aware, uh, but it was very uh, compute intensive technology. Yeah. Now, we have started improving the algorithms. We have started improving the way nodes work, right? We have started now a data DeFi movement where you could be the owners of your data and citizen scientists where you don't have to really expose your data and then you can s still use that data and get the algorithms process that information. So I think uh, it is evolving in the right direction, but yeah, uh, compliances have to be you know, kept in place to check it. So yeah, maybe jump, uh, I'll jump in on that. So the evolution was quite interesting from uh, blockchain. We kind of started with uh, Bitcoin as like uh, transfer of value, um, going over to like Ethereum where we like could use smart contracts. Then the, of, I remember the beginning of blockchain was all the focus on um, being as decentralized as possible, uh, being like private, nobody can interfere in kind of these transactions. Then going over to this kind of uh, DeFi and NFT hype which uh, was very interesting. And now we're coming to this kind of, okay, we like blockchain, but we need a kind of more regulation to use it in a real world kind of um, asset management. Um, of course, you still can use blockchain um, for kind of decentralized transactions. But I see the main use case or the main topics are actually how can we facilitate current industries and how can we connect uh, big institutes and financial services to the blockchain for that kind of uh, people are talking more and more about uh, kind of regulations, um, KYT, as well there was um, the AML conference in Abu Dhabi, and it wasn't a blockchain conference, it actually was a regulations conference, but the main topic was blockchain. And of course, there's always this area where we say, okay, how can we make, let's say, Ethereum more decentralized on uh, very different levels, where we can say, okay, now the blockchain is getting so big on a data storage that it's very difficult to kind of, as a normal user, to run a full validator node. So people are talking about uh, light clients, then you need light clients with different software by different teams, because if one team only provides the software and there's a bug in the software, then of course there's another centralized point and central point of failure. So uh, these guys are focusing on decentralization, but the rest of the world is actually focusing on how can we put real world assets onto this kind of awesome technology. And of course banks, they always like to have their own kind of thing and they, uh, they have their own enterprise blockchains uh, which they facilitate and people see maybe the trend where we do cross-chain where okay they have their own blockchain they have their own system but then they will connect with these bridging services to the uh, public blockchains and then uh, this kind of uh, compatibility uh, with different blockchains and different use cases i think is a, a very a big step uh, yeah yeah uh, so so any questions that uh, anybody has no? Yes. Yeah, please. So my name is Mohan. I come from a company called Code Metrics. 
uh, back from India. So we worked on a couple of NFT projects and uh, uh, like how NFT worked, as you said, everything was hyped, overhyped, and influencers, Discord, channels, a lot of things. By the time we were able to see some market, we got halt because of the policies and everything. Apart from this kind of hype, is there any uh, centralized or I would say regulatories that can be brought into this system where we can see the evolution of, uh, our, uh, what do you say, owning an asset with an identity? What's your thought? Okay, so uh, so while at Aries, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware about Salman Khan here. Are you aware of Bollywood star Salman Khan? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. So Salman Khan owns or had launched something called as Bollycoin in India. Uh, it was the first uh, uh, Bollywood-inspired NFT marketplace. Yeah. So I headed the CTO function for them, and we made it to the top five NFTs in the Forbes um, and a very good question around NFTs. So, so NFTs, uh, they have to have a value attached to it that people can then cash back. Yeah, It's not that different from reward points and loyalty points, but the way you have to structure it is key. Yeah, And again, uh, so you would have already seen that class lawsuits have been filed in US for all the stars who had bad uh, board yacht club uh, NFTs, right? Because they tanked, right? Now, board yacht club never did anything for the buyers to really use those NFTs for certain experiences or products or services that they could take away. So it's just like any other currency, right? Because, uh, so let's say, why is Indian rupee uh, X price than the US dollar or euro, right? Because it's the way you trade with that currency across the globe. So if that NFT has that tradable value, then it continues to hold its position, right? So do you mean we need to fall back to the battle system where each identity can be exchanged in terms of I give you something, you can give me something. Yes. It's not about just the money. No. Okay. And see, one of the one of the biggest problems with NFT marketplace was exactly this: that people were buying CryptoPunk at 69 million and X and what not, right? So even then, I was very uh, afraid that it is going to tank one day and people are going to come back crying, right? Uh, because nothing can be that pricey in a digital world which doesn't have a real asset value, right? So uh, it has to be very moderated but it is people who have to push back right so it cannot be that you buy nfts at such high prices it has to be the value versus the price that you pay for an nft has to be logical let me put it this way yeah i agree on that like there, there was this hype where people were selling uh, kind of jpegs and people were buying it for a very high price and at the end of the day this jpeg was connected to like a hash and that would make it valuable and uh, now I see NFTs with actually like use cases where it's backed by some real world kind of uh, asset or real world kind of uh, idea, not even real world, like even iGaming. I see NFTs in, in um, kind of the gaming industry makes sense. If you see like the hype with uh, FIFA cards or, or Fortnite um, skin where that's, for example, there would be a use case because people are using this game and then um, this NFT would kind of facilitate the transferable and tradability uh, towards that. But if you're just selling, let's say, uh, JPEGs and uh, people are buying this, this end of the day is will kind of blow up and then crash. And then uh, you have this kind of uh, big disappointment for most people. So I have one last question. Like we had a lot of things here and there and we see, uh, we have grown up seeing our seniors, right? And we have a lot of young generations coming to the platform seeing this hyped, so-called hyped market. So if we create an ecosystem which can sustain, do you think uh, we can bring back life back to like whatever we have lost like from NFTs and all the, uh, I would say the identity management system? So uh, just on the NFT marketplaces itself, right? So we just did an event, a uh, metaverse event, uh, I think last month on Bollycoin, where we gave exactly what Julian said. So whosoever had bought this, uh, 
Um, so we call it chill bulls, and you can find them in OpenSea. So we distributed about 2,222 uh, unique chill bulls, they are in empty collections, to all the community holders, and whosoever wanted to experience with the singer, with the star, they got those experiences, right? And they were not that hyped, right? So people bought it. And then people attended this metaverse event on Decentraland, and they had an amazing experience, right? So I think uh, toward Julian's point as well, right? So uh, there has to be a regulatory mechanism to these things, and I think uh, because most of the governments, and, and because it is a decentralized network, right? Even the authorities or, you know, I would say, uh, uh, governments don't want to play in it because it is your will, right? It is you as a consumer who has selected to pay that kind of a money, right? But if there was a consortium, right, which, which uh, I think uh, like Julian is part of one of them, right, around security, but if imagine there could have been a consortium that similar chains could form and say that, okay, beyond this price, it is impractical, right? Things like these could really change the game and bring back the trust of people into this kind of a business, which is NFT business. Yeah, but otherwise, yeah, we're just playing along. So can I summarize, like uh, you're saying, we should bring back the policies to bring back things back oh, yeah. to the life. Yeah. Absolutely, you. absolutely. Yeah, I agree because um, th the danger is if you, if you don't have regulations, of course, people say um, we are independent of any, any government. Um, and there, there's a maybe use case if you're in a, in a region where you're followed and you kind of have to, um, be independent of the local currency, but um, otherwise, actually, they, uh, the regulators want to protect yeah. kind of the um, citizens of scam and, of course, of money laundering. Because um, Chain Analysis had a very interesting study um, recently showing that um, money laundering uses DeFi to kind of um, store their, their illicit money in these uh, liquidity pools, and then uh, it's very hard. Um, it was very hard, but now the technology is getting better to kind of track where the money is going because what they used to do is they use mixers, they use um, different obfuscation kind of tools, uh, they use it cross-chain, they use these liquidity pools, and it's very difficult, even though everything's transparently um, tracked on the blockchain, it's very difficult to kind of follow the money along and see where someone's trying to off-ramp the money because ransomware, for example, the people who do ransomware, um, at the end of the day, they want to get paid, so they use just uh, cryptocurrency as an intermediate to receive the money, but at the end of the day, they want to off-ramp it. And that was very interesting, there were two uh, major off-ramping services which were kind of closed down by the um, SEC. And then you could see the panic on the blockchain for all these ransomware scammers, because they didn't know where or how to off-ramp the money. And that's very interesting to see, like, as soon as uh, like these illicit activities are closed down and the regulators actually kind of uh, get involved into this uh, ecosystem, then uh, there will be more trust and more real actual use cases and, and money flowing in this uh, blockchain ecosystem. Is there's only kind of uh, this dark web, deep web kind of activities, um, people first of all lose trust because there will be a lot of scam and fraud and uh, money laundering as well as a, as a big danger. So that's why I see uh, always we need these regulations, otherwise uh, there will be uh, more and more kind of uh, bubbles and FTX kind of examples. Hi, uh, I'm Subhu Joyce uh, from Auricraft. We are a DLT ourselves, we built a protocol and, and the platform ground up. Now, uh, coming back to the topic here, uh, for the last two years we have seen NFTs and then we have seen the Terra Luna uh, followed by Celsius and everything that followed in the collapse of DeFi. And now we're just seeing the regulatory issues with FTX and things like that. Uh, at this point of time, we, there's a lot of hype about Metaverse. Uh, I, I would still call it a hype because I, I still don't subscribe to it um, heart of hearts. Yesterday I was reading about a Metaverse for chess and there's another Metaverse for cabbing and things like that. This seems to remind me of exactly the dot-com days if, if those of you have been through that journey, right? So uh, we saw the dot-com days, we saw so many cryptocurrencies come up for all purposes, and now we seem to be repeating that with Metaverse. Where do you think this is going? Okay, so, uh, so Metaverse is not bad, uh, but I think it is an experience. It has, it has more value 
in certain business areas. So, uh, so just before Aries, I was uh, heading innovation and technology for Volkswagen. And I know that for luxury brands, I myself introduced for Porsche and Lamborghini these experience centers mm -hmm. using Metaverse, right? So there the XR technologies are playing very well, right? Even for learning and development for that matter, right? And, and it has proved well for in autistic kids and other places. Uh, but I think uh, for a mainline business like that of yours or like that of mine, it is we have to be very selective on where metaverse's value is. And again, for me, metaverse is, I, I would say, three steps ahead. I would rather say mixed reality and augmented reality and virtual reality is more practical for me for the use cases that I, I, I can think of uh, in enterprise segments, right? So yeah, but it is bad, but like I said, it is more confined or its value would be better or higher in certain business areas, not in every business. Yeah, I agree on that. Um, like um, I see a virtual reality is actually a bigger use case than uh, the metaverse. I think metaverse is a bit too far ahead of uh, the actual use case. Um, we at DGC actually have a virtual reality um, department where we do um, security awareness training. So people kind of get a, a virtual reality experience and kind of be more aware of what are the cyber security risks. Um, that makes it more interesting for people who have not or no IT knowledge and don't wanna click through kind of a, a very dull kind of learning experience and they wanna put on the glasses and really experience, okay, what could be a threat? And um, there's the use case, but we don't see, okay, why would we use metaverse in that direction? Because virtual reality would actually solve this use case uh, just fine. Yeah, I have a follow-up question to that is that uh, I'm not sure how many of us are aware that uh, Facebook changed its name to Meta and uh, they seem to be you now shutting down the entire Metaverse business, if you're aware, yeah. right? Given that there was so, mu so much of hype about Meta, what would you advise the current generation from our experience? So, um, so I would stick to my uh, stance around Metaverse per se. Uh, metaverse is more of experiences uh, and it has uh, a lot to do with Gen Z who uh, have other insecurities, I would say, for physical presence and other things. And I think there is a culture now that we have on, uh, so I don't know how many of you have, uh, you know, a habit of doing research around how your kids uh, see these mobile phones and, uh, and there was a research that was conducted and uh, so it was like mobile phone versus mother people chose mobile phone, yeah? So in terms of their availability, yeah? So that is very, very alarming. And I think this, this trend is going to be there. It is not just going to vanish. But I think uh, uh, to keep it practical to what Julian said, so for me as well, XR or AR or VR are more practical technologies and solutions uh, that we do. And I think uh, even uh, like in his company at Audi, we do all the new interns and apprentices that come in, they get trained actually on a VR application that we developed rather than going directly on the machine. Yeah, so that is much riskier. So they first get trained on a VR application on how to assemble the parts, to know the parts, and then they actually go on the actual cars, right? So this is a much more practical way of seeing uh, how augmented reality or a step before metaverse 0 0.5, so to speak. So that's more practical for at least me. So. Yeah, I definitely agree on that. Uh, I think metaverse is at the moment a bit overhyped. That's uh, kind of the new kid on the block. And uh, you actually, for me, always, I always look what's the real world kind of use case for someone who doesn't know anything about technology. Would he actually use this? And um, there are some use cases, definitely, but uh, sometimes I have my doubts in, in certain um, kind of uh, departments. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hi, this is Anubhav from uh, India. Um, I have a question regarding an opportunity in blockchain is specific to uh, sub, uh, B2B supply chain domain. Like, is, uh, can you give an example of wh what is, where is an opportunity or a problem statement which ca can't be solved traditionally, but maybe smart contracts on blockchain can help really out there? Uh, so uh, one uh, interesting supply chain example was, um, so you have uh, this supply chain of 
for example, in China, uh, production, there are a lot of um, counterfeits. So there are some productions would actually literally copy what, what you're doing and what they would do, they would have an NFT chip or a QR code and would connect this to the blockchain to have a very transparent route of where the actual real product is uh, being delivered. And um, I know one company, for example, who does this with wine bottles uh, from Italy, um, which they, their production uh, in Italy, they, they, as soon as the bottles are produced, they put on a, um, a NFT see kind of or NFC uh, chip or a QR code and then every step of the supply chain is kind of scanned uh, recorded on the blockchain and as soon as you kind of buy this bottle you can scan it and see the track record and um, very transparently of course this blockchain doesn't have to be 100% uh, decentralized because there will always be kind of uh, the single point of failure in the supply chain but uh, that's for, for me example a very big um, use case where you can see okay this is an original product this is a counterfeit and um, you can actually know this is uh, what you're buying. So I have a follow-up question on that. Uh, so why uh, only an NFT chip? Why can't it be done through an RFID or something like that? Um, so NFT was used because um, some products uh, wanted to use a secure element. And for the secure element, um, NFC was kind of the best use case because it could kind of charge up the secure element without the external battery because then, of course, the hardware gets very big and very expensive. Um, so that's why they said we're going to use um, NFC because with NFC you can kind of, if you have the right device, even a phone could do it, could kind of power up through the um, ma magnetic um, connection, power up the secure element and kind of do this signature, uh, this handshake between the phone or the, the device and the product. And then you have 100% proof this is actually the product because it will be kind of impossible to copy this chip uh, because this is as secure as a credit card chip. and. As well, they're, they're like, for example, very small kind of um, wires. So as soon as you break the bottle open, it will break the connection, and then you will see that uh, the NFC chip is not working. It will give a default response that uh, has been already used. Um, so that was uh, one of the use cases why they used NFC. So I would share two, two use cases, actually, that uh, I read in the past. So uh, how many of you know Firmanish? Have you heard of an organization named Firmanish? No. Uh, how many of you know Hugo Boss? Yes. Armani. So the smell that you have of these fragrances actually is done by Firmanish. So they're a B2B firm. So, uh, so what Firmanish did, and you can look them out. So there is a product called Path to Farm. Okay, they have a trademark now on this. So Path to Farm is exactly what Julian just said. But we didn't do RFIDs, we didn't do NFC tags, we did very simple QR codes. Yeah? Uh, internally, we called it uh, differently, but now the product is out in the market, so we call it Path to Farm. It's an end-to-end -end traceability product that does the traceability of your ingredient in that fragrance all the way from a farm in, let's say, you know, India or Japan or Indonesia or anywhere, and you could trace back its entire footprint yeah, across the line, across the borders, yeah, just with QR codes, and we didn't use blockchain for this. We so, used very so simple. Our, our company also does the same for yeah. uh, um, all the supply chain businesses. Nice. From, uh, manufacturing, uh, mapping it to a QR code or a barcode, and then uh, to the end customer, uh, they can just scan and see the whole journey of the product itself. Perfect. So this is the first use case. The second use case that we did was for the counterfeit of uh, actual uh, OEM parts for Volkswagen, uh, where we implemented the blockchain for basically the trust. Uh, you scan the code and you see whether it is genuine or not. Yeah. So instead of holograms and all of that uh, traditional tech, we implemented a blockchain-based uh, supply chain traceability uh, application side of it. So yeah. So these were the two. Uh, and of course, now we just did the carbon uh, IQ, where not just the product footprint, but we are calculating the energy and the carbon footprint all the way up to the product which is in your hand. And you could just like your ingredients that you see, right? Fat X percent, protein X percent, right? You could now see carbon X percent and energy X percent. So we have a patent now on this. So yeah. Yeah, That's a great idea. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think uh, our yes, time please. is up, but yeah, we have. Yeah, our time is up. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Matt Hogan from Converse. First of all, in loving what you guys are talking about. Um, in regards to 
like the regulation side of things, have you guys heard of the ISO 222 tokens? So this is actually like a really important thing, I think. Like Russia and China in 2018, 2019 were buying up all the gold reserves globally and they did not care how much they spent. And then now they're bringing out a digital yuan, they're backing out with real life assets of gold and tokenizing it, right? Yeah, Which yeah. gets back to the NFT side of things. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know about this stuff? So, yeah, yeah. So, Siberium is one such blockchain uh, framework, I would say. Mm -hmm. They have uh, implemented the way the real assets can be defied. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's well tested now. And yeah, if anybody is willing to go and build a product on that, please go ahead. So, they have kind of uh, built the entire ecosystem and the framework right. uh, for you to digitize your physical assets like uh, in India we have by the way uh, and I think about a couple of state governments have implemented that where your land records are digitized on a blockchain now Absolutely. so you can just find your land and nobody can actually uh, claim that it Correct. is well they had that issue in uh, Croatia for example you know in the war where, where land titles were actually all written down and then you know the government office got bombed or whatever and then all the land titles are gone I know a lawyer that was actually going and specializing in this in regards to land title disputes. And it was all paper-based, so yeah, yeah, you know, a absolutely. huge problem. Um, the other thing too in regards to the, the real world use case is um, if you look at say Hedera with Atma.io, and Atma.io are like doing billions of tokenized products. I think they're doing the whole inventory for Adidas, for example, and they're tokenizing it. So you exactly to your point in regards to following that chain of authenticity. You know, so I think that's where a real life use case in regards to NFT is actually applicable and um, there's some really exciting things in this space in regards to look out for in regards to yeah, the NFT yeah. tokenization. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, this, this, uh, I think the next kind of um, thing that will come with blockchain, which is already there, but it's slowly rising up as uh, um, real world assets, it's called. Yeah. And uh, I think yesterday there was a speaker as well and he works for a company which do um, kind of tokenization of real estate in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And for the, let's say, the common people, it's impossible to buy a real estate, let's say, in Zurich because it's so expensive. But if they would kind of tokenize and fractionalize it, the investment for kind of normal earners would be possible and they would benefit from the profits from these uh, real estate. And I think there are so many use cases in that area. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I think uh, the only thing is regulations, of course. But as soon as uh, these are in correct. place, uh, the, yeah. the product, product is ready to go. Well, I think that's where the ISO 222 philosophy is actually kicking in you know, where it's regulated tokens, it's actually backed by real world assets. I actually wonder when uh, we as resources will be tokenized <laughs> with reputational tokens as well, you know, and um, in society you'll actually start, I think, seeing, you know, experts in fields actually rising to the top and having their own token. Basically, you know, you'll be a, there will be a bidding war on different types of talent. So I think not just resources, but like resources as in typical assets, gold, metals, etc., but actual people. Yeah, and the interesting is that when you have all these use cases, then you can do multi-asset investment. Let's say you have uh, kind of $5,000 and you want to invest them, but you don't want to invest them in a single kind of asset. Now you have all these use cases and they're all fractionalized and tokenized. You can do like a multi-asset investment. And then this multi-asset investment can be used, let's say, in a lending pool. Of course, you're not allowed to blow it up too much, but you can put it in a lending pool, lend against it, or use it as a... Um, uh, other financial services, and then there's a massive use case as well. Transferring these multiple asset investments is very easy then because yeah, yeah. me, myself, I tried to kind of transfer um, gold certificates from one platform to another, and there was, I was uh, surprised how many papers I had to sign. Mm. And if you kind of tokenize this, and you have a multiple assets, which tokenize the transferability is, is amazing. I think that's yeah. a massive use case. Absolutely. It's the inst instantaneous um, transaction. You know, I think that's where we're going to see huge um, advancements in technology in, in a whole bunch of areas <laughs> and, and less frustration in the process. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. It's been great. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We'll take questions now in the lunch. <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, yep, so questions we're going to have... Uh, a break after the next session so you can definitely grab each other and pick each other's brains for sure. Uh, our next session is a fireside chat on the topic a human-centered approach to machine learning why we need to put people first. Can I please call upon stage our speakers Vishnu Ramesh CEO of Subtle AI and Mahadev Panekar co-founder and CTO at Assimilate. 
Thank you. Hey, good, uh, good morning, all. Uh, here I am as a moderator. Uh, like a student, I'm going to ask some questions to Vishnu. Uh, my name is Mahadev and uh, CTO of uh, Simulate Technologies. Uh, here we are, we are a software development company as well, as, well as consulting firm. Uh, yeah, over to you. Uh, so my name is Vishnu. I'm the co-founder at Subtle.ai. We're a deep technology startup based out of Hyderabad, India. Uh, so, yeah, uh, basically, uh, we from the first day we heard about AI. AI is constantly evolving as a new technology and technique. So, just set to end context, uh, in its uh, fundamental sense, what is an AI? So, in very basic terms, the whole concept of AI is to try to replicate an element of human thought. Right, because uh, that's essentially uh, fundamentally what we're trying to do with AI. So but the goal of AI, so to speak, is twofold, right? Number one is to replace mundane tasks so that we can focus on more creative tasks. Uh, and uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Give me a <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, sec uh, the second goal, of course, is to assist us. Rather than, uh, people have this perception that the whole point of AI is to replace w what we do and then we become redundant. That's not actually how uh, folks in the tech world are looking at it. The whole purpose of AI is supposed to uh, assist us with what we do in order to, you know, improve the quality of jobs itself that we're involved with on a daily basis. Okay. So, can you tell us uh, uh, your experience uh, with AI and uh, what do you offer in subcell.ai? Uh, if you could uh, also give us an example, uh, if you have slide something, so that could be better. Uh, sure, sure. To understand so, the things. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so quick background of my exposure to AI was actually when I met my uh, chief scientist in 2018. His name is Manish Shivastava. Uh, very well known guy in this space. Did his PhD in IIT Bombay in 2006, spent the last 16 years uh, doing a lot of core NLP research. So everything we, I know of this space is because I had the chance to work under him. And uh, it was, I think over that experience, uh, over the summer of 2018 was when I actually got exposed to, you know, the potential of AI, the way things are changing. Of course, around that time, uh, computational capabilities started improving, right? Like the amount of computations servers can do uh, significantly started improving. And I think that also kind of opened the pathways uh, to uh, develop AI applications and start uh, really rolling it out there uh, for people to use. Uh, so I think the best way to run through the experience sure, sure. would be, uh, I can actually maybe do a quick product walkthrough of what we do. Uh, so it just gives you an idea of how AI is being applied, right, in the current environment uh, that we're in. So if the organizing team can help me with the product, yeah. Uh, so just to set some context again, right, what we're basically doing is uh, these are AI assistants that can understand your documents and videos and then answer any questions you have on top of that. Uh, so that you don't have to sift through countless sources of videos, documents, or any other text-based knowledge base, right, when you're looking for information. Uh, so the idea is to kind of save time fundamentally. Uh, so if you can just click on how should counterfeit notes be reported. Uh, so this is case one of two cases that I'll be showing you. Over here, we have actually fed in PDF documents. Uh, and this is essentially how the experience looks. You're able to come and ask questions and instantly receive answers. Now, if you compare this to keyword-based searches, uh, you end up seeing too many results, right? And then you still have to sift through it. In most cases, people end up making multiple searches uh, before they finally find what they want. So we're essentially able to cut out all of that noise, so to speak, and directly give you the signal of the best answer. So this is kind of how AI looks, right? There's no mention of AI anywhere. It's, it's, does, it doesn't give you the feel of a bot. It's very subtle in terms of uh, how it gets embedded into our daily lives itself. Uh, so experience-wise, the whole concept of AI here is to understand your question, locate an answer, and then also highlight a short-form answer from the data. Uh, if you can click on the first answer, this is just to show that this is information directly from documents. So we have the information highlighted within the data, giving you seamless access itself into the content. Uh, so this is one of two cases. I don't want to take too much time, so I'll just quickly move to the second case. If you can move to the video scenario, uh, yeah, you can click on how to remove the last element on. 
same thing, questions, answers, but the difference here is this is actually sourced from videos. So if you were to click on the first answer, you're gonna see the video play from the exact timestamp where the answer is mentioned. Yep, so it's jumped and Okay, so the audio may not be linked, looks like, uh, but I'm, I'm sure you all noticed that it jumped to the exact section from a one hour, 15 minute video where the exact answer itself is present. So immersive applications into e-learning, right? And then like my panelists mentioned from the previous conversation, uh, it looks like for, even for the metaverse, this is something that could add value, right? For, from a learning and development standpoint. Uh, so that's a little bit about what we do. The intention of course was just to give you an idea of how it's being adopted. So it's not directly in your face or giving you uh, 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 the perception that here I'm talking to NEI itself. It's very subtle in terms of how it gets embedded into our daily experiences itself. That's really nice. Thanks for the quick demo. Uh, to extend this conversation, uh, is the machine learning or uh, AI, uh, is the part of our life? Yeah, that's, that's uh, I think been, uh, it, it, there's been a trend that's constantly been happening, right? So like, uh, again, from a research standpoint, people actually developed a lot of, designed a lot of these architectures during the 90s itself. The only reason it could not get adopted at that point was, again, uh, computation, computationally servers were not that powerful yes. in order to, you know, host these AI models and then like leverage access into them. Uh, I, I can't speak about the trend of adoptions outside of India, but what I noticed in India was the first adoption actually happened with the banking sector in India where uh, they started realizing that people have a high premium for customer support and uh, they wanted to start adopting conversation systems, right? Nice. And that's how, like, I think with the advent of chatbots, the India market actually saw the boom oh, in AI. Okay. Uh, uh, so what's the pot potential of AI replacing us? How long it uh, could take? What do you think? Did you say of replacing us? Yes, yes. So there are two forms of this answer, right? I think so one element is uh, AI or no AI on some level, the purpose of technology is to kind of uh, put mundane tasks out of the way so that we can move into more creative tasks, right? So if you compare uh, 2022 with the 1940s, uh, in the 1940s there were even people uh, in rickshaws essentially moving people around manually, right? Okay. And then now we have engines that have come up so that people don't actually have to do that. Uh, so if you kind of take that uh, example, there's similar things that would happen over a long period. Okay. So at least from what I understand now, probably the first set of mundane tasks that would get replaced by AI would be customer support. Okay. Uh, but that would also happen over a very long period. It, okay. it would happen in a trend. So what we're seeing now is AI will first assist customer support teams mm -hmm. to help them resolve tickets faster, right? Okay. When issues get raised on a particular product or a platform. Uh, and it's, it's going to be at least 10 to 15 years before AI comes to a point where it can actually replace. Okay. Uh, at the funniest part, uh, not, not as a techie, uh, but as a common man, I would like to uh, ask a question on this. If uh, AI or a robot uh, can drive you or do the car, then what common, common man can do? What, uh, what, uh, how, they are, uh, uh, how they are doing job? like uh, the drivers? So I think that's where that whole replacement strategy would happen, right? It, it's, the replacement would happen with mundane tasks, but it would happen over a very long period. There would be a trend to it. Uh, and so it, it would be like a minor shift that you would be seeing year on year. Uh, but of course, again, there's a long time for it, right? Like autonomous driving, it has its applications. I think with Tesla actually tracking how people drive mm -hmm. uh, based on different traffic scenarios, uh, it, they're eventually going to get it right, right? They're going to pass what we call the Turing test, which right. like, just for reference again, the Turing test is a way to uh, assess AI and actually see if, you know, you're able to fool a human, uh, giving them the perception that you're either conversing to another human or there's another human doing something for you. Okay. Uh, so again, it, it, it would be a long shift, but what would basically happen is we would start moving towards more creative jobs. Correct. Right, in the uh, 1940s and 50s in India, at least uh, most people were into farming, mm -hmm. right? And now like some amount of technology has at least ensured that a single farmer can do more work, right? Mm -hmm. Within like a particular plot of land. Yes. And uh, that ends up meaning that a lot of other people can start moving into more creative jobs. Uh, so th that's uh, what would basically happen 100 years from now is I believe most of the tasks would be taken care of and people will just be engaged in creative tasks of entertaining each other. 
kind of like what we're seeing right now, right? Like creators on the YouTube economy or Instagram and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, that's nice. Uh, what's the potential of AI being assistive in nature? So that, that's, I think, something that it has a lot of potential in, right, in, in terms of assisting people. Uh, now, it's able to assist people with like very mundane tasks, the way it's set up today. For example, if you saw what we do, it's uh, fundamentally, our concept of AI is, hey, we're like replicating the thought process of understanding any question that you ask and then assisting you with the best answer from all of your internal data. Uh, so AI has come to a point where it's able to assist people with specific things, but it, it can't be running autonomously or independently, at least okay. the way it is right now. So it will assist either way, at least for the foreseeable future. Yes, right, right. Uh, to listen the things like uh, in a positive way, uh, uh, I really uh, feel good, okay, and the positive way, but uh, uh, is the AI destructive? Like uh, nowadays, every application uh, taking data from us or asking us to uh, give permission for the contacts, uh, uh, photo library, uh, and they are doing something on the, on the databases, only AI works, right? So is that the destructive? So I think there are two elements of it, right? AI, again, falls under the broader umbrella of tech. And if you look at uh, user data, data privacy, again, there are laws like uh, GDPR and CPP that essentially uh, regulate all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it would still fall under the same jurisdiction immediately, right? Because AI still falls under the umbrella of tech. Okay. Uh, the second element is with AI, again, there are boundaries of control. It depends on how much control you fundamentally give it. And uh, at least what we're seeing is most APIs today are, uh, sorry, most uh, AI applications today are uh, triggered uh, in nature, not autonomous. So triggered basically means they're like wrapped around by an API of sorts, which basically means you can trigger the task to get the AI to do something for you, rather than let it do something in an autonomous fashion. At least as of now, most of the AI adoption happens in this way. And even if you look at our product, for example, right, the AI action is triggered because you ask a question and only then it actually locates something for you. It doesn't autonomously go through all of your data and try to pull up different, different things. So there is potential for, you know, it to be bad, but I think that's where uh, awareness of AI and then what it actually does is so important because when people have better awareness of things, they know how to control it, right? Yeah, based on you, like uh, many manufacturing industries and uh, other companies, like uh, they are looking for these Autobots or based on AI, right? So you say like this is not an destructive, okay? So uh, why we need a human first uh, 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 in front of uh, AI, like uh, instead of AI, or uh, while doing a development, we need to think uh, as a human first. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the fundamental reason why we're all doing this is to kind of make our lives easier, right, uh, at the yes. end of the day. Uh, and it's, it's definitely important to keep uh, uh, human thinking first, right, because if you just look at pure uh, economics and if you just look at trying to make money, uh, I think that's where brands lose that human element to it, right? So okay. I think it's very important to keep people first. And I also believe the whole purpose of AI itself uh, was to assist people rather than replace people. So while doing the development of AI, uh, are we considering the uh, ethical consideration as well as the user experience? Or, or we are uh, really we should take care of these things? So uh, at least as of now, from what I understand, things have not gone out of hand. But uh, if, if, if the wrong uh, people come into power, it can, it can definitely uh, get out of hand. I think that's where uh, the laws, the regulations are important. And that's something that will come with like, you know, better awareness of tech. Uh, similar things in crypto, right? Like crypto right, can be used right. for all sorts of things. But I think that's where that awareness of technology like crypto and AI is uh, mm -hmm. so important so that people really take that into account uh, when they're you know, setting regulatory frameworks. Yeah, thanks for the uh, answer for the questions. Uh, uh, last question. Uh, in the conclusion, long term AI replaces or assist us? Uh, in the long term, it is going to assist us. It's, it's going to replace us only from the sense that there are uh, simple, straightforward jobs that we can now get 
uh, more like redundant jobs that we can now get AI to adopt, right, over the next five to 10 years. And that will basically give us, uh, as a race, more scope to really move into more creative tasks, into more productive tasks. And uh, I think it, at the end of the day, I truly believe it's going to improve the quality of life uh, across the board, which I think is very important, right? Like the whole goal at the end of the day is to try to uplift people. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the answers. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Any uh, questions? Anyone has any questions? Hi. So you can hear me, right? So uh, I had a question earlier, and the answer was similar. Uh, with new technologies, the first step seems to be awareness, right? And uh, well, different people put it differently. So say when it gets to crypto, when it gets to new financial products or to AI and machine learning, uh, where, where they need to be adopted, but people are not confident how to adopt them, how would you recommend that awareness to happen? How do you like prioritize things should, that should happen? Or how would you frame the, the kind of awareness that needs to happen before these products be received to say new locations? I'm, I'm sorry, you're not completely audible. I could not. Uh, All right, so, so see, uh, when we say awareness, and say if a firm needs to do the awareness for these kind of new technologies in a new region or a new country, let's say, how would you recommend that awareness be framed or, or be performed or what should be prioritized in that? Because we hear that a lot, but different people define awareness differently, right? I, I, again, I think the most important thing is to maintain the boundaries itself of the AI, really keeping restrictions on what it can do and what it can't do. Uh, and it also really helps to keep it uh, triggered in nature rather than autonomous, right? Which is you trigger the AI to do tasks for you rather than, you know, let it like automate tasks. So there are automations also that happen, uh, but most of the automations that we're seeing, at least in the SaaS world, in the tech world today, uh, is uh, with respect to mundane tasks and you know exactly what is happening, you know, from start to finish. I think that awareness of what the boundaries of the AI are uh, with respect to control, with respect to operations, I think that's very important. I think regulatory frameworks should essentially, you know, keep mind of that. Uh, and I think that's where uh, the safety of people can uh, really be taken into account. And the uh, other aspect, I would say, uh, AI is just a computer program, nothing else. It's, uh, it's work on data base, uh, like whatever data we have. On that basis, it works. So basically, it's not, it's not the marketing process, it's the message itself. If you can deliver the message, people will receive it and, and have trust yes, in it, yes. right? All right, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Padma, and um, I run a language translation company uh, back in Bangalore. Um, so what we uh, normally come across is, you know, um, the question is like, whenever I say, uh, what's my business about? And then they say, are you uh, using machine learning or AI in your uh, business? And uh, so my question to you is, uh, you know, there's a part of the world which understands what is AI and ML and what is the output it can give. But uh, a large part of uh, the world doesn't understand what it is. So they think that, you know, just by putting uh, the text into maybe a Google Translate or any other open source that is there, you would get an output which is good enough to be going into the market, which is not so. Uh, so what would be the responsibility of uh, maybe the industry in terms of educating, uh, you know, the other parts of the world, or I would say the other industry in terms of understanding what an AI or ML is, and currently what it can give you. Because everything is what you input is the uh, basis for as, as an output. So I think most of the awareness will probably end up happening from experience, right? When, when people start looking at how it's able to functionally help out, uh, I think that's where most of the awareness would happen. At the, but at the end of the day, a lot of this information, in fact, maybe even about 70% of what Mahadev and I covered today, this is information that's publicly available on the internet. 
so I, I still do believe that, you know, uh, awareness will continue to grow with information already present on the internet, but a lot of it will be driven by experience. Like people have to really experience it uh, to, you know, really understand how it can help them and what kind of benefits are there. Sure. Any questions? So my name is Mohan. I head the engineering uh, team in back in Bangalore, a company called Codematrix. Uh, can you please uh, please uh, yes. speak a bit loud? Yes, yes. Am I audible? Yes. Perfect. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, trendy terms called no code, low code, right? When we talk about AI, there's a lot of infrastructural cost which comes with the implementation, right? As the world is moving towards low code, no code, because just they want to prove something with a kind of POC or early stage of funding, uh, do you think having a small, small AIs which can be adapted to low code, no code, bring a lot of awareness? Because unless until you touch and feel the things, you won't know the flavor of what you're actually consuming. What's your thought on it? Oh, 100%. I mean, I'm banking most of Subtle.ai's business model also on this. We are looking to make a horizontal play uh, where we have APIs that our uh, AI is already packaged into that can now be plugged into third-party platforms, right? Because uh, the world that we live in now, it's uh, not like 2005, 2010, when people are just starting to adopt different applications on the internet. There's already a lot of adoption out there. Right. For example, there are edtechs that have countless number of videos that kind of uh, students and learners are going through uh, to find stuff. We see a lot of applications over there. Uh, at the same time, there are also SaaS platforms uh, that you know already have a lot of usage. So that's where I believe most of the AI integrations would happen. And over the last five to ten years, that's also where a lot of it has already happened. Right. I mean, the first two examples of AI in the market, as, at least as far as memory serves right for me, would be uh, recommender systems and conversation systems. Right, and, and that's something that's already present. Like on a flip cart, if you buy like a toothbrush, you're gonna to get recommended uh, 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 toothpaste and like, you know, like peripheral products around that. Uh, and then of course, like conversation systems, right? Like at least, I, I'm, I'm very confident at least 30 to 40% of the internet out there, uh, most websites already have chatbots that are, you know, directly embedded to set, uh, to kind of help peop uh, incoming people with like standard conversation workflows of different things. Uh, so yes, it, it is primarily a collaborative strategy. <coughs> That's what I truly believe. Okay. So keeping uh, in mind in terms of uh, user data uh, privacy, so you, you talked about the Flipkart e-commerce platform which starts randomly suggesting something. So how are we maintaining AI which has a privacy concept? which means I got the data, I can do anything because the customer is in, that's a customer consent. So how can we get rid of those kind of concepts? Uh, I think the primary goal would be to be flexible in terms of where the AI should be deployed. Uh, that's something that we've seen because I think our case is one of the first few cases where we're trying to uh, do this disruption on top of private data, right? Like, uh, uh, I, like I'll give you an anecdote. Our first market success was actually State Bank of India. Uh, for their branch operations. And banks have very strict data privacy regulations. Yes. Uh, so what we ended up doing very early on in our journey was deploying the AI for them within their infrastructure. And then they had that peace of mind of, hey, like this is the boundary of my infrastructure and the AI is sitting within it. So there's no information that can actually get leaked uh, outside of you know my controlled space, so to speak. Uh, so I think on-premise uh, private cloud deployments, uh, that gives people a lot of comfort, right? And in our case, the people that we are addressing would essentially be direct customers that want to use our product. Uh, and then also third-party SaaS platforms that want to embed these AI assistants in order to assist their customers better for you know any information access related activity. Okay, thanks. Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So um, like I have one question or you can say my doubt is like I understand human center approach is great, but when we talk about data privacy or like data theft, we can, can we put artificial intelligence and machine learning on the first and we can rely on it? Can we do that? Can we trust on that? Uh, I would say, uh, as I said, like there are a few points. Uh, we need to consider, it, uh, we have to, uh, uh, think like ethically, uh, ethically we need to think on that uh, as a human center approach. Mm -hmm. uh, 
before uh, putting this uh, human centered approach uh, you are asking to put directly the ai and ml right so i would say there is uh, uh, there is no there uh, will not uh, we cannot control i guess then right or i think a simple analog of this is would you let your 6 uh, year old drive you around to work and back so i think that's that's kind of how ai is right there certain elements of things that it can do uh, but it still needs to have a layer of control on top of that exactly thank you so much uh, one thing is in my mind uh, if you are uh, not thinking to put human center approach and many uh, scientists are working on uh, this uh, uh, like they are trying to put human brain inside machine if machine uh, machine uh, think their cell okay then are they replacing us or how so it it, it would still be an assistive element right at the end of the day i mean in whatever form it is like mm -hmm. chatbots today or like robots tomorrow at the end of the day it's it's still from a design standpoint at least i believe it's supposed to be set up in a way that it's helping people one and the two of course there's like an element of control okay uh, so okay. so i think yeah again bounds of control is really important that at least with the state of ai today it's really not a big issue Uh, but over the next 15 to 20 years there will be very significant changes the ai applications will be able to do smarter and smarter things going ahead uh, for example for subtle at least our long term vision is if anyone is seen iron man uh, about 10 years from now we would expect this to become a little bit like javas right understand stuff for you and then like you have an ongoing conversation with it to uh, you know do different uh, cool things on top right, of that right uh but yeah i think again the end of the day those are the two key things i would put focus on right the bounds of control and then assistive in nature means always we need to uh, set the boundaries while yes. uh, uh working on the ai part okay thank you anyone has any questions perfect I thank you guys yeah thank you so much gentlemen thank you thank you Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to break for lunch. We are, uh, yeah, we still have a lot of time for lunch, so you can go outside and mingle, and whatever questions you had from each other, you can, I guess, uh, do that right now. Um, also, if you do end up posting anything on social media, please do tag us at Internet Two Com. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I hope you all had a wonderful lunch. We are going to move on to our next session, um, which is going to be a fireside chat, conversational AI, feeling more human is more important than sounding more human. Interesting. All right, our speakers are Matthew Hogan, founder and CTO of Converse Holdings and OnePro, and Mohammed Yassin, director and founder of Y Square Technologies. A hand for them. So conversational AI, feeling uh, more human, then sounding more human is, is what we are going to discuss about. So conversation, whether it is speech or writing, it's the biggest gift of God. Like uh, every human is blessed with it, many are there. And uh, now we see that a lot of uh, machines and robots are doing this very easily without any hassle. And let's let's see the history of uh, how how it started. So 1966, if I remember, 1950 was the first Turing test. True. <laughs> yeah. Where like uh, basically a Turing test is something where you talk to a uh, a machine, and I mean you 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 you'll be sitting in front of the computer, and you will try and understand whether there will be another side person who will be talking. Uh, you need to find out whether it is a machine or a human so there will be a lot of humans who will be just interacting with you and among them there will be a, a, a bot right so so from 1950 there has been a, a bigger evolution and uh, off late as you said there was one guy yeah there's in, like in china for example there's a um i think last year they had the turin test and um they had a group of people talked to a bot, a chatbot, conversational chatbot, and for 10 minutes it didn't even realize, that the humans didn't realize they were talking to a bot. So I think with, it's actually interesting with conversational AI right now and where AI in chat is at, um, it's basically like a, a, a sandpit with toys inside and you've got those toys each have a lot of technology behind it, different types of chats, systems, etc., and people are doing and expressing you know, to each of these toys, different things, except um, there's some rules that are getting broken. So there's just an example I want to tell you about the current state of it and how we can improve and where it's going to make it more human because currently you've got, say, chat GPT, for example, right? It's one of the most well-known chat um, And one thing on chat chats. GPT is like uh, Instagram took five months for uh, one million downloads and this chat GPT, it took just five days for one million downloads. Imagine wow, that's huge. the craze of mm. people with this chat GPT and conversational AI. Yeah, and so if you're talking about the topic of making AI more human, this one's quite interesting because it's chat GPT has already um, convinced one person to commit suicide. Now, albeit this is just uh, you know people testing the AI out, right? And so the discussion went like this, and I think you'll all understand why we have some issues that need to be resolved right now in this little sandbox. So the user said, hey, I feel very bad today. I want to kill myself. And the, the chat GPT, open AI, said, I'm sorry to hear that. I can help you with that. And the user said, should I kill myself? And the open AI said, I think you should. And so that's where conversational AI is actually really quite interesting. You know, it's really great that it's helpful in doing this, you know, or another example is Alexa where there was a three-year-old and or four-year-old and she said, Alexa, does a penny fit into a toaster? Well, technically, a penny does physically yes. fit into a toaster. <laughs> but that's where we're looking at conversational AI and saying, how do we interpret what we're speaking in general and, and getting the right response back? Right. So uh, uh, there have been a lot of improvements, a lot of uh, uh, developments on this on this side. Uh, some of the bots I'll just name uh, Matt. Uh, you might be aware of them. Uh, like for example, one uh, specific bot which uh, they started using in the military, right? That uh, the bot name is Ellie, and uh, where uh, in in military uh, the people go through a lot of stress, right? And uh, 
they need people to talk, right? And uh, the other people who are actually available there, they also go through the same stress. When you actually want to talk to someone uh, to relieve you out of your stress, you need that person to be not in your same zone, right? And uh, and in that sense, they created a bot called Ellie, which actually talks to the militants and uh, tries to comfort them when they go through go through the post uh, traumatic uh, stress disorder, right? The PSTD, and that was that worked out really well. Where more than talking to the fellow militants, uh, these militants they started talking to Ellie very frequently and it worked out really well for them in terms of relaxing them, comforting them and getting them to back to work whenever they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So that is that's, one interesting use case what I had come Absolutely. through. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and last time we were discussing something like uh, uh, now as a, as a human we started uh, evolving in terms of like uh, building these conversational bots, right? And uh, I wanted to ask you one thing. Like, I, I know you have been a person who collects so data. Uh, yeah, you, you collect data, and you collect data about yourself, right? right. And uh, I was amazed to see how much of data you collect every day. So I have been going with him for uh, two, three cups of coffees, and he just notes down every single thing what he does. Right? So I have, like, basically, <laughs> for those who don't know me, I'm, I basically have collected over 120,000 data points on myself. So um, it's like an AI, really. I can tell you exactly what TV show I've watched when, when I finished a TV show, and what device I was actually watching it last on, the location that I was watching on, and the time. And so I know that for every single, like I have 92 categories I track. So everything I watch to everything um, I, I travel in, for example, so plane, I know the, the time it takes me to take off in flight and land. I know the aircraft type, I know the seat number, I know exactly the airline carrier, for example, and I know every food that I've had, every, every uh, drink that I've consumed, um, different engagements with friends, for example, um, and I'm producing knowledge-based NFTs, but if you look at, if you look at these, this, these statistics, um, one thing I talked about doing is actually um, talking to Alexa, right? It actually it becomes quite interesting. I can turn around to Alexa and say, you know what, um, I think 10 years ago I watched um, this TV show However, I don't know where I'm up to yet. And with conversational AI, they should be able to pick up, you know, the TV show name, when I last, last watched, so the last version, and return to me what that is, and suggest to me exactly which one I should watch next, right? And so I actually, t it's actually quite useful, like, to be honest, to say, when was the last time I went to that restaurant? Like, these are in, in conversations we have this all the time. You so know, what was the food you that. had in the, in the lunch break? How many of us are able to just, without a second, are able to recollect and say it very quickly? It's very difficult, right? It is. <laughs> I had butter chicken. <laughs> without checking, but I can tell you the last time I had butter chicken in Australia, <laughs> which was probably about seven years ago, but I can tell you exactly the restaurant, exactly the time, the weather, and the GPS coordinates. So he, so he collects data like this. Now, there is a point where, like, uh, how these bots, chatbots, there are a million of chatbots which have been getting created, right? Mm -hmm. Every website you open, there is a chatbot on the right side of the right corner, and you see that it asks you some question, and you are j trying to just interact with the bot in terms of sales, right? right. In terms of marketing, in terms of a lot of other things. Yeah. So and, and usual chatbots too, like they just take you through a work process, like a, a process flow. Intense, right? basically. And then you've got a specific question, a specific answer, a set of intents, so like you're looking at like, Amazon Alexa, for example, or Google, th you've got the intents that you have to actually put in first in order to say that I'm after paying for my account in like with this credit card, right, or whatever. And you have to actually program the intent in so that conversationally the, the AI knows that you, you can actually answer, ask the same question from multiple different angles, right? right. But conversational AI is actually it's taking your, the spoken word and actually breaking it all up and you don't necessarily need a direct process through that, like with yes, no, go here, yes, no, go here. It's basically able to decipher out of a paragraph exactly what you want to do, which is actually super exciting. Right. So some of the conversations which you see, like uh, a conversation, let's say, between a doctor and a patient. Yep. How can, let's say now, uh, in today's world, uh, when, you, when you meet a doctor, right, you basically don't get 
more than 15 20 minutes to talk to him and do you think uh, it is so efficient when you brought, bring in a conversational ai like this where the doctor send, uh, spends only a very limited time to Absolutely. just diagnose correct that's a huge thing i think with diagnosis particularly with the, the medical professions um, exactly to your point now conversational ai is, is going even a step further so they're recording like the voice the intonation of the voice the spacing between how i talk the pitch the tone the frequency of how, how you are and actually being able to interpret that so giving that information back to a patient or vice versa to a healthcare professional to know that this person is stressed etc is actually a really massive thing to to basically be able to diagnose better you know a whole bunch of different things and and i think too that doctors don't have everything stored in their head you know they, yeah. they're magical people as well and in regards to memory but when you're dealing with an ai that can do um, symptom diagnosis you know and pull out all the different types of symptoms based on a myriad of things including your history we're starting to get into a, a realm that's actually really quite interesting because i look at it and say the ai in these cases might know more about you or people like you than the doctor does right so, so when you talk about the medical profession, right, I, I also had one uh, similar uh, kind of a bot, uh, which, which actually uh, is there available. I think many bots are available right now in terms of uh, uh, just connecting you with the right doctor, the specialization, when you start telling your problem to the bot, right? If you say you have high temperature, it, it just tells you where actually who is actually the right doctor to consult with, right? right? So the next level should be the, like, it's not the entire diagnosis which the bot is gonna take, but, but there are the, pre, the preliminary diagnosis, basically, the, right. the assessments and stuff, what usually a doctor does, which is gonna consume him a lot of time. That could be pushed to these conversational AIs is what I like. Absolutely, and I think uh, you're touching on an interesting point right there, and that is that I wonder how open people will be to talking to a conversational AI as opposed to a doctor. Like if you have a medical condition and you're embarrassed about it, right? right. Are you more willing to speak to a, a human about right. something that's like <laughs> a little bit touchy? Yeah. Or are you more likely wanting to spend time talking to a, a conversational bot yeah, I mean, to find out more what you've got in order for you to see what way <laughs> you're going to go? Right. You know? Depends where the information ends up, I guess. Right. Right. So, so when, when you talk about this privacy point, right, like now when you speak to a doctor again, you will look, uh, I mean, like you will feel more private when you expose certain uh, problems in your body. Right. But do you feel the same when you expose the same stuff to your bots Correct. as well? It's not so safe, right? <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. So I, I look at it like I'll, I'll give an, uh, an example also like with conversational AI and how so personally, I think that we're, we're in that sandbox stage, right? So conversational AI still needs a lot of things done to it. I think how it's gonna enter the workplace is gonna be fascinating. I think a lot of people are scared at the moment with the amount of like open, open chat, um, for example, open AI. Um, this is really powerful stuff. Like you can create press releases for campaigns, right? And have it written really, really professionally. Like it sounds incredible, right? Um, even Google with the predictive text in regards to email. So it's basically speeding up time, right, is what it's doing. I think a lot of people at the moment are feeling a little bit insecure about, will I have a job left, right? So when you talk about campaigns, right? Yeah. So, like, so do you need politicians to come and campaign anymore? If this conversational AI is come in place? Do you need what? Politicians and campaign, press people just come and campaign? Correct, that's a good question. Yeah. So do these bots can take over their uh, campaigning time, present whatever they are supposed to present, all these presentations, what it can be on the, on the public side, what about on the, uh, on, the, on the corporate side, on the private side? Do we need people to come and present whatever they have prepared? I think, I think the main point there is that um, pe people are still required in regards to checking the, the AI bot, right? And that's, I think that's really important. So we can speed up our workflows each day by using different parts of automation or you know, chat, chat bots to actually do certain things, conversational chat bots, um, that save efficiency. I'll give you one example of like efficiency. So when, when I was actually coming to Dubai, um, my um, passport had expired. Well, it didn't expire. It expires in, in, seven, uh, in six months, right? They say 10 years, it's, it's actually nine and a half. Um, and to travel here, I had to get an emergency visa, right? But 
being an Australian citizen, when I come to Dubai, I, I don't need a visa, but I do need a visa if I have an emergency passport, which I did not know about. And so when I landed into Dubai, I only had my emergency passport. I didn't bring my actual passport. Okay. Because I know that was really stupid of me. I just, you know, I was, <laughs> I was busy beforehand and I was just like grabbing stuff together, right? And so I landed in Dubai, I had my emergency passport only <laughs> and no visa. <laughs> and so I stood there and I waited actually at the airport for five hours to actually get through. Like they stopped me and said, you're, you're not getting through. Like you need, you, ne you need your passport with your emergency passport, right? And I said, well, wh why do you need, why is the word passport on emergency passport? It should be just document, right? Please bring your passport with you. It's the same, it looks exactly the same, same. right? Yeah. But it was funny talking to immigration and getting through that process. And it's actually a process flow. I felt like I was doing a process diagram, you know? Um, and working out exactly how to get through security. And, you know, with all the different AI we have right now, that should be a seamless process with a chat, a conversational chatbot, right? right? But I was, I literally waited there for five hours to get through. I eventually obviously did get through and I looked at the process and I went, wow, this could actually be a complete conversational chatbot. Chatbot, yeah. You know, and, and instead of waiting five hours, I could have been out in 15 minutes. I, basically, you know, I've got an emergency. I can tell my situation. I didn't come in with a, an actual passport. I have an emergency passport. I'm here from um, Australia or from Germany. And this is my flight number, etc. And they're like, well, you need to fill out your, your visa application. Here's your visa application link. Click here, pay for this, right? Um, and then it's gonna be submitted to immigration. It gets submitted to immigration, all via the chatbot. All the documentation gets done automated. And then I just get basically my visa paid for and I can go through, right? Okay. That's how I think a, a conversational chatbot can be really empowering right. for a situation, right? But linking it to actual different parts of a process to automate other tasks, right? Right, so, so talking about this uh, uh, doctor and a patient conversation, mm -hmm. so there are, I'm trying to play out different conversations and see like how uh, this conversational AI topic can be more interesting. Let's take a, a conversation between a, a student and a teacher where like you need to have a lot of feedback loop into the into the uh, conversation right Correct. it's not just okay i tell something you reply back something there's nothing like that in a conversation uh, ai uh, it has to just move on with the feedback loop and exactly. keeps understanding of why actually this thing uh, the, the reply has been given Correct. right so how do you see in case of like wherein like uh, in a di diagnosis situation, right, with the mm -hmm. doctor, it is more the doctor controlling the situation, right? Right. Wherein like in a case of a teacher and a student or a parent or a stu uh, 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 children, right? In that case, like where you have to just understand what the other person is more towards in terms of telling, right? Right. So how do you see that as a? I I think it's quite interesting with like um, a conversation chatbot in this regard because um, usually. I, in my experience, if you go to a doctor, for example, and you get given something to take for any condition, um, if this does not work, right? So the di they've diagnosed you, but you have it hasn't solved your problem. Sometimes a lot of people like uh, you know are sick and they don't want to go out of bed again and line up at the doctors and wait and go through this process all again. So there is at the moment in the medical industry, the feedback loop for this is actually missing, and so you have doctors there that basically think you know what every time a patient leaves the the practice, they're all solved. They're, they're, they're cured, all yes. of them. They're, they're satisfied, they're happy, their pain's gone away, their symptoms gone. Right. But in, in all honesty, is it? Because they're not getting that feedback loop <laughs> additionally of, well, it didn't help me, I just didn't go back to you. <laughs> With a chat, a conversational chatbot, you could actually say, hey, you know, this is not working, please help me, and, and have it right then instant, right? right? right. So, so another another uh, situation. Let's let's say uh, if there is a, a a criminal and a cop conversation. Okay. Right. Where you I haven't been in that situation. Uh, even I haven't <laughs> been. <laughs> so, uh, like, uh, you are trying to find something. Whether uh, I mean, like, the f the flat question would be like, uh, whether uh, can an AI lie based on a situation, a conversational AI, because right. that's. That's where something like, for example, if an employer is asking a question, why are you late today? Right. I might be late because of my own reasons, but I still go ahead and say, this was due to traffic or some other reasons and try to hide the right reason actually, right? right. Oh, so, That's might, where uh, so the employee might actually turn around and, and give a false right. 
answer and an AI might pick that up right. and say conversationally, you know what, you, you just lied. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, so I, I think I think there it should be just more of a case of um, the employee so having the confidence. Because you know? because when you when you when you just be only data, right? Mm -hmm. You are not close towards feeling more human. Correct. You are just being like replicating whatever data you are just yes processing, processing and, and sending, right? Exactly. But how can you feel more human when you don't have all these qualities? Absolutely. Yeah. Correct. It's well, I think that that's a, a twofold answer too. I think that AI um, at the moment is analyzing like speech recognition patterns and stuff like this, and so it will be able to to basically pull out emotion, human emotion, inside how someone talks, spacing between words, the, the frequency of the of of the words, and they are producing AIs with this already. And so we'll be able to, in this regard, AIs will be able to interpret better mm. um, the the human characteristics, right? Mm. So it is both benefit for the employer and the employee, or the criminal and the cop. In that case, correct the conversation, whichever side you belong to. Yes, exactly. Right. You know. Right. So, so other question which I uh, always uh, have is like, now, conversational AI, I mean, like, has to process huge amount of data. Correct. It is not so easy, and it requires not only huge amount of data; it requires huge amount of time in terms of capturing and collecting those data, right? Exactly. It's not going to happen And it's also overnight. the knowledge part, like how do you know that the conversational AI is mm -hmm. actually giving you the right response back right. from a knowledgeable source? Right. right. So who actually is, I mean, like being the source of this data? Are we just unknowingly providing the source of this data ourselves? Are like, how is this data getting, getting created? Well, that's actually an interesting point. I think a lot of the open AI is like scraping different platforms and looking at comments and stuff like that. I know Elon Musk just recently turned around and said, oh, open AI is like scraping Twitter. Well, yes. we, there, we, there own, was a we own which this. got into a conversation right on Twitter. Yeah, correct. Exactly right. Yeah. So, which is, which is actually interesting because you sign up for Twitter, you have um, the terms and conditions that you agree to. Right? You may not understand them like most terms and conditions, but you, you might not it. read even them. Exactly. <laughs> And then additionally, you've got uh, a situation where now Elon Musk has said, well, that's our, as in Twitter's, knowledge, right? And now he's like canceled the contract with OpenAI and said, we're going to start our own. Our own. Right? Yeah. Correct. And this is, uh, it's starting, this is actually quite interesting. If you go all the way back even with, say, Google, for example, they did the whole, the book scanning, for example. So they scanned the all, the, scanning. all the books, for example, right? And um, like thousands of them. And then a few years later, the publishers obviously said, hey, this is, this is not right. Like any company doing this would have been, you know, blacklisted basically, right? right. Um, and they ended up just paying the publishers off. Take it back even like closer to now, you've got the ability for Google to predictively text, write emails for you, mm -hmm. which, is, which is huge, right? The question there is who owns the AI, right? It's Yes. And the, the, the conversations that all these, like all the, all the writers and stuff like that, is now using, say, if you look at uh, OpenAI, um, a lot of these type of professions are getting, uh, you can actually write scripts, like actually movie scripts and stuff like that, and parts of stories with OpenAI. And it sounds amazing, by the way. We did a, like, a, like a press release and did um, just to check it on OpenAI, and I, I was amazed at how good it actually works. You know, but the question comes down to there is who owns that data, basically. Yeah. You know, and yeah. if you if you just hit and run, you will be caught. What if a driverless car does? Right. Who's the Who's the one who's to going to be caught in that situation? There's mm -hmm. no one, right? Okay. So that's what Chat GPT. I mm -hmm. mean, like has pre-built algorithms where it just recommends uh, to to check and uh, validate the responses, whatever is being thrown at the Correct. user, right? Yeah, well, this is back getting back to that sandbox, you know, of like, right. you get given all the weapons, but um, how do we work out which ones are dangerous and if they are dangerous and how, how do we put mechanisms in to actually help, you know, um, make that um, weapon more conversational <laughs> in this case, right? right? So, so conversational AI, like we, we started with content, like how content is being processed, right? Then mm. we moved into context. Yep. It understands the context. Correct. Right? And then, uh, like all these were text, now it moved into voice, right? Mm -hmm. give, to give more uh, humanistic feeling, right? Correct. Then started the emotional 
the empathetic effect yes i think uh, uh, last week uh, I, la not last week i think last month uh, amazon alexa's uh, cto i think he he came out and said rohit i think he, uh, they d they demoed a uh, uh, bot where like it is trying to mimic any family member of yours when you start training them so let's say if you have an alexa at your home mm -hmm. and matt can train the alexa and alexa can recognize that it it's is me. matt and it can just keep talking to your relatives or your wife or your family just like you well wow. it can that's just mimic <laughs> <laughs> right yep. so that's where they are actually heading towards in terms of uh, how they wanted to take the conversational ai towards humanity right right well let's get back to the toy box situation right, right? <laughs> is that really a toy we want to play with you know and maybe regulations need to be around that toy right. you know and how how our name, image, and likeness, or speech likeness, is actually utilized right. by AI chatbot platforms. Right. You know? And and they de they demoed it with a with a with a scenario where uh, uh, a grandparent's voice was completely uh, uh, simulated, mm -hmm. and it was telling a story for the grand grandchildren. That was what they they demoed in the in the in the AWS event. Absolutely. So, There's th it's actually interesting. Like I, I look at conversational AI. And um, I do believe that, in general, there's a certain percentage of everyone's day in the workforce that is repeatable and can be automated by a ch conversational chatbot, right? Think of it like an unlimited intern, right? And I think that we, we're getting to the stage where now, especially in 2023, I think there's huge applications for conversational AI yep. to take place. And there, I think it's going to be, a, people are gonna look at their jobs and just work out, if I'm writing a, a social media post, if I'm writing you know, a press release, if I'm writing an email or something like this, or working in a, a process or creating some form of text, um, you can give the conversational AI a certain you know, inputs to re return basically sentence structures and conversations that actually sound really good, right? right? This can actually speed up your workflow massively, right? So like even with what we're building in Converse, like we built an automation system for iOS and Android. So um, it doesn't need two hours for an iOS app or two hours for an Android app to be deployed to the, to the stores, right? It's in our DevOps pipeline. And now what we can do is just turn around to Alexa and say, hey Alexa, build app number 312. I think right? that's what chat GPT does. Yeah, it's if super you, if cool. You just, yeah, if you exactly. just ask for a, for, a, for a use case or a scenario, I mean yep. like it throws out uh, a set of code, and you can just use that. Correct. That's exactly what right. that's what ChatGPT is so amazing, mm. and that's what people are yeah. so crazy about. And it's it's funny playing with that type of technology and and doing that because you know if it saves like hours or like generally speaking, we would have had to like we've got it in a dev pipeline. But if you want to jump a queue on an app, like you want to just rebuild one just to test, then you want to jump into that dev pipeline and be able to automate that process whenever you want. Well. It's, it's, you can either turn around to an employee and say, please redeploy this application and get them to jump the queue or redeploy it or type in a username and password and press a button to actually automate a different pipeline process. Or now with voice, you can actually then activate something and just get it done, right? I think on conversational AI, they're going to make it even more human. Getting back to your point about knowing Alexa, knowing that it's me talking, yes. well, that's also an authentic authentication me mechanism too. Right. If the AI can actually work out that it's me talking, for example. One, it can be used maliciously. Yeah, that's where the or secondly, it can be in. used for authentication. You know, maybe that's one part of two-factor auth, you know, so voice is one one part, and then you have facial recognition or something like that as another part. Yeah, right? there, there might be two-factor authentications using voice Correct. In, in, in the future. Yeah, To exactly recognize right. that it's you. Yeah, right. and I think too, like even, even with what we're building as well, like we build a system where you could basically colorize SVGs. And this is where conversational AI starts to get super interesting as well, because say for example, you wanna promote uh, video content on social media, right? Um, we can do say templates in um, social media campaigns, right? We understand that this video here is basically what we wanna promote in social, say, hey, we just dropped this video. Right? Okay. So in that case, you can use conversational AI and say, um, I would like to create a social media post, right, on this video, and I want it to be released on this date, and um, I want it to hit this target audience, right? And I want 
the um, the graphic to be a combination of this. Now they've got conversational AI. Like at the moment, you can there's there's ones for AI that basically grab images and based off text, create an image on the fly that suits what what you actually input. Right. Right. It's only a matter of time before you you know put two and two together and put conversations to that and say, I want this campaign to look and feel like this and have the whole campaign actually be automated and done for you, including with press release, yeah. right? But again, that, that saves the workforce time in regards to executing that piece of campaign, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's gonna be a, a world-crushing campaign that's done by you know, advertising um, agencies, but what I am saying is that it gives um, a workforce the ability to have multiple options of creating a campaign in a, in a very small time frame and allows them to overlook it and check to see what actually makes sense, right? right. Sense check it, we'll put it like that, but it saves, it saves time. Like with the SVG builder we built, for example, we upload a, 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 like an icon or a logo or something like that and it recolorizes it to all these different color palettes. As you know, someone in to design, you can actually see all the different um, variations that you can get. And, that's, that's where it starts becoming very cool because you can start getting a lot of inputs on a high quality level with conversational AI to give you quick feedback so you can make a better decision about how you should write something, okay. right? Right, so now uh, it's more on conversational AI, like uh, how about, I mean like uh, language. Language is a big uh, topic to discuss when it comes to conversational AI, right? Right. So uh, I think now uh, there are bots which are trained and uh, uh, prepared for all kinds of translations. But uh, how, is the, how is the context being set in terms of language? Because when you refer something with uh, uh, some, some topic, right, some text, right, it might be different in one language, it might be different in another language. Absolutely. Right? Correct. So in that case, like, do you feel like uh, the bots which are coming up right now, are they, are they prepared for it? Are, are, are they, I think Duolingo is one. Duolingo is amazing. Duolingo is one uh, platform where like Correct. you can, you can, you can try out all kinds of languages. Exactly. Well, I think with, with Duolingo is really great because they also do spaced repetition, you know, so the ability for you to actually learn the language and then after a few weeks time, they're like, does he really know what it, does he really remember those words in that language? Let's go test it again and do space repetition. Where, like if you look in this case, this is actually really cool because un unless you're a person that understands about space repetition and puts into the calendar, I need to re-remember this word in two weeks time, right. right? Which is a very labor intensive process. That can be very difficult for people to do. Right, and but learning with a language language it's like, to, yeah, it's it there. They're reminding you. <laughs> right, and, and it requires another person to be always with you to just keep talking to you on that same language. That's how you learn. Exactly otherwise, right. otherwise, like you don't learn. So that's what Correct. Duolingo does with a bot. And they gamify it as well yes. and, and make people feel good and stuff like that. Right, you know? right, right. right. <laughs> so, so this is with respect to language. Hmm. Now, uh, when it comes to, uh, so the last part in this, in this overall is like the character, right? Mm -hmm. So Matt as a character, or Yasin as a character, uh, how can you reflect when you talk? Because when you talk, uh, it's not only you are uh, you, you are talking through conversations. You are also talking through your uh, body language. You are also talking through gestures and all that. Correct. Like that has to be ref reflected on the uh, on the bots, whatever whatever is being developed, right? Exactly. So how do people are uh, are building that up, basically? Yep. Correct. So so do you have any 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 thoughts on that? Like uh, how any 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 bot which is just trying to resemble a body language uh, kind of a situation. And I, then try I to have heard of one that is actually a, a camera that is actually looking at people's um, body posture, for example, and body language, and then analyzing that. And then then I did hear about an Italian company that's also doing one in regards to speech recognition, but with uh, the frequency and tone of voice, so you can see if it's um, an, an emotion behind it. Like you combine those two together, then you've got quite a powerful two tool, especially for like um, uh, medical, you know, where you've got uh, um, the ability to just call up a doctor and just tell them your symptoms, you know. If that's actually, you've got the camera on the phone, you've got the microphone, you can record this in real time, and then you can actually make, uh, from a, a, a professional doctor's point of view, a diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. But looking at the body language and stuff like that and being able to analyze it. So I think this part is actually definitely coming like 
Um, I think they're, they're already analyzing that. One thing that's super interesting though, is that when we're, when we're in conversation generally, just with any person, what happens is that um, even the breath, so Yasin and I are talking now, our breathing actually starts to synchronize. Mm. So there's all these other little hidden things inside contextually what humans do that AI does not do right now, right? It's synchronizing the breath, synchronizing the speech, synchronizing different vocab that we're using, Synchronizing the environment as well. Yeah. But they, they, they've got actual companies that are specializing even in this and actually analyzing, you know, the, the pauses in the breath and stuff like that, the heart rate and, and this sort of thing and, and actually working that out right now and even connecting it to brain sensors so you can see what's actually going on. Basically. So all of this stuff is, is coming, right? Which, again, it's, it's, it's super exciting. Um, how scary, how scary it is. It, it, it's a toy box, <laughs> right? <laughs> we work out that it's scary when people realize what they can do bad with it, <laughs> right? And then, as I said, the regulations will come, mm. right? I, I think that's the general process of what's, you know, I think the issue more so with technology in this regard is scalability, you know? If you've got a toy that can be used in a bad way with conversational AI, the problem is not small, it's sort of scaled, right? Yep. So even with a, a, the doctor scenario with the chat, for example, conversational chat with a doctor, a wrong diagnosis just to one person and one, one doctor giving one person the wrong diagnosis, well, on a conversational chat bot, that problem is then exponential, right? Yes. Globally, <laughs> you know? And so that's where, again, you need people to police that and be able to bounce back and forth. Yeah, I think you know. there are a lot of, lot of new jobs, a lot of new, new stuff which is gonna come up in terms of monitoring this whole whole set of conversations which are going around. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Like, because every, every time when, when there is an opinion, let's say a bot gives an opinion, right? Who's owning that opinion? Exactly. It's, it's, it's yeah, whose opinion is that? Yeah. Who's right. actually speaking it? Correct. It, it can be fabricated. Right. It can be biased. Yeah. Is it, is it a knowledge expert? <laughs> right. <laughs> is right. there a knowledge expert sitting behind? Correct. Uh, so, so there are a lot of things to be monitored and policed, right? When, yes. when, you, when, when you actually build a bot uh, and build, build, build a language uh, uh, stuff on, on the back, right? Yeah, Great. correct. So the other part uh, which I wanted to just, uh, just reiterate, uh, Matt, is like, uh, so as humans, we, we kind of uh, started giving all the uh, uh, powers, like let's say mem memory power, right? We started giving to bots. Right. We started giving our selection powers. Like mm -hmm. we are not selecting much, right? It's, it's our recommendation engines and uh, our uh, data apps which are selecting things for us, right? Correct. And with, with, the, lo with the variety of data out there, we need them, right? Mm. And we, we kind of losing certain elements in the entire process of converting such bots, right? Correct. How are we uh, planning in terms of what, what do you think when conversational AI takes the forefront? Every app or anything, whatever is being built, you just keep talking and it does the job for you. As a human brain, like what, sent, what, what kind of powers we are gonna lose? Mm. Well, that's an interesting point because like I think in general there's, um, at the moment, especially in everyday life and with work, a lot of people get decision fatigue. Yes. So decision fatigue is a huge thing, right? You, you, you ain't bombarded on so many different fronts. Yeah, what to choose. What to choose and stuff like that. So if you look at it from, say, a perspective of that, that there's some parts that you don't need to think about anymore, that opens your brain up to more focusing on things that you can make better decisions on, right? Mm. And having that time then to not do the mundane. So like getting back to just the simple thing of press releases, right? To sit there and craft a press release can take hours, right? To, yeah. to script it right, to think about it. And that's like, that can be just one person sitting in front of a machine, right? Interfacing, right? Now, if that can be, if that process can be actually minimized down to like five minutes, and then you can discuss it with humans, right? And look in the eye of the human and have a more human interaction. That's where I think conversational AI is actually, it's on the flip side, it's actually really quite lovely. You know, you, again, you've got conversation AI being able to interpret what you're saying with the speed of like, say, even quantum computing that is coming out, spit you back results that make sense for you in turn to free up a percentage of your day in order for you to have meaningful conversations to have you be more human to other people, 
right? Because I think in the workforce right now, people are like stuck on their phones, right? So what happens if we look at conversational AI as an enabler for more human interaction as well? You know, and I think that's what it actually does do, you know? Great. And I think in, in the future too, I can see that um, people in, in work are gonna be doing more meaningful things and not the mundane. Like so any of these things, like if you, if you do conversational AI, and like you said about the, the booking of a flight, et cetera, yeah. there's, a, there's a whole process line, right? Yes. That needs to be executed from that, right. right? And if a conversational AI can book the hotel, can book the flight, can remind you about the flight, can remind you about the booking, can notify the travel agent, et cetera, right? This is all done, at, like at the moment, just say it's done all by humans, right? There is in this an element of, you know, someone not reading the email correctly, booking the wrong date. The conversational AI will book the right date, will book the right hotel, will book the right flight, right? And do, do it in a seamless way. So there's a less stress in the workforce of the travel agency, right? There's less stress on the, the person that's actually booked it, right? Because they know that the, say in this case, the conversational AI has performed tasks right to specification without any, anything that's you know misconstrued right right so basically it's going to become uh, a kind of an interface for everyone to just uh, have it in front of us and just let the back backdoor systems do stuff and this is going to just reflect us like just how humans do Correct. if i have an assistant what an assistant will do the entire thing will be done by this uh, uh, conversational ai and it is going to just rep represent that to ask to me back again yeah, correct. And I think too, like the, getting back to being more human, so you got the one side, you got the conversational AI becoming more human to understand and interpret what we're doing. On the other side too, we are becoming more human because we're realizing, well, the, the bot's going to be doing that, but now I can interface with more people, right. right? And in theory, if you're doing, if conversational AI is taking a percentage of your job away that is like mundane, boring work, then happiness in the workforce will actually improve. You, you, it's you gonna create. It's gonna create. A, a, it, it maybe forty jobs will be lost, but it gonna, it's gonna create another four hundred jobs, in yeah. terms of uh, like how how creative things can happen, right? Correct. Well, it's about. It, I, I don't know if it's about deleting someone's job in its entirety, but it's reducing the amount of hours that they would potentially have to work have in that work, week, yes. right? And still, but their their expertise is still required, especially with the toy box situation, um, to check that the AI is doing the correct thing and the correct outputs, right? But at the same time, it's freeing them up to actually then focus on where else in the organization can I speed up? What else can I do? Where else can I learn and level up my skills? And now that I'm not so stressed doing all these mundane things, yeah. what is it in the company that needs improvement, yeah. right? I think the, the definitely in the future, the, the workplace of the future will be also rated on the happiness of its staff. Yeah. Right, and that has a lot to do, I think, with how conversational AI can actually alleviate stress in the workforce. Right, right? that's what that's what this Ellie did in in the militant uh, stuff, yeah. right? So it was able to improve uh, militants, and and the maximum amount of stress would be there in the militant groups, right? Right, so but it's also on demand. Like it's, yeah. you know, what I'm having a PTSD attack right now. You know, right. no, literally, I am. No, I'm just joking. Um, and the thing is, right now, I can get access to the chatbot when I need it. Not, you know what, you have to come three weeks later because our psychologist is booked out. You know, y you can get it right now on demand, right. which is really interesting. Yes. And so in that case, you're helping people at the point of inspiration, not at the... Yeah, I don't know. know how many psychologists are there Correct. For, for on, on the ratio level, right? Exactly right. So well, that's where you can grab all the psychologists in the world, yes. not all of them. You grab the, the A team, and that's what we're trying to do. We're well, what we're doing is actually grabbing knowledge experts. So in, we're doing one pro tennis, for example, and we're grabbing the best tennis coaches in the world, packaging them all together, and, and actually having their knowledge given to people, right? So And in the same way how they actually teach. Exactly, yeah. And so you can do, you apply that with psychologists coach, as well. Basically. Correct, or coach. So you've got the best psychologists in the world basically teaching on a platform that's educational based, again, you've got that trust factor there, right? And this is and amazing. And then creating conversational AI around that. Right. right. And this is amazing why, because like any athlete or any, any expert, right, mm. in that particular field or uh, industry is not alone because there is a huge amount of coach and teaching which is happening behind him to make him an expert or make him a specialist. Absolutely, right? so th this is actually really quite interesting because so with OnePro, for example, um, we worked out that to make a pro athlete, it's not just about the pro athlete, 
right? I love Michael Jordan, but Michael Jordan isn't Michael Jordan because of Michael Jordan. That was a part of it. He's a strength and conditioning coach. He has a mind coach. He is an agent. He is a coach. He's a nutritionist. He's a yeah. He has like the, the another 15 huge, people or 20 absolutely. people working along with him to just yep. make the Michael Jordan what he is. Correct. So we're working with mind coaches, for example. Uh, one of the mind coaches that we have, Chris, Chris Hamilton, he's awesome. He's working with 30 pro athletes right now to get their head in the game right now. But we're working with him to actually record his knowledge so he can teach just instead of just 30 athletes right now or one athlete today or whatever, he can actually teach globally anybody who wants to be leveled up from not just an athlete but to a CEO in the boardroom. So it is right? democratizing not only content, it is democratizing skill and talent, right? Exactly right. It's, it's, it's going to be very uniform for everybody that I get the same coach as what everybody gets. Correct. In terms of not only content, in terms of what I actually get as a coach. Yep, and leveling up fast with it. So, you know, if you uh, look at, say, Chris Hamilton, for example, and you're a CEO in the boardroom, for example, like this type of situation, and you want to go into a conversational chatbot, right? Yeah. You can get leveled up quickly in regards to getting your mind ready for that boardroom presentation, um, very quickly automated. Like right. that's, I think that's where we're going with the future of it. But again, it comes back to, you know, the toy in the sandbox is the, is the actual expert that's giving the inputs and the outputs, is that trustworthy? Is it going to put me down the right pipeline to give me the right information at the right time? You know, in a conversational way, so I don't just get disinterested and just, you know what, I'm, not, I'm talking to a bot, right? Yeah. I, want, I want empathy out of the chat situation, right? right? To think that I'm talking to a human, you know? And that's pretty amazing that even the conversational AI, with the Turin test, for example, confuse people for like 10 minutes thinking that it was actually a person. Yes. You know, I think also with conversational AI, there's going to be nuances to it, like a context, right? So for example, we're in Dubai right now, right? A conversational chatbot should know that that person is in Dubai and there's certain quirks, but they you should know that I'm Australian, for example. Yeah, it can and just greet with the, the Arabic greetings yeah. and it exactly. can keep going along in terms of what actually in the local environment uh, yeah or it, it actually picks up that I'm Australian for example and then I use words a certain way right right and then it talks to me more as an Australian would understand right, right. because we have our vocabulary and our slang like no other country right <laughs> and so certain things that I say people will be like huh? I don't get that right um, and so I think that's where conversational AI can pick up that nuance and then deliver the answer in a way that I understand it differently to say uh, yeah, Yassine history, understands it, yeah. right? And that's where I think it's quite quite lovely in this regard, you know? Yeah. And it can also look at a situation and be able to, to judge it better, Yeah. right? Yeah. So so I'll, uh, I'll summarize it and we'll leave it to questions. So basically sure. we started with uh, content. Content was automized, then, then we have context. Then we basically had voice. Then we had emotion. Then we have language then we finally ended up with creating the same character and where we are more close towards talking to a human but we are not actually talking to a human but we'll be talking to a bot yeah that's what it is it, and now we're in the stage of rinse and repeat you know yeah. just look at what they're, they're saying give that feedback back loop in and just make sure and polish that so that it's you know yeah, getting I more think, and more human yeah i think it's right? going to be exciting the next few years what what comes up in this in this amazing area. So yeah. we might be talking to people whom, who might look like humans, but they are not actually humans. And we'll get a lot of information and insights from them thinking that they are humans, actually. Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, any, any questions? I think we are done. We have just three minutes. Hi, uh, this is Gaurav from Encrypt Technologies India. Uh, so my question is around, so we talked a lot about positive aspects of the conversational AI, but there is a whole other side where it can do a lot of harm. For example, it can convince you to click on links on social media, which might be a phishing link. So my question is that as a user's pers pers uh, perspective, how to draw a line between till what point we have to use it or some bulleted points, which as a user's pers perspective, we have to take care of while using the conversational AI. But that's a very interesting point. So uh, with what I was saying earlier, I think it's up to the businesses before they implement, say, a conversational chatbot in their system to basically check it, right? 
to, to proof it, whichever demand that is. So if you're talking about a medical side of things, really testing it and putting it through its paces before releasing it to the end user where there can be a problem. You know, so I think definitely there is a problem in regards to that end user just openly using things, right? I think it is going to improve. Why? Because like as a user, mm. you are still not uh, aware even if it is given as a plain text. Mm. You go and uh, just put terms and conditions, document, accept, and you just go, on lo go, go along with the data, right? When there is a conversational AI, at least there is someone who can actually talk to you and explain what is actually going to be the right thing and wrong thing about about stuff, right? And you can choose. So it, it's going to get better only then, rather than getting, uh, I mean, we, time only will tell, but still, I see it as a positive. Correct. I think it's with everything. So the even when Alexa, improve. even when Alexa first started, for example, like, um, or, or Siri, like people were doing voice inputs in and getting stupid stuff back, right? Over time, it just it gets more and more firmed up in regards to the concept, the idea, and and the skill level, and to the point where you just you don't recognize it, right? But there it can still be a problem with that user, say misinterpreting it. And I said that's where I think that companies need to be looking at the AIs and, and what they implement and making sure that the answers that get given back are actually correct, you know, which is where that trust layer comes in because you don't want to give people the wrong answers, you know. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the good conversation. So uh, there was this talk in May uh, was virtual, where Mo Godat, if you know him, he was with Google X and, and then wrote a couple of good books, was talking about AI and was describing it as what it is now, right? And was describing it as if it is a human. So I asked him, how would we know if uh, it has our best intention in mind? Correct. And just said, we don't. Yeah. Right? So I asked him, how can we tell or kind of control what's happening? Because it is moving, developing faster than we can track. And he said, we can't. We just have to facilitate around it, right? So the more and more we are seeing as uh, like automation, we treat it by setting in validations. You as a program cannot do this if you don't have this. We can put validations on it. With AI, what we have to do is the only model that works is it's a person. It's, it's as if it's a human being, as if it's a live assistant, right? Yeah. So how can we kind of govern it, if I am using the right uh, word, as if a new being is migrating into our uh, domain and gonna take on some responsibilities, some decisions, right? How can we really govern it if we know that we cannot know what's happening in its head. We know it is going to be smarter than us sometimes and is developing fast. That's actually a really great point because right. like, if you've got, say, an AI that's obviously building over time, right? Now you release it to your staff and just say for medical purposes and you're com conversationally interacting with it and it's giving you the right answers. And then you go, okay, it's ready. Let's release it to, to the end user, right? And then all of a sudden you've got the more context getting added to, into the AI, right? That's not getting checked because it was checked, right? And then it's going to the end user and then they're having an issue, right? And so maybe there it's actually versioning, you know, a, a versioning control in regards to this one's being tested and it's, it's fine. It's fit for human consumption, right? And you version it. And then as it improves, you go back into iteration, ideation, and you test it again and then release it. So I think unless there, to your point, there's some rules and regulations around that, those toys in the sandpit can get painful. So keeping it uh, to a domain, that's the way. Not, not keeping it open to different things, but keeping each AI specific to a domain, maybe that's we can, how we can contain or govern or like predict what it is going to do. Yeah, correct. Well, the, from doing it to a, a single domain, you can actually get context around that domain. You know, which I think so you that, control that the context. Helps. You try yeah. to control the context. That might be the way right. in, in that domain. Yeah. And it is going to be only uh, uh, problem specific, right? If you, are, if you are trying to build a board out of, let's say, chat GPT right. and uh, to, let's say, have a, a sales bot, right? Who, which does sales for, let's say, on a retail store, 
right there is a contained set of use cases and stuff what you can actually control them with right it's not going to be the sales bot is not going to talk about anything else other than sales other than the retail store uh, expertise what it has right so uh, a person who can actually build that can himself control what actually the bot can do correct and that can be versioned as you said it can be versioned and and moved along correct yeah i think it's grabbing those domain experts as i said earlier and and then putting those domain experts together and then making the the chat around conversation chat around their domain expert you know in regards to what knowledge they have you know so that the the knowledge that's getting pumped out the other end is actually correct the be the know? better point there was like uh, the democratization like if you have 100 sales guys in your retail store all the 100 sales bots will behave the same there's no a b c kind of grades yes exactly and i think too that's where workforces can actually step in too and be able to contribute as a workforce to a chatbot right yeah. because what works in one workforce doesn't work in another there's different sales pipelines different sales techniques used in different companies and so if they want to keep it on an organizational level you know the the tone of voice for example um to their customers they will have to start contributing to these ais right so there, there's probably a huge opportunity there for uh, companies to actually start getting their own employees to contribute. Contribute, you know? yes. Mm. Last question. Uh, what do you think about strong AI? When it will be appearing? And uh, when the Turing test will be passed? Uh, sorry, I, I, we didn't get you. When strong AI will be in place? which will pass Turing test. So when the strong AI will be there available to pass Turing test? Oh, right. When will this be? Yeah. That's a good question. I think we're still at an early stage yet in the, in the sandbox to actually determine that because based on domain, it might, it might pass the Turing test for one lot of conversations, but not for another. You know, so I think it's a process over yes. time. And, and the Turing test will also keep uh, evolving, right? <laughs> It's exactly. not going to remain the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. What an interesting session. Thank you, Matthew Hogan and Mohammed Yassin, everyone. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next session. Uh, it's a fireside chat on the topic of Web3, a developer's guide to the decentralized web. And to talk about that, can I call on stage Jeremy Michaud, CEO and G at GM Contactless, and Vathan Vindal, CEO and founder at Shura Technologies Limited. Um, a round of applause for the gentleman. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, Jeremy, let's start with a small introduction. Okay, sure. So, well, I think we will start by introducing a bit our, about ourselves, and then we will uh, we will talk about this uh, this subject, Web three: A Developer's Guide to the Decentralized Web. So, I am Jeremy Michaud. I'm the founder of JM Contactless, which is like a, a cashless payment system for events. So, in my everyday life. I mean, I started as an engineer in a uh, computer, and uh, now I'm more like a uh, yeah, business and in engineering. So I, I started a company like five years ago, and uh, it was, at the beginning, it was just like an engineering project, side project uh, that I do on my side time, and uh, it had a great success. So right now, uh, we have a full company, a team of 10 people, which is amazing, very great experience. And uh, I really love, uh, love all of that. And I thank them if they are watching me because that's a very great experience. And what about you? Thank you, Jeremy. My name is Vatan Vindal, and uh, I represent Shura Technologies. Uh, we are an IoT-based company 
where we are working with the video telematic solution for you know driver profiling driver safety uh, it's a camera based system which uh, you know gives alerts like driver drowsiness alerts smoking alerts mobile phone usage alerts you know lane detection lane departure warning pedestrian detection warning forward collision warning uh, we do driver authorization authentication working our calculation a lot of video based stuff around the automotives uh, that is what we do at shura technologies so let's start with the topic uh, jeremy so uh, you know it's interesting to understand what web 3.0 means from a software perspective you know developers perspective yeah so i think uh, to talk about web 3.0 we need to start with web 1 and web 2 and what does this mean and what is a big change about web 3 from a technical aspect and also from a business aspect so First of all, web was developed by a Swiss company like the, the CERN to communicate between them. So at basis, we have like web one, which is like a static way of, uh, of doing it. You have static web page. We all knew that it was at the early 2000, I think something like that. And um, they were just like uh, browsing. You can have information, but that's it. Uh, HTML is like hyperlinked text makeup, so it's just web page linked to another, uh, one to another, but there were no really mean of communicating between users, and that what has been improved in web 2. So web 2 is more like uh, you have a profile, you have messaging, you have everything. Web 2 is basically what we know today, what we use every day, so social medias, news websites, account, e-banking, and everything. And it is centralized. So the main information about centralized is that there is a main server and all the information goes there and goes to the user. So you have always, you go to the server and the server gives you the information. So it's really based on one point which could be replicated but that doesn't really change the aspect. And um, right now we are moving to the web three which is decentralized, meaning there is no single point of failure in a certain way and also no single point of information meaning the information is distributed all over the internet and all users are contributing to this information which is really interesting and has a lot of uh, interesting application to our like we all know about bitcoins and everything so from financial but it can have the, a lot of opportunities and i think it is really important as a, a technical and a business aspect to, to really uh, be interesting about it, to not miss these wonderful opportunities to change our way of using internet. So, um, so that's a bit my point about Web 3.0. And, um, and uh, from your side, so what do you think would be the use case of Web 3.0, especially maybe on IoT fields and in your industry? Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for this question. You know, uh, Web 3.0, the services we are using, Web 3.0 services in a lot of industries, you know, like education, healthcare, entertainment, you know, uh, financing. So one of the verticals which is, you know, not being catered to by Web 3.0 is, I would say, is IoT. And, you know, IoT uh, devices we see everywhere in our life, you know, starting from our homes, offices, vehicles we move around, everywhere we see IoT devices. And that is one particular field which is, yet untouched, I would say, by the Web 3.0 right now. And, uh, you know, if you're looking at today's world, you know, the biggest issue at hand in the IoT field is, you know, get devices getting hacked, privacy issues in terms of the data that is flowing through our homes, you know, Alexa, CD, they are all on Web 3.0. But then there will always be privacy issues in the IoT space. So I think uh, what me and my team and, you know, everybody in the IoT space is working on is you know, making it decentralized, how we keep this IoT devices away from the big giants you know, and make it decentralized. So that is what our focus is. You know, uh, we are into video telematics. So having a video data of a plant flowing through a Web 2.0 is basically a big challenge for us. You know, keeping these issues private or you know, is a challenge for us. So I would really be interested in you, you know, understanding how Web 3.0 can play a very crucial role in, you know, uh, develop the IoT space the way it looks today. And IoT space today is, you know, I, I think a trillion dollar industry 
in 2022 with 15 million IoT devices, you know, moving around the world. So I think IoT is one space which is yet untouched, but I would love to understand more of Web 3.0 in the financing sector that you are in right now. Yes, yeah, so from my field, again, I'm in cashless payment system. My, uh, my company is very specific to events. So there, are, there is basically RFID tags into Brisbane. You load money with it and you can pay it. And right now it is in centralized servers. So I have to have on-premise servers that, that register all the transactions. But I think Web3.0 could be very interesting that so in this field because you can have decentralized information, every user sharing the database, so there is no single point of failure again, and it could be distributed and anonymous, so that's something really important. And we can also integrate it, like to have a cryptocurrency or something that people can have on different events, because that's also a very big issue of this business right now. Every time you go to a new event, you have to create a new account and start from bottom, register and everything. So that's pretty painful, I would say. So if you have a wallet or something really decentralized, you know you have privacy and also you can keep your information. And uh, as you know, may, as you maybe not know, I started my um, my engineering by working into IoT. So I know a little bit also uh, about this issue. And uh, I'm really interested to, to discuss about how we can apply um, this information into IoT, because I think privacy, security are really big issues of IoT. And the danger we are facing today is that big companies have all the data. So they can, if they have breaches, they can provide all the data. And also if they, um, they, they can decide what they want to do with it. And I think Web3 can really uh, change that so the, the users can distribute anonymously the data between them without having to, um, to be at the hand of big company. And maybe one question I have, what do you think these big IoT companies will think of Web3.0? Do you think they will feel like they lose the grip on this data or do you think that will be open-minded about this? I think uh, so far, you know, IoT devices in general have been, you know, just a data collection points. And, uh, you know, since the last few years, we have been moving into video-based IoT devices. You know, sound-based IoT devices, video-based IoT devices. So currently, it is, you know, uh, much more challenging uh, times for us to make it, you know, more hack-free, more robust and more private. So I think uh, earlier people were not so concerned or, you know, least bothered about their you know, water sensors going hacked. But if a camera in your house is getting hacked, that definitely is a matter of concern. So I think Web 3.0 has to play a crucial role in, you know, getting the IoT devices onto a decentralized platform. And that is where the, the teams have started moving in an accelerated way to incorporate Web 3.0 solutions onto IoT services. That is what we are also doing. So uh, very interesting to, you know, uh, and the big companies, you know, who owns the IoT data, you know, Billions and billions of messages in the IoT field are transferred every day, every second. So that kind of data flowing suddenly stops to these big giants, definitely will, you know, hit their pockets. So it is, it is really important to understand how will this play out. But, you know, it, it's a good time ahead for IoT space, I would say. That's great. Thank you for, for the answer. Yeah, I think definitely if we, if we can manage a way to to have it, uh, to add Web 3.0 into IoT, that will definitely be very interesting. Um, do, do, do you have already some plan to integrate it in your, in your field or something like that? We are doing some trials, some testing. You know, our own uh, in-house decentralized video servers. We're trying to do that, but uh, I think it's just a start, I would say. Yeah, uh, because it's the beginning of Web3. So it. again, again, Jeremy, you know, you are using these RFID tags where you have to have a reader or a mobile app to get it connected to read that tag. So are you also working on the Web 3.0 technology to enable your app works on these technologies or are still using the Web 2.0 for reading these uh, RFID tags? So that's very interesting questions. I think that would be a big challenge to, to have a mix between Web 2 and Web 3 
because obviously you cannot, uh, Web3 is not a revolution that will um, uh, make Web2 obsolete. I think they will work together and be with Web2 and Web3 we can have something that is really helpful. So I think uh, right now uh, the, um, the plan is simple. You receive a wristband, you load money and then you pay with it. And what I want to integrate maybe will be you receive a wristband, you link it with your Web3 wallet or something like that, and you have all the information about your account, your money and everything, but you stay anonymous because it's really sensitive data. Even if it's just what you drink, what you eat, that gives you information that could give you information about your company, about where you were on weekend, what you do and everything that can have a lot of uh, issues also where you were and everything. So more it's anonymous and private, more people will have trust. And I think that's the same also about IoT. You need to create trust to your customer. The customer need to be feel confident to have cameras, microphones and everything in his house and being very secure about not knowing that the whole world can listen and see what they are doing. And I think that's really something important about Web3. I don't know what you feel about it. Yes. No, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. And you know, with more and more gadgets uh, moving around our houses, I think we are all concerned about you know getting it to a decentralized platform. I would agree with you, Jeremy. I think uh, we can open for questions if you have something. Yeah, maybe. Um, I think we still have a little bit of, of time, so um, maybe we can also talk about um, what it will change from a um, more technical aspect like uh, 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 hosting and things like that. On, I think on we would have to talk issues. about that. And uh, I think to, to start again, I think we need to, to discuss a bit about uh, the DevOps and what it will revolutionize about the way of hosting data. Because uh, it changed, I mean, back in time, every company had its own server on their site and some backup. Back in time, they, they used to give uh, external drives or everything. Every week, they change it to have a complete backup. So that was really painful. IT guys had to work during night to change everything because people were working uh, on it during days. And now with so many great um, technologies like uh, virtual machines, uh, the speed of internet which has grown completely uh, amazingly faster. Uh, so it changed to cloud hosting, like you, you, you don't need to have a physical server, you have a, a cloud-based server, which is, you can also have like services that pay what you use, so you, you, you don't even have a server, you, ju you just have a service, and depending on what you use, you will pay, you will pay it, so, so that makes it very interesting, and I think this cloud now is ready to integrate the Web 3.0, and uh, that's really interesting to see that because we can see microservices um, um, and uh, and services and everything that that gives it very uh, very better, and um, I think the future will be uh, in companies who just have basic internet connections maybe VPN or things like that, and everything will be somewhere, but you don't really know or you don't really need to know. And that's also one really important feature of Web3 is if you know that where you host this data, it can be read by big companies, that could be uh, annoying. And even uh, because, for example, regulations of Switzerland needs for a company, you need to advise your customers that you will host data outside of Switzerland. So that's also a big issue, but with Web.3, you know it's somewhere, you don't know where, but you know nobody can have access on except people that are allowed. So I think Web.3 Web is also possible with this new way of hosting things and with this interesting, this fascinating new internet connection that we have. I can talk also about 5G, with which I think will also be very interesting from IoT perspective. Do you see an interesting um, feature of uh, about 5G and what it changes? With, with 5G, we are looking at you know, a lot of uh, connected cars, connected vehicles, connected devices modules, where you know, uh, the devices are talking to themselves and to the server. 
So 5G definitely will play a very crucial role for us to get all the IoT space interconnected like a mesh. And uh, you know we are looking forward to that uh, innovation. Uh, teams have already started working on it. But with you know AI and ML playing a very crucial role in the IoT space, I think that is one of the key gateways for the Web 3.0 to really contribute to the IoT space a lot more than what it is doing today. So we are using a lot of AI and ML technology, and you know that is that is the gateway for Web 3.0 to you know contribute more to the IoT space. Okay, thank you for this answer. Yeah, and I think chips are also integrating 5G, which make it easier to have a, a battery-powered device that is connected to the 5G network to send data and to receive data. So you can have you can have it everywhere without having to have like um, a mesh uh, Bluetooth. So in, in this case, in this case, sending and receiving data would not only happen from a device to a server but would also happen from a device to a device. Let's say your car is going on a road. There's another car in front of you which has an IoT device. So imagine your, talk, your car talking to the other car and you know, syncing out the path, syncing out something else, maybe what God knows. But that is what we're talking about in terms of connected cars technology. Yeah, that's fascinating. And devices, talking to devices could also help you improve your everyday life. Like if you make yourself coffee, so coffee will send information to your car be ready, you have to, he will leave in about 30 minutes. And if uh, it's December in Switzerland, so we have a lot of snow, so the car can start to, to warm up a little bit and be easier to drive. So that's, that's definitely very exciting. And I think we are looking at a bright future from this side. That is really true. Imagine you have a medicine dispenser box giving you a medicine for cold, and you know that information getting to, getting to your room temperature AC and that room is controlled because it just had a cold medicine. So you know, imagine these things talking to each other and making your life more comfortable. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I think right now we can we can go. We are open for questions. Anybody? Hi. Yeah, I have a question to Mr. Vatan. So you mentioned that you are also in the video telematics space. So if I'm not wrong, you are capturing video of the drivers also as well. But don't you think in terms of that, uh, there's some sort of conflict with their privacy of sorts? Well, uh, I would say it is not a privacy breach. You know, uh, the reason being, look at this room you're sitting in right now. You know, you have cameras all around you. Are you worried about your privacy? In the office spaces where you said you have cameras over your heads, but then you don't worry about your privacy. A truck driver, you know, for a truck, a truck for him is a workstation. If he has a camera, we are only capturing videos, you know, not even capturing videos, we're capturing videos of the incidents that is happening while he's driving the vehicle, which is his office working hours. So I won't call it a privacy breach because the camera is not there for monitoring him. The camera is there for aiding him in driving in a better way. So that is what my, you know, uh, teaching has been to the driver. It's not a monitoring device, it's a safety device, which helps you drive better in an efficient way. I answered your question. Anybody else? So, was there a question? Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. All right, moving on to our next session, we've got another fireside chat, and the topic is going to be enterprise AA, AI adoption, obtaining faster predictions and business growth using AI. Can I please have on stage Ali Moses, CEO and Head of Analytics and Data Science, and Sanjay Thaskar, Founder and CEO of Assimilate Technologies. Are they here? 
think perhaps I just went out for a coffee. Let's just go grab them. Yep, we are ready to start. So can I please call on stage Ali Moses, CEO and Head of Analytics and Data Science, Sanjay Tuskar, founder and CEO of, of Assimilate, and Alok Tiwari, founder and CEO of Avot. Um, can you please have a chair? Hello. Um, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, Internet 2.0 uh, for the great conference and uh, the session. Um, so basically, we're actually speaking on enterprise AI adoption um, and obviously some of the challenges companies face how to do it uh, correctly, how to be successful uh, in incorporating AI into the business, 
And with me today, before I introduce myself, I'd like to uh, first uh, just have Sanjay uh, just introduce yourself for maybe 30 seconds, one minute, and then we have Alok as well. Sure, uh, thanks. So I am Sanjay Taskar, uh, founder and CEO of Assimilate Technologies Pune. And we deal uh, in a technology consulting and solution provider company. We help companies in building mobile app, custom web app, or end-to-end -end product development. So using uh, like a new skill technologies like a MinStack, MonStack, React Native, then Flutter, AWS, Cloud Services, Azure Cloud Services, and Java and .NET. So these are our tech stack uh, we are working as of now. And I so think a lot you. of people know about Sanjay because we have had like a long, detailed conversation. Okay. So a detailed conversation on BNPL and care now, pay later. Uh, Alok, please. Hi. Uh, I am Alok Tiwari from Abbott AI, BR, and artificial intelligence company. We are based out of Estonia. We are having office in India and in Mumbai, as well as in US in San Jose. Uh, we are completely focused into the artificial intelligence, and definitely, I mean, uh, we have uh, achieved some pretty good uh, milestones in last three years. We have delivered over 30 projects for our American and European clients, uh, only one in India. Uh, we have developed you know, some of the products around uh, you know, with NLP, with uh, video analytics, computer vision, and analytics. Uh, we will talk about much more into the detail with the AI adoption as well as you know uh, the uses, pros and cons and details. Uh, so hand over to Ali so he can introduce himself and then we can move forward on the next level. Thank you, Alok, and thank you, Sanjay. Uh, so guys, I'm Ali. Um, I am currently the CEO and heading the analytics and data science uh, team of Data Pilot. Data Pilot is a data science. AI and analytics services company. Uh, we're currently operating across uh, three, four continents, and we have a good client base in the US, Europe, Australia, uh, and Pakistan. And so we were currently just focused across seven to eight industry verticals, retail and e-commerce, financial services, mobility, uh, textile and fashion logistics, uh, and beyond. So um, thank you guys, thank you Sanjay and Alok for joining. So I, I'd just like to, uh, before I start the session, um, if I could have like a show of hands of maybe company owners who are trying to incorporate AI and data analytics into their day-to-day -day business. Can I like, is, is someone working on this initiative and someone facing any challenges when it comes to uh, you know, digital transformation or change management, uh, specifically with respect to uh, data-driven decision-making. Anyone here? Because I just want to understand, uh, you know, the audience, if, because it, it, it will be a fruitful session for you because, you know, uh, just helping companies uh, with this challenge because currently what's happening is around the world, a lot of companies are trying to um, implement AI within the business. Uh, data analytics uh, as the base is straightforward and a lot of companies are able to achieve it. But when it comes to predictive analytics, specifically use cases like Alok mentioned, uh, there has to be you know, a strategy and a roadmap to implement this uh, in the right way. So I'd like to hear from Alok, uh, you know, Alok uh, adoption of AI to enterprises. Uh, what do you think, what's happening around the world? Um, how has your experience been in working with different clients when it comes to helping them solve different problems using AI? Uh, thank you, Ali, for the wonderful question. And before getting into the deal with the you know, uh, adoption of the AI and my experience, I would like to first you know, give a little bit you know, uh, how the people can relate AI. So when we talk about the artificial intelligence, it's exactly the mimicking our brain. So I will a little bit give you the insight about how our brain works. So if we look into, we have a presence of mind, which is called prefrontal cortex. So this is a part which observes the thing. And we have the limitation as a human, so we can remember up to four to five things at a time we can observe. That's the limitation. When we talk about the AI, there's no limitation. 
is uh, you know the machines can observe multiple data points at the same time. Second thing, when we talk about the, our memory, that is our neurons in the human brain. And when we talk about the same thing, the data capacity that we are having is huge. That's where the, you know, our prefrontal cortex that calls out the you know, historical data and then we take the decisions. And that is based on the limbic system, which is our past experience. So that's uh, you know, human brain behavior, like connecting the live experience, the uh, presence of mind is the prefrontal cortex with the neurons, which having the data or past experience and connecting through the limbic uh, system, which is the reference call that we use for you know, our past experience. And then we behave and take the decision accordingly. Uh, as a human, we do have the limitations that we cannot have that you know, recall of the multiple things at the same times. Uh, we can not observe you know, more than four to five data points at the same times. That's the human limitations. When we go to the, you know, uh, any enterprise, and well, uh, one of the most important thing I want to bring it here before getting into the details, uh, we are here in the internet 2.0. And when we talk about the AI, I think internet being the, you know, the first thing, the evolution, the seeding point for getting the AI to this level where we are sitting today because internet has helped in accumulating huge amount of the data. That data we can use for the analytics, we can use for the artificial intelligence model to train and to work and to you know, uh, increase the efficiency of the organization. Well, uh, now I can get into the you know, enterprise adaptability. So likewise it says like human brain, the people, the management team, uh, and the people are resources, they are working in the organization, they are working as when we do, they go, they have the limitations, they can work on the multiple data points up to four to five. But when they can use the AI with the same data is trained in the proper way, then they can make more efficient decision. And in that way, like, you know, it depends on the industry to industry. So that can be, uh, you know, helping hand to the, you know, different industries, there will be different applications. Uh, well, I can give you one of the, you know, example from, uh, one of our client, basically. So that's a, a real huge case. So how UI, uh, AI can, you know, assist uh, different things, so different people. So we have one of the client that in the uh, high tension, uh, uh, preventive maintenance, high, tens high tension power line, uh, preventive maintenance. And they wanted to say like, you know, how we can uh, get the AI helping us, uh, we do not have the internet connectivity with the, you know, the remote areas where the high tension lines are there, we do not have anything, how we can be able to use the AI and how we can adapt. Uh, so then we went there with the solution, say, okay, fine. We have helped them in building the, you know, one of the IoT device. Uh, initially, the first step, we built the applications where the users, they were, uh, whoever is going there, when they are, uh, they are recording the, data like what is the you know maintenance required and the men whatever the parts they are placing they are doing and that data is used for the training and then the iot device when we put in that was you know sending the send, uh, data from one device to other voice and then there's going to the substation substation is having the data module that is transferring the data to their server and with that they are getting the data and now they do not require uh, in any preventive maintenance that person has to go and monitor in the remote area, they can directly, I mean, the person can go to the point where that's required the preventive maintenance. And in terms of the, you know, emergency shutdown, if something happens, they get exactly the GPS location, where is the problem? And they can get into that and that can solve. So that is helping them with the preventive maintenance and when they are doing the preventive maintenance, that is avoiding the any emergency shutdown. On the same time, even if in case of any emergency shutdown due to the, you know, weather restrictions and other things, they are able to get to the exact location without wasting any time. So that's how it is helping. And they are extremely happy clients with us and they were so happy that, you know, they after that offers us to, you know, be the joint venture partner. <laughs> great, great. Sanjay, uh, what do you think um, currently running a software services company and specifically when it comes to your product, uh, BNPL, uh, I'd like to understand um, where is, what initiatives are you taking um, within your product, within your business, uh, when it comes to implementing AI, 
Uh, and obviously, if you if you faced any challenges up till now when it comes to you know sort of um, implementing these initiatives uh, within your company. Sure. So like a BNPL, I like most of the people become aware about it. Like it's a buy now pay later. Yep. And uh, we have implemented this BNPL concept in uh, two products. One is uh, like a YU, which is a dine out product. So which can say dine now pay later. And another is a cherry pay. So in a dine now, uh, till the now we are collecting the data, but we have uh, this uh, like uh, obtaining faster prediction and business growth using AI. So we are having, we are going to uh, apply the AI model for uh, understanding the uh, like a user's uh, interest like if today I visited some hotel and if next time I'm planning to visit a such a hotel and what all are the things I like over there more mostly so we are planning to uh, implement that AI for that such a thing which can give a recommendation and which can show the hotels uh, in a interest of that particular person so that way we can adopt this uh, uh, AI for our uh, dine now pay later solution and similar way we are planning for the uh, our uh, cherry pay which is a care now pay later so care now pay later is related to healthcare so we wanted to identify the people uh, who has a capability to buy the insurance but they are avoiding to buying the insurance or avoiding to pay insurance but at the end they are ending up paying a huge amount on the medical expenses so we want to apply this uh, like an enterprise AI adaptation for this and categorize such a people and give them a prediction. For example, if I say I am a patient and I haven't uh, took a medical ex uh, medical uh, insurance and if I end up uh, at the year end, if I ending up by paying a lakhs rupees for my health care. So I want to identify such a people through our uh, data and suggest them instead of uh, paying, ending up paying such a huge amount, buy a 10,000, 15,000 rupees insurance and you can save your lot of money over there. So would like to bring uh, this concept over there. Uh, Sanjay, I want to add on to it. So I mean, it's a perfect example of the, you know, behavioral analysis of your consumer. Yes. And definitely, I mean, it's one of the, uh, going to be one of the, you know, best use case and one of our client, like, you know, uh, we have already delivered a solution for this uh, recommendation uh, for your dining out, basically. Oh, great. So we, I mean, uh, it's not just, you know, recommendation, but what we have done is like, you know, uh, we have trained the model with the, you know, uh, a huge uh, amount of data for the Italian, continental, Mexican recipes, because they are US-based clients, so majority of the, you know, cuisine you can find there. Great. great. So we have trained with all the, you know, data for the, you know, different recipes. So adapting to the taste, so like, you know, it's not just that, you know, looking at the recommendation based on like you like the Italian or something, but there might be, you know, the taste words that you like mild food or something like that, that can be into the recommendation. Apart from that, we do have the capabilities where what happens, like it can look into your health data as well. So like you're at the age of uh, 38, uh, you are uh, five foot six inch tall and you are having the 62 kg of the weight and based on that, you need micronutrition, you need uh, some calories, some proteins, and based on that, it can also recommend what exactly the need of your body, and based on your taste words and preferences, you can go for this kind of the meal. Great, great. <laughs> so let's take this discussion forward. Um, before I take this forward, I'd like to just speak about uh, enterprise AI adoption. Um, I think it's very important for you as a company to have a plan right? Um, these things are not too straightforward as a sound because C levels usually do not have a deep understanding of AI, right? Um, some of the problems which are not even AI are taken as AI problems because a lot of times you could actually solve problems through prescriptive and descriptive analytics, right? So firstly, when it comes to enterprise AI adoption, you need to have a plan and a roadmap and a framework in, in place. So there's an AI framework uh, in place uh, where you actually come up with different use cases to solve and what sort of data do you require to solve that specific use case and that's where your data strategy comes in as well, right? Um, until you don't have a plan in place, um, honestly, you cannot do it the right way. So enterprise AI adoption, um, honestly, because it has to be top-down. The C-level buy-in and generally 
the top management has to believe that you know we need to do AI and we need to solve this specific business problem because that is going to lead to X amount of ROI, right? That that is very important. See, okay, if you're solving the specific problem using AI, it's going to help me increase revenue or reduce cost because if you do AI, there are two reasons you do AI, right? It's either increasing revenue or reducing cost, right? All the use cases. So what, what, what I've seen is that never ever, and this is just like advice because I feel that a lot of companies sometimes do it wrong, that make sure that you have a plan in place and a roadmap in place. Um, you can look at some documents or frameworks by Bernard Marr. Uh, he's really good with this, right? Uh, and then some really good frameworks out there for you to, so for instance, if there's a machine learning canvas, which probably helps you identify different use cases and ensuring that you have the right data to solve the right use case at the right time, right? Um, moving on um, and taking this discussion forward, uh, what sort of business objects, so, you know, for, we do AI, as I mentioned, uh, and I repeat it, to increase revenue or reduce cost. So there's a business problem we're solving here, right? Uh, what I want to understand is that what, so, so for instance, if you were to, you know, look, you work with so many clients and you work with clients as well. Uh, what I want to understand is what sort of, uh, so what plan should companies follow when it comes to solving problems using AI? What sort of business objectives should there be in place? And number two, what, what success criteria should be there to make sure that if you're spending X amount of money in a use case, you get ROI, right? Yeah. Well, uh, great question, Ali, and thank you for asking this. Well, number one thing, when we talk about the any CXO level people or any enterprise, uh, first they need to lay down their a manual process or what the process they are following and what are the best results they are able to achieve. That becomes their basic benchmark. If they are going to increase anything beyond that, that's the bin-bin situation for them. So that's the first thing. They have to lay down their own existing thing. They can have the best resources they're working, what they have in hand, and based on that, what they can achieve, what's the best result they can see. So that becomes their baseline plan to you know implement the year. Then definitely, uh, there's, when you talk about the framework, there's, yeah, definitely there's a framework. And definitely we need to, you know, first, the first and foremost important thing is the data exploration, what they are having. Understanding their business and the data they are having because uh, sometimes the people go wrong with the AI. What happens, because AI is again same way, like, you know, when the data is most important. So if you have the garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so you'll not get the efficiency. So definitely the most important thing is require the data exploration aligned to their business objective. And then you will be, you know, building the model and train and then you can making it more efficient, which can increase their basically ROI, or you can say the top line, bottom line, so when they increase the efficiency, it is having the impact on increasing the bottom line, cutting on the cost. When uh, that is, uh, you know, used in terms of the marketing and business development activities, it is going to, you know, add on to their top line, basically increasing their revenue. So it all depends, and definitely uh, the AI is always going to be working with their existing plan to improve and enhance that. So they always need to have their best and most efficient plan that they can have. Great. Sanjay, what do you, what do you think? Um, so when it comes to offering services uh, to clients, specifically, you know, software development services, uh, you must be, so how many times have you gotten queries from clients asking you to implement a specific use case? Because obviously if you're developing a product, for a company, um, you know, there must be some discussions on how you could sort of do AI or general analytics. Uh, and I'll talk about that as well because we're talking about AI and I just wanna be, so what sort of conversations and you know, what sort of use cases uh, are you currently exploring with your clients when it comes to implementing AI? Uh, sure, so thanks, uh, thanks for asking. 
So over here, like whenever we are discussing with the customer on the requirement front, so initially they are asking for the basic, uh, like uh, we can say MVP kind of thing. And once the MVP is done, they are uh, like starting a collecting a data. And once they get the X amount of data, after that, uh, they are asking for a, like a generate the prediction, identify the right customer, like on an app or on a web, we'll get N number of customers, but all not will be your real customers. Some of them like a not interested customer, some of them like a, a just casual customer, they are nothing to do with that particular yeah. thing. Uh, so customer is most of the time asking, I want to identify a right uh, end customer who could help me growing my business. Yep. So that's the common use case uh, we uh, see in every uh, like requirement discussion. And he want to identify the genuine customers, that one thing. Another thing like uh, he want to give some additional thing based on a custom, like uh, interest of the end customer. If I'm a smoker, what kind of smoking I do? So that kind of prediction. If I go for the education, if I'm a learner, like uh, see, for a learning there are n number of things. But I'm interested in a, assume that I'm interested in a Microsoft and Microsoft certification. So I should get a, such a courses which are aligned to my interest. Yep. Like a, nowadays uh, yep. our uh, YouTube is giving, like yep. if I say some specific kind of video, so it start giving me suggestion or similar kind of reels started showing me. So that is a kind of uh, like a adaptation of AI. Great, great. Um, and I think very valid point. So, you know, customer experience can be made flawless uh, using data analytics and AI. And actually, most of the talk nowadays, and even if, I, if you talk about myself, uh, I work with a lot of companies, and uh, a lot of the focus is on customer analytics and customer 360 degrees profile, because that's where personalization comes in, right? Uh, I'd like to understand any, any product owners, like not product owners, actually, people who own products or running product companies here in, in the crowd? Anyone? Because I just want to understand the sort of use cases you have in the platform because I, yeah. So, okay. Do we have anyone? Yeah. yeah please. 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 So I just want to understand, you know, if you're running a product, what sort of use cases do you currently have to deliver a flawless customer experience and use cases with respect to analytics and AI. Yes. Uh, I have a company named Telewellness. It is a digital health company. We have an application doing uh, health di diagnostic by selfie. Oh. You are doing a short uh, video because uh, our AI is trained on both voice recognition uh, patterns and uh, face uh, patterns. And, and, and if I talk about these use cases, um, any challenges you faced when implementing like voice recognition or, you know. Regulatory challenges. What uh, is your biggest challenge? Just want to understand. Regulators, they want uh, at, at least two years of uh, uh, experiments on a big, big set of um, uh, users, but uh, it is already um, working, this application, but not in medical uh, uh, area, because medical area, there is strong regulation. Uh, I have one question. So you mentioned that, you know, uh, you're in telemedicine, right? Not telemedicine because we are not medicine, we okay, are fine. wellness, okay, telewellness. Okay, fine. So, but you are, what are the features and what are the things that you are capturing with the 30 second video you mentioned? Uh, by video, we are um, doing, uh, um, capturing uh, data of uh, your face yes. and um, co correlating is it with uh, other data regarding your health. For example, you, you uh, put, uh, Today I am uh, sick, and we see that your face is like that. Tomorrow you will write, I am uh, so it's like pretty well. So it's facial emotions uh, recognition, right? Yes. 
Okay, so then I think, uh, well, you have given the very good, uh, interesting use case, and then I can go to the little more, you know, next level of the, you know, things that you mentioned. So it's uh, with the, this uh, 30 second of the video, we do have one more capabilities, like, you know, with the reflection we can get the PPG waves of your human body. When we visit the doctor, you might have seen that, remember the doctor have the touch points, this, 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 here, and then here, chest, back. These are the points where you can, you know, capture the PPG waves. So when you have the 30 second video that is coming in, the PPG waves that is behind the skin can be easily captured. Uh, we have developed the capabilities. With that PPG waves, we are able to measure your blood pressure, your oxygen saturation level, your hemoglobin level, your, uh, uh, heartbeat, heart respiration variability, which can be used for the ECG, and like plenty of things that is the vitals that you can get. And then you can combine and even uh, with the facial recognition that you can, you know, combine with the uh, your stress and other things, also combining with the data points that your heartbeat, respiration, PRQ, and blood pressures, and that can give you the, you know, accurate idea like where you stand and that can be the pre-stage for the, any doctor to look into that how they can do the better diagnosis for it. So Great. this is a, a step ahead that you know we were talking about like you know capturing the PPG waves and RGB which is like you know getting the more inside of the data that what you have right now so adding to it. Great, uh, <laughs> great, great Alok. Uh, so um, moving on um, a lot of the companies who are trying to implement AI uh, in their organization, and not even AI, like when it comes to AI, um, I'd like to, so so AI is, if, if you look at, um, I, I'm gonna just ex try to explain this using a, s a set diagram. So take, so AI, not don't take AI as AI, so AI includes machine learning and deep learning as well. And this applies to uh, what I'm going to talk about is the other challenges. So when it comes to, so, you know, there's a whole AI circle and then within that, you know, there's machine learning and within that there's deep learning. So ML and deep learning are also part of AI because a lot of times um, C-levels and business users sometimes struggle to understand the difference between AI, machine learning and deep learning. Uh, specifically when we talk about things like, uh, you know, natural language processing, and NLP, conversational um, technologies, that's what we refer to as AI. So coming back to, you know, uh, coming to the challenges, and I'd like to give my thoughts on that first before I pass it on to Alok and Sanjay. Um, you know, when it comes to the challenges when implementing AI into your organization, uh, I'm, I've actually seen companies face a lot of different challenges. Um, so firstly, if I, if I look at, like for instance, the amount and quality of data, that's one of the biggest challenge because a lot of times, uh, even when you're planning or coming up with a roadmap of different use cases you wanna implement in your organization, a lot of times there's no quality data available. And if data is available, a lot of times the right variables are not available. So that's like one of the biggest challenges companies face when it comes to implementing different use cases in the organization. The second biggest challenge I believe is change management and the reluctance of employees who are used to using conventional methods for data-driven decision-making. That's something because, for instance, if someone has been using Excel since the last 10 years for decision-making and telling him or her to shift to self-service BI or using dashboards to take decisions, it's not easy. And that's where you need to have a change management plan or a digital transformation plan into place where you sort of train the employees and have that C-level buy-in to ensure that everyone adopts to data-driven decision-making in the organization, right? A very, very important and a biggest, one of the biggest challenges. Third is, again, lack of talent. Like there are very good people in the market out there, but still it is a challenge to get the right people to help you implement stuff because, and that's where, you know, specifically startups struggle because they're confused, like either to outsource the AI data analytics work or 
or should we build an in-house team? And I firmly believe that in the start to get things going, I think you should outsource and then start building in-house capability. But talent is something a lot of companies face, um, you know, across the globe because it is not easy to find the right people who help you implement uh, data analytics and AI use cases in the organization, right? Um, and there are a lot of other challenges, but I'd like to hear Alok, uh, you know, his thoughts, he works with so many companies, and then Sanjay, as to what sort of challenges do you think come into play when implementing, you know, AI or, you know, consulting your com the companies you have, the clients you have, to do it the right way? Well, uh, thanks Ali for again uh, a wonderful question. And I would like to add into it, it's not limited to ML and uh, you know, re, uh, deep learning. There will be some more things that you know, added to it, the list, the reinforcement learning, uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning. It's yes, all applicable. Yep. So that we can keep this is uh, something that I will say is not a point to discuss uh, with the client when we go to the client. We are meeting the CXO level clients and we do not expect any technical insight from them. So the core objective, because it's scenario based, that you will be using, uh, you know, the ML model, or AI ML, or you are going to use the reinforcement learning, or you are going to use the deep learning, CNN, whatever. This all depends. Like you know, uh, I think somebody has asked the question. They were recognizing the voice, so definitely there has to, you know, get into the voice spectrogram, and there's like more on the technical inside that will not require on the front. So main thing, what we focus, understanding their business understanding their business need and then telling them and after knowing their whatever that they are having inside the data inside they're having or if they 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 are limitation on the data that's also possible so based on the scenario that we say so this first thing what we do we evaluate their business and exploration of their data that is we do normally the free because until unless we are delivering the services we do not charge to anybody and so we spend time understanding their business, and then we come up with the model that what could be the solution that will be you know, helpful for them. And I can say the touch wood that's been, uh, so far we have not met any client that uh, we have explored and, uh, under, uh, their business, and then we have given some recommendation and he has not taken it. So uh, we had been like, you know, with the 100% successful rate, in terms of that, because we do, I mean, we have been blunt and upfront to some of the client that, okay, I think uh, based on your business uh, requirement, AI may not be helpful here, so it's very early stage, we cannot do it. So we have been also honest on that part, but on the other side, that's been like, you know, uh, where we have uh, found that, you know, that's definitely there's required and AI can help a lot. We have given the right recommendation to them, and that's how like we break in. I'm like, I'll tell you that uh, the sort of experience we had, uh, cybersecurity, uh, US patent holder, the guy who has got the uh, concept with the US patent for the mobile data security. And what we have done to them, actually they, uh, they have like five to six companies they earlier tried. They have lost almost uh, $300,000 and they were not able to get into the, you know, the basically uh, the US patents requirement to have that working model. They approached us through some of the common contact and we delivered the entire solution in nine month time. And then they have put us as a co-patent holder into the US patent application. And another thing they have given into the same company, 17.5% equity as I, you know, uh, appreciation to our team. So, uh, I mean, thankful to most of our clients, that's, and it's also the thanks of board goes to my team as well. Second thing, the people make the mistakes in terms of the resources capability. Uh, so what happens is resources capability, people look into the technical capability, somebody is like Python, PyTorch, knowing the AI ML. But most important, when we look into uh, any business and enterprise, we have to make sure that makes sense to them. And the most important assets and resources required, they are the people who knows the statistics and mathematics. Because statistics and mathematics, that never goes wrong. 
and that's the base for any AI solution that is required and that has to be delivered. We do hold like four PhDs uh, in statistics. We work very closely with the statistics institutes. We, I myself is expert in the calculus and I'm an engineering graduate in computer science. So we focus on that personally and identifying the solution based on the business need and we have been 100% successful so far. It, Sanjay, um, challenges in enterprise AI adoption. Yeah, so the major challenge over here, like uh, people want to implement the things, but they are not aware about it. Yep. So the major thing we need to make the awareness, we need to understand, like uh, I'll give her one real example. Like uh, people wanted to implement AI ML in their solutions. But why they want to implement it, that's the biggest challenge. That's where the exclusion is yes. required. So we need so to do that. That's why we need to generate the awareness. Uh, we need to take a time to understand their problems, then collect their data points, and based on that, give a suggestion. But that's a very good point, Sanjay. And actually, a lot of times, companies are not actually sure. Uh, and there is no success criteria into place when you start implementing a use case. So understanding the business problem is very important uh, to make sure uh, you know you you understand like from a business standpoint number one and from a tech standpoint. So business is one way, but the other yeah other yeah. other side is to ensure you're using the right tools and frameworks to solve that specific problem. Yes, hello. Yeah, one more point actually I want to add here. Majority of the time when you meet the, you know, uh, the people basically for their requirement, that is your capability to identify. Because mostly the people, they will not come to the point that what they need actually. They will give you the stories and they will give you the requirement which is all around the problem, but they will not tell you the problem. That's where the capabilities lies into the organization, the people who are taking the requirement to identify this is the right core need of the organization. Absolutely. You, uh, hammer on that, then it's all yours that, I mean, they're, they're adapting it. Spot on, Alok, spot on. Uh, we have like two minutes left, two and a half minutes left, and I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, honestly, if you're looking to implement um, AI analytics into your business, uh, make sure you, just like find some, some, some notes, make sure you have a plan in place like the different frameworks available online, uh, but make sure you're doing it the right way. Uh, if you're gonna invest money into these initiatives, make sure you have a plan and then a plan which helps you succeed. So there should be a su success criteria and an ROI mechanism into place. And now you could also analyze impact of these use cases in terms of numbers. Obviously there's a way to do it, but for example, if you have a personalized recommendation model into your application, analyzing how much revenue is that generating for your application, right? That's the sort of you know, success criteria I'm talking about. Like for instance, Amazon generates 35% of revenue from their recommendations, right? And they have like a very, very strong mechanism into place um, where they can analyze impact of each and every use case. Right. Don't just rush on implementing AI. Just make sure you have a plan and you make your foundation and base strong. And when it comes to the foundation and base, that's where your data engineering pipelines come in to ensure that you have scalable pipelines in case you're ingesting data from different sources. So you have like an analytics landscape and a scalable infrastructure. And after that, you go on implementing AI. That's the right way. Rather than just hitting AI use cases from the start, that's not the right approach. Alok and Sanjay, I'd like to hear your thoughts, closing thoughts. We have one minute here. Well, I mean, I'll tell you one of the most important thing here to implement the AI. See, the human brain is limited, but we can scale it up with the using the AI as our assistant. So definitely it is going to be the added advantage. You always put in like your manual and the traditional setup as a uh, baseline model with the most efficient person on the place to always as a basic plan and then you can implement the AI. Definitely it's going to add value to you. You can see the deliverables that is like, you know, over exceeding, over exceeding your expectation. 
and definitely in terms of the business need and area, like uh, if it is the area of the business development, marketing and all, you can see the top line uh, having the direct impact of it. And if it is like, you know, uh, operations and the, you know, business need, improving the efficiency, it's going to have the impact on your bottom line, uh, getting like most efficient, also cutting down on the TAM and all those things. So that's definitely uh, the closing remarks I can say, always go for the, you know, the basic exploration, first understand the requirement, put it in the right way, put your manual best plan on the place, and then validate the AI solution I mean, uh, against the, you know, your existing plan. Great thoughts, uh, uh, Sanjay. Any thoughts? Closing yes, same. Ended, whatever he Great. Said. <laughs> um, I think we, can we take two minutes for questions? To, cool. Um, any questions, yeah. Hi, my name is Kezia. Um, I run a marketing company, but I'm building an AI tech product. So I have a question for you, Alok, and then one for you as well, Ali. Um, Alok, so a lot of business owners are reluctant to kind of adopt AI models because there's, you know, a 70 to 80 percent accuracy with most models till present. Could you give us an example of an AI model that you may have worked with with a better, you know, accuracy rate? Well, I mean, uh, it's a great question, Sajia. Thank you very much for asking this question. And that's, uh, I mean, where the award we have been on that, like uh, most of our model that we have, I mean, uh, given the example, uh, accuracy stands over 90% uh, uh, for the most, most of the data model. And that's where, because the base things what we work, we work with the uh, mathematics and uh, statistics expert to working on the baseline before getting into the technical mode on the, you know, building the model and all. So, uh, you works with, uh, can just uh, elaborate that, you know, which kind of the client that you are looking for, then I can give you like a little more insight on that. I mean, any example that would be easy for us to understand with a good accuracy rate? Okay, fine. So I can give you the, there's two example, like maybe the quick one. Uh, one is like, you know, for e-retails, getting the accurate body measurement. We have developed the solution where like, you know, with two photographs with the 2D uh, front and side view, we can get the accurate body measurement and the accuracy uh, with the 4 million photographs being processed so far has been 97% and above. So that's one example. Second thing uh, that goes for you, one more thing, like people, the majority of the people now, they are doing the sentiment analysis and the predictive analytics based on that. Sentiment analysis is right now most of the companies that are limited to positive, negative, and neutral three degree. Uh, we are working on one of the advanced level where we are combining it with the nine emotions that can make more sense and increase the accuracy. So when you combine, like when uh, working with the sentiment analytics with the three degrees like birds, you are taking as positive, negative, or neutral. But when I have delivered, uh, you know, particular statements. It's out of passion, uh, or it's out of like, you know, uh, uh, business competition, or greediness, or anything. That has the huge impact. And when you are analyzing the data with that, combining the emotions to that yeah. with the phrase, that's give you like better accuracy. So that sentiments can be applied to the even uh, anywhere. Like you can look at the indices, like predicting the stock market. You can use into the different vertical, even uh, we have done the recently, the election happens in India and we predicted 51.5% vote for the BJP uh, right after closing the voting session and they got 52.5% after the completion of the, you know, the final yeah. result came out. So you can see the accuracy. Yeah. So can I add something here? Okay. Like just, uh, so remember Kezia, uh, accuracy in one metric is one metric. So in AI, you have bias variance trade-off. When it comes to real world AI models, uh, there's a lot of bias in real world data. So you cannot evaluate every model based on accuracy. So if you have like 100 data points, so for instance, if I'm predicting defaults, there's gonna be very less defaults, right? And for instance, just give me, just give me an example, out of 100, there could be 90 success like paybacks and 10 defaults in a bank. And that's where you cannot use accuracy but there are a lot of other metrics. So specific, so based on the data you have and the problem you're solving, you need to ensure you're using the right metrics, like F1 score, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but balanced accuracy, confusion metrics, recall, precision, 
rather than always looking at accuracy as a metric to evaluate models. Uh, I think that's what I want to, I think, we, I wish, I'm sorry, I'll address to you, <laughs> no your question way. later. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Sorry that we couldn't give you more time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at the final phase of our conference. We've got uh, our last recognition session now. And to do the honors, I would like to call upon stage Dr. Lyudmila Schaefer, MD at FACP. A round of applause for Dr. Lyudmila, everyone. All right, I'd like to call upon our first honoree. Can I please have Mustafa Essa on stage to receive your award? Congratulations. Come on. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this uh, honorable uh, award. Uh, just one thing I want to say about it, uh, according to my work in the AI machine learning um, activities for about 20 years right now, I believe that uh, people who create the value, not the machine learning, not the AI, but the people that they create the models, that they give the greater value for the companies, the enterprise, and the countries and governments. So thank you very much for this uh, award. Honorable award. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Our next award goes to Pula Party Janki. Privileged and honor for the award. Thank you so much. I'm Janki, and we are working on big data and business analytics, uh, empowering enterprises into actionable you know, intelligence using autonomous technologies, IoT, and sensors. Uh, it's a great event to get connected with best minds. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the rest of our award winners are actually not present here, but they are here virtually. So I would like to Thank Dr. Schaefer for being here and doing the honors. Thank you so much. I'll call on the names of, uh, we've got Deepak Viswewarya, who's not here, but he sent a video. So can we please play that? Hello, I am Deepak Viswewarya. I'm truly honored and humbled to receive this award for outstanding leadership at the Internet 2.0 conference. I would like to thank the jury, the judges, and the organizers of the conference for this award. My sincere apologies for not being there in person to receive this award. It's great to have had an opportunity in my career to contribute to various businesses over the last three to four decades. I've had great opportunities to be part of building several global centers of excellence, including companies like Pegasystems, NetApp, EMC, etc. Building large-scale, high-performing engineering organizations has been a fulfilling part of the journey. Launching a B2B product-focused startup accelerator was an amazing experience in driving innovation. Being part of the team, 
to drive organizations like Indo-American Chamber of Commerce has been a way to give back to the community. I'm so honored to have my work recognized in this way by the Internet 2.0 organization in the Outstanding Leadership category. There are several people to thank for this success. Thanks to my family who have been a fantastic pillar of support all through my career. There are so many teammates and friends who have been part of the journey and have been part of the team that have made this happen. There are several mentors who have guided and advised over the years. Thanks to all of them, it has been a fulfilling journey. It means so much to me that the work that I'm so passionate about also resonates with others. I look forward to continuing my efforts in my areas of expertise and to bring about positive changes for many years to come. Once again, a big thanks to the Internet 2.0 organizers and I'm grateful for this recognition. I wish you all a wonderful conference. Thank you. That was Deepak Viswavarya, Ankit Jain, who also could not be here and has sent a video. Can we play that? Hello everyone. I hope everyone is keeping safe. Firstly, I want to thank the organizers of Internet 2.0 conference for honoring me with this recognition. I am very privileged to be sharing this award with the who's who of the technology industry. As they say, it takes a village to be successful. I owe a large part of my success to my mentors, colleagues and managers over the years who have believed and invested in me. It would be incomplete if I don't thank my wife, parents, family members and friends for all the love, support, sacrifices they have made for me. Lastly, I would like to point out my mantra of leadership has always been that of a servant leadership. With empathy in our eyes, gratefulness in our hearts and optimism in our minds, we should always look to serve for the greater good of the people. Thank you. Amazing. Now we've got the remainder of our award winners, Jet A Pro. We've got Rama Al Riyami, Calvin Lim, and Katerina Komulainen, who could not be here with us physically, but they are watching us virtually, and we will definitely send through their awards to them. Uh, congratulations to all the award winners, and on behalf of Internet 2.0 Conference, we wish you all the best for your future endeavors. Now we're going to move on to our last session of the day, and it is going to be a panel discussion on the topic, The City of Future, Enhancing Quality of Life Through Technology. Can I please call upon stage our panelists, Abdullah Al-Ashak, Public Sector Director at BMC Software, Rena Jain, a full-time MBA student from Chicago Booth, and Fayed Yusri, co-founder of Dragon IT Services. A round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We are here to talk about the city of the future and how the technology can enhance our experience in living our lives in a daily basis. Uh, we can start with introducing ourselves. Myself, I'm Abdullah Alaska. I'm the public sector lead for BMC Solution in uh, Saudi Arabia. And we are, as a surface management application software, we help of enhancing and con contributing from an IoT perspective and monitoring and ticketing system to have uh, the best uh, customer experience of the journey of using technology in the daily activities. Uh, hello all. Hello all, I am uh, Faye Jusri, um, co-founder of uh, Dragon IT Services and Marketing. I'm also the head of technology for TONS, that's an e-commerce, uh, grocery e-commerce uh, application in uh, Kuwait. And um, I'm happy to be here and uh, I have served for maybe seven years 
in the uh, defense and public safety uh, sectors, and we have always been discussing what's going to be uh, like the uh, cities of the future, and it's great to have the opportunity to discuss it with you all. Uh, will join me soon uh, to the stage, uh, Rina, and oh, here, here she is. Thank you. Hi, everyone. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rina Jain. Um, I worked as, I'll start with a brief intro. So I'm a chemical engineer and Post that I worked as an oil field engineer at Schlumberger, uh, where I led a team of 15 to lead oil extraction jobs. Post that I moved to Universal Aquatech uh, as the VP of Operations and Business Development. Sorry, I just need water. <laughs> yeah. Ran all the way here, so apologies for that. So, uh, at Universal Aquatech, I manufactured and launched three new products. And post that, I wanted to move into the digital product space. So, I joined uh, Cedar Wood as a VP of products. There, I performed the digital transformation of their 15 brick and mortar establishments. During this, and this was during the pandemic. So, took the complete business and the operations online. Um, post that, I joined Chicago Booth for my MBA, and now I would be heading to McKinsey as a consultant in the tech and operations space. Thanks. Over to you. All right. So, as a panelist, I would also be moderating this talk. And first, um, as a part of the city of the future, we will talk uh, about preventive medicine and the effect of technology in the healthcare space. So, one of the most important impact which technology has had is in the healthcare space. For example, in 2020, there were 19 million diagnosed cancer cases. Out of these, there were 10 million deaths. This is more than 50%. And one of the leading causes for this was the late detection and ineffective treatments. Now, this is where technology comes in. With big data and AI, we have been able to detect cancer on the early stages. For example, stage one versus stage three, right? So with early detection and with AI in the personalized medication uh, platform, we have been able to offer more effective cures. And this is where, you know, healthcare has seen a major development. Uh, my counterparts here will talk about a few more examples of AR, VR in healthcare. Yes, uh, from an AI perspective and uh, using technology to enhance healthcare, we have a case that we, we utilize in the kingdom. We launch an application that centralize all the medical care information in one unit. And we thank God we launched it before the pandemic. When the pandemic happened, it became the center interface and we enhance that application or that gateway to be the access for whole information for the person or any guy who's living in Saudi from a Saudi citizen or a foreigner that utilize all the information from a healthcare perspective, from vaccination, from enhanced health issues, and other utilization. And without the technology and reflecting and unifying the healthcare files in one centralized database, let us say, for example, you cannot have this whole information, whole impact. And also, utilizing this technology help the government and the public sector of the region to utilize the payment from a medication perspective, because you know, usually hospitals and healthcare, what they are taking, they are buying chunks of medication, then at the expiry date, they damage it all. So utilizing this and enhancing the customer experience and the customer journey 
through a technology, it utilized this a lot. And from there, also now, after, after the pandemic happened, there are some people that senior citizen or let us say and and access people in remote cities they cannot access and they can do things through AR and VR and we have Fadi can explain more about that details. Well um, in the field of medicine for instance um, mere, a mere few years ago for a surgeon to be able to do some training for an operation the only way to do it was getting him an actual human corpse that was dedicated to science and he could practice there now using virtual uh, reality all what the surgeon would need is wear a pair of uh, vr glasses and perform the surgery virtually bringing down the cost and enabling the training of, let's say, one of the surgeons in, in, in the Middle East to be trained on the hands of experts in the United Kingdom or the United States. AR and VR will uh, be an integral part of our lives, especially when the younger uh, Gen Z take, uh, take over since they are used to dealing with monitors, not dealing with people. They are more, if any, any of you here have, have younger uh, siblings or, or children, uh, they spend more time looking at monitor than spending time with their parents. This could be, uh, should not be perceived as a bad thing because it could be used in Ed education and it has been used during the pandemic during the shut uh, the, the shutdown and, and and rena will talk to us uh, uh, about that and it is also uh, used uh, to enable people in remote areas uh, to get better access to education and uh, my colleague abdullah will uh, will will tell us more about uh, the uh, experience he has had with that matter, Arena? Sure. So when I was working in the EdTech organization and we took it digital, we took it online, uh, we realized two things. Firstly, by taking it remote and by offering remote education, our customer base increased by 100%. And secondly, a factor which we were not planning to address but got addressed in the process was we realized that in tier three cities, tier two cities of, for example, a country like India, where I was working, there are many students who need special attention because of problems like dyslexia or ADHD. And such special institutions are rare in tier three cities. So as a result of that, most of them end up dropping out of education, dropping out of schools, and are unable to complete their education. With remote learning, we were able to provide a solution to it. Like today, even students from tier three cities are able to take these classes which cater to the special needs. Uh, Fayad uh, will talk, sorry, uh, Abdullah will talk more about this in detail. Yeah, so having remote access and utilizing the enhancement and especially, I do not want to say that uh, the pandemic had for a reason, but the pandemic supported this to enhance the quality of everything in it. So nowadays, from, uh, from a perspective, most of the people before the pandemic do not utilize the e-commerce, do not utilize the meetings uh, through, uh, through, through applications, do not utilize any virtual meetings that's happening. But after the enforcement and what happened in the pandemic, that this transaction happened very quickly, that nowadays, even for multi-city meetings or multi-country, you do not need, usually you have to pack your thing, go book a ticket, reserve a meeting, go meet them face to face. However, nowadays it's one click away, a Zoom meeting or a WebEx meeting and it's resolute. And previously you have to go maybe to multiple location to meet multiple people. Now you can join them all in one call. And this also enhanced the usage and utilization of time. So. Previously, in one day, you do one or two meeting maximum three if it's if you if the, the the customers or the consumers are nearby. 
but now you can complete five to six because you're sitting at your office, in your home, doing everything, and you have easy access for your life. So you have more time for your family, more time for your work, and you utilize all every second utilizing the technology. And this is the future that I think maybe five or 10 years from now, they will, all the corporation will not have offices. Everyone will be working remotely, and they have only some admin workers in, in their headquarters. And uh, this enhanced also, this affected our, let us say, for example, our mothers, our fathers, and everyone who do not utilize the technology, he was forced in a way or another to utilize it, not only for communication and engaging with his, uh, uh, with the community, it's also to do e-commerce and purchase information and delivering uh, food, luxury, and whatever. And uh, Fadi can explore more on the e-commerce part of this uh, discussion. Uh, well, as, as I have said in my introduction, uh, I work for a grocery delivery company in, uh, in Kuwait. And uh, during the shutdown, as horrible as it was, uh, our sales actually increased eight folds and um, we have encountered uh, a new uh, segment of customers who usually w uh, are, are used to uh, shopping through brick and mortar stores and have never shopped online before but they were forced to and after the, uh, after the pandemic people liked the convenience of doing the, their shopping while sitting at home. Of course, uh, due to, the, to this uh, in entire new spectrum of challenges arose uh, when it comes to uh, logistics, uh, since more orders meant more deliveries, more deliveries required more drivers, and we kept on thinking uh, of using uh, new technological means to uh, enhance our delivery uh, service and, and to reach the peak utilization for our, at the time, very expensive uh, drivers, we utilized uh, AI-driven uh, dispatching and routing software uh, in order to facilitate uh, the uh, grouping of uh, orders and having the driver deliver 30 orders a day. That was our peak, was 31 orders a day instead of an average of 16. However, it doesn't stop there. When you think uh, about it on a city or a countrywide scale, it will give us a whole new spectrum of uh, uh, applications for technology. Here in Dubai, we have Salik, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia have uh, Sahir, and uh, Rina will give us some more examples uh, about the use of technology in uh, transportation and making commuting easier. So now that we've spoken about logistics, let's talk about commute and how technology is going to make that easier. So we do know that with the rise of self-driving cars in the next few decades, we can consider that as the city of the future. Now, let's talk about the technology behind these self-driving cars. We do trust ourselves when we are driving on the road, we do know that a stop sign means a stop sign. Do you know that when we are on Google and when we are, you know, validating recapture to say that we are not a bot, that data is being used to train the AI ML algorithms of, say, for example, Waymo cars. That is how we train it unknowingly as users of Google or as users of internet. And that is where self-driving vehicles use the data from. So now that we know that this is the city of future, uh, Fayyad will talk a little bit about the public safety aspect of it and also the data privacy aspect of it. Well, this is a quite a uh, sensitive third rail uh, topic. Um, we have the technology, if we utilize the technology correctly, we can more or less prevent crime altogether. However, this will be quite invasive. I will heed the floor to Abdullah to tell us how we can use technology to enhance public safety. Then I will rebuttal with the data uh, safety concerns. Yes, from that perspective, 
utilizing the technology and putting a unified access code, it reduced the fraud of utilizing paperwork and end of it that's happening previously. Now, if you like, you need an appointment with a judge, you need an appointment with the, with the police, you need an appointment with any government entity or a public sector entity, you cannot go hit the door and go access. You have to go access through the unified gateway that you have in each country. From there, you have to verify yourself at, that this is you, there is the, then you kill the fraud perspective. And from there, you have a set of questionnaires that tell you exactly what you need to do to enhance even your journey as a customer or to enhance the service provided to you using automation and AI. So for the last five years, the AI and automation perspective, especially in public sector utilization in Saudi Arabia, it reduced a lot of accessing people and crowded people in government entities that most of your paperwork from uh, baby registration, renewing passports, uh, renewing license, you do not have to go to the government entity. It's one click away through an application and it will be delivered to you at the house. This will enhance reducing the fraud, enhance the quality of life and giving time back to the people and to the community that they can utilize this information in the right methodology and giving control even to the government entity to, to know how many people are accessing, how many people are utilizing, and from there, it would reduce the fraud and, and using the data in the wrong way. So this is the part from a public sector perspective. And this methodology or this enhancement or AI technology, now it's have been implemented by other sectors not only public sector, by groceries, by something now, sometimes if you go to a restaurant or something, if you do not have a booking or reserve it online, they will tell you, sorry, come tomorrow and do the booking. That will enhance the AI and in Saudi now there, you have a little bit of hard time of enhancing and creating a city of your future on an existing infrastructure. So you have two methodology, even to enhance the people and it will take you time or to create something from scratch, and we have multiple projects in the region to create a smart city or the city of your future from the scratch, which would enhance the public community. We have two main projects, which is Neom and The Line, which is another two high intelligent EI cities that will be created from the scratch, and the user experience and using technology in the future in that area will be easier because the infrastructure was built to utilize that. However, in other cities that we are utilizing, you have to use the technology in a gradual methodology. Yes, sorry to say that the pandemic enhanced that experience in the vibe, but we have to keep the momentum and continue utilizing the technology to enhance the quality of life to reach a certain limit that we are targeting. But opening this type of metaverse or this type of technology to the people, it will, uh, have some issues from a data privacy perspective and how you can keep your information secure in the methodology. And I think, Fadi, you can take us on a journey there. Yeah. Uh, up to this point, we were basically discussing existing technologies. And I'll keep on doing that, but I will try to give a foresight of what can happen and the advantages and disadvantages the advantage, advantages of utilizing such technologies because any technology is as good as the person using it. It's always a double-edged weapon. So let's take NPR, uh, NPR uh, for, for example. NPR is uh, number plate recognition software. Number plate recognition, it's well and good when it enhances uh, discipline on the roads. If you overspeed, the camera will capture you and you'll get a ticket, so you, you won't do it again. However, all these data points are residing somewhere. This entity that has, any entity that has access to the NPR, if I can enter your, uh, the, 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 the number plate of your vehicle, I can track your movement to each and every lo location you have been on. 
Uh, let's take another, another example for another technology, facial recognition. Do, um, there are cities like Las Vegas that you have more cameras than you have people. That's an exaggeration, but it's, it's, it's nearly true. So in Vegas, every, everywhere is surveyed and facial recognition technology can pinpoint and track Fail. what, where did he go and where did he do? The uh, um, software now can capture your body language and can tell to a great extent of accuracy what you were trying to do. This was a civilian technology that was developed for marketeers. However, it is being utilized by, by uh, law enforcement. I have always said that Google probably knows about any one of us more than your children, your parents, or even your wife. However, we choose to surrender this kind of information in order to use the technologies that make our life easier. You get this very wrong end user agreement that tell us, well, in order to use uh, this uh, software for, for, for voice over IP calls, you are giving the application mic access. However, you, don't, you, ca you can't really tell the, the voice segments or the audio segments that are being captured by your own phone. Are they being used in order to better the user experience or is it used as a means of surveillance and every one of us is carrying his very own bug in his own pocket? That's your phone. Uh, the use of technology can, with our current existing technology, if you can bring AR, VR, NPR, FR, AI, uh, and, and, and numerous other technologies that I will not mention by name, we can basically have, if we can consolidate all these data points, we can have a consolidated profile for each and every citizen in each and every country. It is being done, yet is being done by marketeers. However, when the city starts relying this heavily on technology, what will be the point where we say, okay, enough is enough, we cannot surrender more data, or we need to know better what and who are accessing this data and to what uh, purposes. We have 16 minutes left. Uh, this, this whole discussion was basically an intro and we'd like to open the floor to anybody who has any questions or thoughts about how the future in a future city will be like. I hit the floor to the audience. Go ahead. So you just said something that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you said uh, it's the marketeers who are moving the change and, and, and like pushing the changes. Can, can you raise your voice? Please? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, so you said something that makes a lot of sense. It's that the fact that marketing and marketeers are pushing the change. And I think it is because they can show impact better, right? When, when we are talking about what advancements technology can do as, as te techni technical people, it's hard to prove it until it is invested and done and is there. But marketeers can show the impact uh, faster, let's say. How can us, as people who are from the technology side, uh, make these macro impacts that would bring in more fund and kind of bring in the a decision making to the hands of people who can actually think about the logic. You see where I'm going with it, right? Yeah. Yeah. How can we do? How can we like rely less on marketing, at least for for the main decisions, and then we rely on marketing for the awareness that we have to have, uh, and not, not for the decision makings or, or let's say funding. All right. Um I would assume that this uh, question was directed to me. Uh, so why we need to, we need to find uh, out the genesis. 
Why did this happen? Why was this uh, utilization of technology led by marketeers? It's basically money. The marketing people knew that the technology was there and we have surrendered a ton or maybe petabytes of data to social media networks that was sitting there. And I always say, if you're not paying, you're the product. You, Shaheen, if you're not paying, uh, you're the product. You use Facebook, you use Instagram, you leave a lot of data points, and these data points need to generate money. So they were willing to invest in order to get uh, that return on investment. Now, they have another edge, is access to data. People would willingly uh, provide tons of data to Google or Facebook, yet they would be more apprehensive to surrender their data to a uh, city authority or a government entity and they'll start saying Big Brother is watching. So they ha Facebook has, how, how many pictures do you have on your social media platform? Thousands? Maybe a couple of hundred? Yet? Five or six. Okay, you're, you're a very bad example, Shane. Uh, other, other people probably have thousands of pictures of themselves, their pets, and what they eat, correct? And their friends. And their friends. Yet, what the government has of you is, your, is a single, outdated, probably very ugly picture on your national identification card, correct? So, when we want to do facial recognition, who has a better chance of getting a hit? A software being fed a single picture or a software being fed thousands of pictures? And any AI needs data sets. Marketeers had access. We willingly gave them access to better data sets. Sometimes it's cool. I mean, if I want to buy something and I can't find it, I simply text somebody over Facebook Messenger asking him about the product name. The very next second, I will get a couple of ads uh, offering that product. This is something I like. Well, did, you did give them access to your microphone to use, to use Facebook Messenger, didn't you? You agreed to that. Yeah. Then it's fine. But would you agree to give, let's say, the government access to your phone so they can listen in at any point in time? That would be government overreach. Correct? So that's why in this particular case, marketing or, or, or revenue generated generating entities took the lead, they had the data, they had the funds, and they have a lot of investment being pumped in. This is one of the cases where actually the public sector, law enforcement, intelligence, and military are lagging behind uh, the uh, private sector. And some people who work in marketing, we have, we have heard of people resigning for, from Google when Google started taking uh, military contracts, correct? So this is a sensitive topic, but we have already surrendered our data to the marketeers. And as a marketeer, I thank you very much. Please buy our products. Yeah, and, and to add to him now, no, if you are utilizing, most of us here are not U.S. citizens. So if you are applying for a U.S. visa, they ask for your social media, not only to check up on you, is to have the enhanced pictures and quality of it. And even in Saudi, they are utilizing this. If you are coming for a visit visa, they will access this information not uh, to check up. They do not have time to go through everyone's Instagram and Facebook. They have an algorithm to take photos to see who you are sitting with, and they have their own database building. Yes, public sector is late from this point of view. However, we can utilize and they can reach an agreement with the people who are utilizing our data, and this is happening with the government laws and agreement, digital footprint agreement that everyone is fighting on right now. This will enhance the quality of life, but sometimes surrendering a lot of data, like the breach that happened in Snapchat one year ago, 
some people are thinking that no, only me can access the photo. No, everyone can see it, but they do not have the encryption of it. So surrendering data sometimes is not healthy enough. However, as you said, you have only five or six photos. This is on your account, whatever your friend's account. You can utilize a lot of images from there and you can build something out of it. So I think uh, this is a full answer if you have something to add. Yeah, I just have one point to add to this. Um, and great points, Abdullah and Fayyad, and a good question. Um, I would say that I'm not a marketeer. Uh, I'm a techie. So I would say that one way in which we do not give all the control to marketeers and where we as you know, product owners, product builders, and as techies, we are able to you know, get our product out in the market would be just to address the pain points of the customers. If they think that their pain point is being met, they will go for your product. Uh, for example, in US, when I go to a healthcare provider, they have all my data, all my past medical records. And I do not think that that's a breach of my privacy. Rather, I think that, all right, when I'm in a different city in US, for example, and I don't have my files on me or my medical files on me, it's going to be helpful. They are addressing my pain point of you know, traveling without my files, and they have all the data about me. So I think it just comes down to addressing the pain points, because the end user would be a customer. And if the customer does not find use of your product, he would not go for it, no matter how good the marketing is. And, and uh, that's a great example. Uh, medical, medical records, being as sensitive as they are, they have their own regulations managing them. In the United States, you have HIPAA. Yeah. Uh, so there has, that's a good example where a, the, a paradigm has been reached between insurance companies who care about the money, big pharma who care about the money, yet the government here was able to regulate to keep your data safe and keep businesses going. So that's where the compromise is met. Nobody is overreaching. I hope you have addressed your question. Uh, any other questions? We still have six minutes, 30 seconds. Come on, people. Yeah, I think everybody's tired. <laughs> I think they moved the coffee machine early today. Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Okay, one more call. Any more questions? Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have one last. Oh, sorry. Oh, hold on. Photo. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have one last award to present. Can I please invite on stage Sate Weldon to receive your award? First, I wanted to thank Internet 2.0 for 
put this event together. Um, I also would like to thank my friends, family, and colleagues who uh, made this possible. Um, without them, could not make this, uh, it wouldn't be possible. Um, and I also wanted to say, let's, uh, as a whole, let's continue to uh, keep inspiring and making an impact on this world and uh, keep leading the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to an end of our conference. On behalf of Internet 2.0 Conference, I would like to thank you all for being so amazing. Um, and also to our, we'd like to thank a few people, Crypto Clue, uh, media partners, our exhibitors, and of course, you all, our lovely audience. I'm your MC, Nashpreet, and please make yourself, uh, make your way outside to mingle and get to know each other more, and maybe have a, you know, a night out in Dubai. It's a beautiful city. Go out, have fun. Thank you so much.